Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. First step to the star. The early Sputnik era has passed into history, and science rushes on towards the infinite. Man himself is making his first ventures into space. His road to the stars lies by way of a manned space station, an artificial satellite yet to be completed. Its component pieces have been rocketed into orbit. Now they float in cluster, awaiting assembly by the space pioneers who must work a thousand miles above the surface of the Earth. At Woomera, headquarters of the Commonwealth Space Project, the first assembly crew prepare for takeoff. Their ship, Orbiter One, commanded by Captain Jack Bradley, stands poised on the launching platform. In HQ Central Control, the Commandant, Colonel Benham Kent, is giving final clearance instructions. At his elbow, Captain Bob Britton calls the countdown of the last vital moments to take off. Sixty seconds to zero. Sound the final warning on the launching platform. Yes, sir. Control calling Orbiter One. Check your stabilizers. Orbiter One answering you, Control. Stabilizers correct. Charters fitting, 2,000 revs, steady. Open the launching ramp. <laughs> Hello, Orbiter One. Check your fuel taps and stage one compression. Taps open, four-fifths compression, rising. Zero minus 30. All clear on the platform? All clear, sir. Hello, control, stage one compression, nine-tenths maximum. Excellent. The combustion chambers are opening. She's blowing fire. Check thrust level for takeoff. All jets firing in balance, sir. Good. Hello, Orbiter One. Stand by for normal takeoff. No deviation from predicted course. All's well. Good luck to you. Thank you, Control. Zero minus ten. Nine, eight, seven, She's six, lifting. five, four, three, two, one. Orbiter away! Uh, 
Track a report, please. Yes, sir. The ship's line of flight and rate of ascent are still as predicted. Bearing now XQ-5, TK-74. Well done. Captain Griffin. Ah. ah, Bob, you must have been rather disappointed that you didn't take the first assembly crew. Yes, I was, Colonel Kent. Still, that's just the luck of the draw. Never mind. Your turn tomorrow. That's right. I can hardly wait for it now. I gather your co-pilot, Captain McClelland, is keen to get on with the job as well. Oh, my word. It's the moment we've both been waiting for ever since we got our transfer from the RAF. And your flight engineer, the ex sub Chief Petty Officer Hicks. <laughs> He's a good chap. Determined to keep us all shipshape and Bristol fashion. <laughs> Orbiter 1 coming through on RT, sir. Good. Hello, Control. Orbiter 1 calling CSP Control. Are you receiving me? Repeat, are you receiving Hello, Orbiter 1. Orbiter 1, this is CSP, Woomera Control, answering you. Your signal has faded. There is strong interference. Keep sending. Can you hear me, CSP? Yes, but your signal is very weak. Keep sending. Hello, hello. Orbiter 1, calling Control. He's obviously not getting us at all. Uh, Control Officer Brown, try calling him on WT and warn the ground tracking stations that he's entered a zone of electrical disturbance at altitude 950 plus. Okay, sir. Central Monitor reporting interference and distortion on the main tracking screen, sir. First we lose sound and then the vision. Look at the picture, Bob. Have you ever seen a pattern of interference like that before? No, I can't say I have. I'll see if I can raise it myself. Turn the RT right up. The interference limiter isn't helping very much. No, it's most unusual. All tracking stations confirm loss of image, sir. Too bad. Calling CSP. Quiet, quiet. Listen, everybody. Can you hear me? Calling CSP. Woomera. That's Brad. Hello, Orbiter 1. Brad, this is Woomera Control answering you. We are receiving, but your signals are very weak and intermittent. Seems to be cut off, but I'll keep talking and hope you are receiving. The starboard jets are completely smashed, and we are all the starboard jets smashed? Yes. I'm afraid this is going to be difficult, and the interference doesn't help. Direction finders have got his position. It's coming through the computer now, sir. Good. Project it straight onto the astral wall charts. Yes, sir. You should see the ship's position indicated by a point of light. There. There it is. Yes. And it puts it at an altitude of a thousand miles, almost directly above Starbuck Island of the Mid-Pacific. He's now in free orbit, just like a Sputnik, so the next radio fix will help us to work out his speed and course. Thank you, Projection. It's possible, say. He could be somewhere over us here again within about two hours. If I took off with my ship, I might be able to intercept you. That's an idea, Bob. Yes, and it might work. But you'd have no guidance from the ground tracking stations, not unless the interference clears. Yes, but perhaps I could climb over it and pick him up on the ship's radar. It's an outside chance, but... Yes, I think it's worth trying. We'll line up your ship for emergency takeoff. Thank you, sir. In case you're needed. Yes, of course. I'll warn McClelland and Hickey to stand by. Yes, sort them out and bring them here as soon as you can. Very good, sir. I'll be right back. There seems to be quite a panic going on in the control room, Bob. Yes, Mac. I think we're in business. Yeah, well, we're soon there. Come on, come on in. Can you, Hickey? All right, sir. Over here, all of you. Sir. Right, Hicks. Sir. Sir. I'm afraid I've got some bad news, Bob. Oh, what's it, sir? I just had another message from Bradley. You will better hear the recording. I've got it on tape. Now, listen carefully. There's still a lot of mush. That's it's bad, isn't it? Quiet, it's quiet. Quiet. I'll carry on talking. Hope for the best. We can't locate that second fracture in the hull. The bulkheads are closed, but we're still losing pressure. Everything happens at once. We had no warning. Sorry about poor Carter. Didn't have a chance. Better not tell his wife. And that was all. Bad luck about Carter. What can have happened to him? Your guess is as good as mine. Oh, poor fellow. Did all your courses with him, didn't you, Hickey? Yes, I did. He had uh, two children? Yes, the same as me. Uh, about the same age. Well, we still don't know what has happened, and the minister has agreed not to release any information at this stage. It might lead to a big scare about attacks by UFOs. And you know the public reaction to anything to do with unidentified flying objects. Yes. 
particularly in view of all the reports about him since we launched the space station components for Orbiter X. Exactly. Well, uh, when do we take off, sir? The computer is working everything out now. All the information will be fed into your automatic pilot. We can put you reasonably close to Bradley's ship, but the final operation will be up to you. Your job is to save the survivors, but don't take unnecessary risks. We don't want to lose you. We'll watch our steps, sir. Any questions? It's a tough assignment. You'll be out on your own when you hit the interference belt. If any of you wish to stand down, it isn't too late. We'd like to carry on, sir. All right. You can get down to the launching platform and board your machine. You've only to check procedure on the first stage of your trip. Now, keep a grip on yourselves. You know the psychological dangers of weightlessness. Yes, we know, sir. And you've still got a lot to learn. Off with you, then. All the very best. Check your safety straps. Okay. Touch up, Bob. Mind you, sir. Just relax into your contour seats. Breathe deeply. Control are doing all the work for us. It's exactly the same as our practice runs. Same routine. Zero minus 30. Nine-tenths pressure in the combustion chambers. Temperature 1,200. Fine. Hello, control. Compression nine-tenths maximum. All jets firing. Hello, orbiter two. Stand by for normal takeoff. No deviation from predicted course. Good luck for all of us. Thanks. Good luck, chaps. Here we go. We're lifting. Next stop, Piccadilly. Orbiter 2 answering you, Control. Britain speaking. My reactions seem to be normal. Checking with crew. Stand by. Mac, you all right? Yes, sir. I'm okay, Bob. But the acceleration did shake me a bit. The old body felt like lead, and I thought my face was being wrapped around the back of my neck. How are your eyes? Well, vision's still a bit blurred, but it's clear. No internal pains? No, fine. Good man. Icky, how are you feeling? Oh, all present and correct, sir. Well done. How about you, Bob? I'm okay. Hello, CSP. You may have heard that. Yes, Bob, we heard. Congratulations to all of you. A first-class launching. Your line of flight speed and jet temperatures are exactly as planned. The ground tracking stations are giving us a clear picture of you, and the radio reception is perfect. Good. We're getting a wonderful picture of the Earth from Japan... Way down the China coast to New Guinea and Australia. But have you any news of Orbiter 1, Control? No. She's still in the interference zone, I'm afraid. Check your altitude, please. We make it 310 miles. 310 it is. Prepare for the next boost. This one shouldn't worry you. We can take it. Of the altitude indicator. It must be over the thousand mile mark by now. Uh, the needle's swinging between 1100 and 1250. I'll check it over, sir. Yes, too bad, Hickey. Oh, by the way, you can drop us, sir, business. We can forget rank while we're in space. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Bob, I'll try. Is the weightlessness worrying either of you? No, I had the usual symptoms of unreality after the acceleration stopped, but I'm settling down now. Same with me. Go on. Just keep your minds on the job. Right. Well, according to the computer, Bradley should be closing with us on bearing XT7 QI65. Concentrate on that, and I'll look at the radar screen, too. Uh, it's a beautiful blank at the moment. Mm. Hold on. What? Look, there's a patch of interference developing, top right hand oh, corner. Yes, sir, there is. Yeah. It looks like the fringe of the trouble zone. It is, too. Control. Hello, CSP. 
Hello? Hello? This is Orbiter 2 calling you. Are you receiving me? Control, answer on you, Orbiter 2. Yes, we are receiving. But your signal is very weak. We are heading into the trouble zone. Altitude indicator, scanners and intercom are all affected. We are holding to the prearranged course. Message understood. We shall keep listening. Here, both of you, quickly. Look at this mark on the screen. Wow, what is it? Wow. You can just see it between the windows. Oh, yes. It must be solid. Mm. What's the bearing, Mac? Um, XT7 UY65. It's Orbiter 1. Oh, so right. yes. Slap on the predicted uh, course. Look for the ground, boys. Uh, Call them up, Mac. And Hickey, give me a burst on the jets at one tenth compression. Right, Bob. Here it comes. <laughs> Orbiter 2 calling control. Hello, CSP. Are you receiving me? Very slightly off course. Give me a one-tenth burst, port jets only, Chief. Trim up. Enough? Yes, fine. We're right in the right groove now. Ah, oh, good. Hello, CSP. This is Orbiter 2. Come in, please. Nothing doing, Bob. We're out on our own by the sound of it. Oh, never mind. We're closing with the other ship. Well, this is where the fun starts. But if we shoot past her, we won't get another chance. We shall have to turn ourselves over head to tail so that we can use the jets as brakes. Better stand by the inverters. Standing by. Check the range. Range, 375 miles. That's closer than I thought. Switch on inverters. Over we go. Base over Apex. Talk of the gyros is taking us nicely. I'll tell you to level off the moment our tail jets are pointing towards the other ship. Steady. Level off. Now. Right. We're heading straight towards a tail first. And it's all done by me. Uh, stop talking. <laughs> stop talking. Adjust the scanners. Hickey. Sir. I'm going to break pretty hard. Fasten your belt. You two, Mac, ready with the taps? Uh-huh. Ready, sir. Open jets at nine tenths maximum. And, and again. Bob, we don't have to worry about the radar anymore. Our targets come up on the telescreen. screen. Uh, George, Orbiter One in vision. We may be creeping ahead of him very slightly, but I won't upset the balance now. I say, look at that other ship's tail. The starboard quarter's practically oh, flat. Gosh, it is. Yes, yes. Yes, I'm going to call control. We can't hear them, but they may be able to hear us. This is Orbiter 2 calling CSP control. Orbiter 2 calling CSP control. We are alongside our sister ship. Her starboard quarter shows that she has been involved in collision. There are no signs that Bradley and Wilson have spotted us yet. I am preparing to go aboard. I shall take flight engineer Hicks with me and leave Captain McClelland in charge at this end. Keep listening. They'll be listening, but I doubt whether they get any of that. There's no acknowledgement. It doesn't look as if Brad picked it up either. Otherwise, he'd have made some sort of signal, wouldn't he? Yes, well, we're certainly close enough to see him. You better adjust your spacesuit, Hickey. The sooner we get over there, the better. Open the airlock, Mac. Right, Bob. Good. Just plug my telephone cable into Hickey's helmet. We won't be able to talk on the radio intercom because of the interference. Okay, you're plugged in. Close your helmets. Fine. Into the airlock, Chief. Close the inner hatch. Open the valve. Let the air out. Done this underwater many a time. Yes, you had the sea pouring into your escape log then. Now it's a case of literally nothing coming in. Pressure gauge is dropping down to zero. There it goes. Yes, I'm watching it. Check your suit. Right, all, all correct. Lock empty. Oh. 
We're standing in vacuum, chum. You all right? Yes. Good. Right, I'm opening the outer hatch. Don't move yet. Now, switch off the magnets in your boots. Tie the end of your short line to the ring in my belt. My lifeline is attached to the ship. It'll do for both of us. Okay. I should probably be able to stitch both over to Orbiter One with my jet pistol. If you do have to use yours, Higgy, make sure you don't aim it towards me. <laughs> Understood, Bob. All right. I'm holding on to your belt. Just move to the edge of the hatch. That's right. You can't fall. It's at a um, moment like this you begin to wonder. Keep your attention on the other ship. All right. I'm firing the pistol. We're away. Yes. Remember not to bicycle pedal with your feet. There's nothing underneath them. How do you feel, Tiff? Oh, slightly sick, sir. Yes, so do I. Halfway across to Orbiter One. I suppose we shall get used to this sort of lock. Yes. We shall when we start assembling the space station. This is the way we'll be working. Oh, my gosh, just look at those stars. What's your target? We're going to land just by the escape hatch. Right. Here comes a crab. <coughs> Hold on. Hold it. I've got it. Got it. Good man. Switch on your boot magnets again. This is time. Uh, we're aboard Orbiter One. I can't believe it. It's true enough. Open the air valve, buddy. Just pull back the lever. That doesn't seem to move. I leave. <coughs> I think it's shifted. Yes. Yes. Light should flash when all the air is out of the lock. It started flashing already. Must be a fault. I'll try opening the hatch. It's quick work. Well, in a go. Must have heard us by now. Yes. This will be a shock for them. I turn on the air. It'll be interesting to know exactly what's happened. It certainly will. Hello? Something's gone wrong with the air pressure. It's only risen to about eight pounds a square inch. That's all we're going to get. We must keep our helmets closed. Open the inner hatch. Let's see how Brad and the boys are. Oh. Well, what goes on here? The cabin's empty. It's absolutely empty. Where is everybody? Look. Somebody lying down there by the, by the wreckage of the starboard engines. It's... It's Carter. Oh, poor devil. Yes. At least it must have been quick. He was obviously here when the collision happened. No sign of anyone else. No, not a trace. I don't get it. I, I don't get it at all. How do I? It's the mystery of the Mari Celeste all over again. So it seems. The two same men don't just step out into space. No. They weren't the types to lose their heads. So what's the answer? Oh, let me think. Let me think. You had difficulty with the air valve, the outer hatch. Yes, it didn't seem to move much. The reason being that it was already open. That's why the light flashed almost as soon as you touched it. Of course, yes, the airlock had been used by people leaving the ship. Exactly. I'd stop to think I, I, I would have realized that at the time. Brad and Wilson bailed out. But why? Yes... Why? Something must have driven them to it. What's that? It's only the safety valve on the 4-2 compression chamber. Oh, getting a bit jumpy. I'm sorry. I don't apologize, Chief. I didn't have to give anyone the shakes. We'll get back to the cabin. Yeah? I'd like to have a look at the ship's log. Okay, I'll get it for you. You'll find it in the, in the clip beside the intercom. Same place where we keep ours. That's no, not here. 
Oh, it's, it's probably slipped out. It's attached to a cord. The cord's here, but the logbook's been torn away. Torn away? Yeah. I see. So is another mystery. Yes. There's something written in that log which we were not intended to read. Captain Bradley wouldn't want to hide anything. No. Neither would Wilson. When they knew, could have cut... I've got a crazy idea. I don't like it. I know what you're thinking. I've got the same idea. Chief, we better get back to our own ship. Right. We don't want to follow in Brad and Wilson's footsteps. Let's move. Okay. Jupiter, I'm glad to see you too. Are the others all right, Bob? No, Carter's dead. We were prepared for that, but Brad and Wilson have gone. Oh, yes, they've disappeared. Apart from Carter, all but one is deserted. But oh, it's impossible. It's true, Mac. Have you had any contact with CSP control? No, the interference is worse than ever. We must get underway. You're not going to leave Carter. We shall for the moment. Chief, close the inner hatch of the airlock and stand by the engines. Aye, aye, sir. Start the compressors. That's open. But why the panic, Bob? I'll tell you later. Watch your scanner. Keep an all-round radar sweep and sing out if you see anything unusual. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to see through the interference, Pat. Just concentrate. Hickey, what's the hold-up on the engine? Are you for the temperature to build up? I can't open the jet yet. Well, use the boosters. I know we'll be short on fuel, but we'll risk running dry. Right. Bob, there's something odd on the radar screen. It's not very clear, but it's solid enough and it's dead astern. Look. So I was right. Open the jets. We must move. Hickey, get into the observation dome. Tell me if you can see anything following us. All right, Bob. The spot on the screen's getting bigger. What is it? I wish I knew. Whatever it is, it's closing with us. I don't think we're going to get away. Can't see anything astern. Our tail's pointing straight into the sun. I right, come down. I'm going to start turning. Hold tight. Things still with us. It's coming in. Move, oh. buckets. Break out emergency oxygen. Anybody hurt? No, nothing serious. Uh, just shaken. What happened? We've either been rammed, or we've been shot up. The same as Orbiter 1? Yes. So that spot on the radar screen was... Yes. An unidentified flying object. Try to get Woomera control, man. Right. Orbiter 2 calling CSP. Orbiter 2 calling CSP control. Are you receiving me? Not a hope of getting through on that boat. Keep trying, Mac. What's going on? Something outside. Quickly, into the observation zone. Can't see anything from here. Must be under us. But what the... Listen. Somebody's moving on the outer hull. Get back to the cabin. And stand by for borders. Borders in space? Are we crazy? No, we're not dreaming either. But according to the UN Space Bureau... We're the only people out here. That's right, sir. I've seen the report. No other country has launched any ships for the past month. No other country is supposed to have launched any ships, not without informing the Bureau. But it's obvious that somebody has been keeping his plans to himself and ganging up on us. Yeah. I've often wondered what certain people really thought of a Commonwealth space project. Now we know. It sounds as if they're getting down to business. Close the airlock valves, Hickey, and start the emergency generator. Aye, aye, sir. At least that'll stop them opening the hatches. You think they mean to come in and get us, Bob? It could be. There's no doubt they've got Bradley and Wilson, and we're next on the list. Well, whoever they are, it beats me while they're playing this cat and mouse game. They could have blown us to bits with no trouble at all. Yes. And if they only wanted to stop us going ahead with the assembly work on Orbiter X, wouldn't it have been safer for them to destroy the component parts? We've had all the bits and pieces circling around the Earth for weeks now. Maybe they plan to assemble the components themselves. That's a thought, eh? We supply the goods, and they get the space station. Hello? 
Well, what's going on now? My guess is that they're rigging up some sort of communication gear. If they could talk us into surrender, it'd save them a lot of trouble. We can give them trouble, all right, if we can get at them. And the only way to do that is to go out and meet them, face to face. Well, I'm ready. How about it, Bob? No. They'll pick us off as soon as we try to leave the escape hatch. Well, we can do better than that. If we can get some of the jets working, we can still give the UFOs a run for their money. See what you can do with the engines, Hickey. Right, Bob. And you, Mac, get cracking on the intercom. Okay. You might break through the interference. Right. NOCSP. Orbiter 2 calling CSP Woomera. Orbiter 2 calling CSP Woomera. Are you receiving me? No answer at all? Not a thing. Just mush. Listen to it. All right, turn it down. Well, Hickey, what luck? Well, Bob, the damage in the engine room has probably been caused by a missile with a proximity fuse. The starboard compressors have completely had it. What about the others? Our groups three and four are okay on the port side. So, if we could get below an altitude of a thousand miles, we'll be under the interference zone, and we should be able to talk to CSP and warn them. Then let's get going. What are we waiting for? The point is, the moment we get underway, the UFOs will almost certainly attack, and they may shoot to kill next time. Are you ready to risk it? Sure I am. Yes, me too, sir. Good. I think the chance is worth taking. So we're all agreed. You can open the taps, Chief. Aye, aye, sir. Well, it'll take a minute or so to build up the temperatures in the combustion chambers. Don't worry, we'll wait. Bob, listen to the intercom. Is it my imagination or... No. The interference is clear. Start transmitting. I will. Arbiter 2 calling CSP control. Are you receiving me? Try again. Right. We are receiving you, Arbiter 2. That's not Woman. No. Then it must be the... Yes, you pose. Exactly. All right, I'll take over. This is Captain Britain, Orbiter 2. Who are you? This is your escort commander. We regret the damage to your ship. We trust there are no casualties. Where do you come from? What are your intentions? I cannot answer questions. You and your crew will abandon ship and join us. We are close by. The crossing will offer no difficulties. Engine temperature's almost right, Bob. Open the jets as soon as you can. You will carry out my instructions immediately. And in case you hope that our conversation is being monitored at your Earth headquarters, I should tell you it is not. Our engineers have adapted your aerial array for restricted transmission only. You are, in fact, still in the interference zone. That's one hope, Con. But you were right about the board is fixing some communication gear, Bob. So it seems. All compressors working, sir. Good man. Open them right up. Captain Britton, I order you to cut your engine. Go to blazes. We're moving out of office. Can you get the nose down, Bob? I'm doing my best, but I haven't got much control. Get a visual bearing on the earth. Right. I think we're losing altitude, but it's too soon to say yet. Hate me just swinging all over the place, picking up faulty ground again. What's the other ship doing, Kiki? Uh, he's close to stern. I can see his blip on the scanner. Now he's moving under our port port. Check your spaces. He'll start throwing things any second now. Calling Orbiter 2. Unless you cut your engines immediately, we shall fire on your port jet. Keep going, Bob. There's nothing else we can do. Close your helmets and switch over to helmet intercom. Check. Helmet closed. Intercom working. And we're beginning to lose height, Bob. The enemy's close on our quarters, sir. Mac. Mac, are you all right? Yes, sir. Thank you. What about Hickey? Uh, I think he's heavy. Let me see. No. No, he's alive. But his shoulder's bleeding. I'll get my first aid box. There's no time for that. We've got to seal up the tear in his suit quickly. Give me the emergency pack. Here it is. Pressure's dropping in the cabin. He's starved for oxygen. It wasn't bad. I remember the drill. First patch goes under the tear. In there. Like this. I hope that'll hold. Is his oxygen full on? Yes. Now, an outside patch. He's breathing. Good. 
This is about the best we can do for you, Hickey, old son. Sorry about the shoulder. He seems to have taken a crack on the head, too. Make sure his intercom is turned on, Mac. Otherwise, we won't hear him when he comes around. Okay. What are we to do with him now? He's losing blood. We can't cope with that in vacuum. This is your escort, Commander. We have been listening to your Obia helmet intercom. Your ship is no longer screening the transmissions. You have yourselves to blame for the damage and the injury to your flight engineer. You can save his life only by bringing him over to us. You hear that, Mac? Yes, I hear it. Well, I suppose we haven't much choice. I'm afraid not. But what are the physical conditions inside your ship? If we do get Hickey over, would it be safe? Take him out of his space. Permit me to answer that question. Uh, of course. They can hear everyone we see. Yes, and we are not monsters. We shall provide you with breathable air at the pressure to which you are accustomed in normal space flight. We must take your word for it. We're coming out. Excellent. I'm glad that you're being sensible at last, Captain Brick. Is there any pressure in the airlock, Mac? No, the indicator's on zero. And you can open the inner and the outer hatches. Right. Are you going to guide us? Yes. I just tied Hickey's short line onto my belt. You can hitch yourself onto him, too. Okay. I've switched off his magnets. Now, be careful. He's quite weightless. Okay. We don't want to send him crashing into the roof. No. Hold onto his belt and let go. Okay. I'll grab him on the other side. I've got That's him. Good. Now, now into the lock. Easy does it, work. Just move over to the edge. And cut your boot magnets. Magnets, you Ah, oh, look. There's the other ship. Yes. Yes, I see. It's a similar shape to ours. But more than twice the size. Armament of oil. Hello, Captain Britton. You will observe that one of our hatches has been opened. That is your point of entry. Yes, I see it. The bad. Sixty yards to go, Mac. Half a dozen bursts on the pistol should get us over. Are you all set? All set. Move right under the edge, then. Uh, looks a long drop down to the earth. Wish we were there now. You can't drop. There's no up. There's no down yet, John. I know. That open hatch is your target. Just keep your eyes on it. Goodbye, over the two. We're away. Yes, we're away. Three minor and not very heavy points. Steady as you can now, Mac. I don't want to overshoot the target. Well, bang on. Can you see any signs of life aboard? No. They're probably watching us through vision cameras. Switch on your magnets. Almost there. Here we go. Ah. How's that for a three-point landing? Nice work. This is certainly some ship. Seems bigger than ever when you're actually on it. Yes. How's Hickey looking? He's breathing. That's about all I can tell you. Better get him inside, quickly. Come on. Close the outer hatch when you're through. Right. Into the airlock. Well, here we are. Whether we like it or not, I wonder if it is air pumping into the lock. We won't take any chances with it. How far do you think we can trust these people? I'd say we can probably trust them. Until they deliver us to their headquarters. Wherever that may be. Uh, pressure seems okay. Let's try the inner hatch. Now what goes on? Not very much by the look of it. 
seems to be in an empty cargo hold. Well, come aboard, Captain Brenton. Perhaps you will be good enough to close the hatch behind you. I'll do it, Paul. Thank you, Captain Brenton. He knows my knee. We know a great deal about you, as you shall see. It is quite safe for you to remove your helmets. Hold on while I test for air, Mac. Yes. Yes, it seems to be all right. Okay, off helmets. Now you can breathe quite freely. And you will find medical equipment prepared for you. Where's the voice coming from now? Somewhere in the roof. Quite right. It is not yet possible for us to meet, but there is a talk back in the roof. I am actually speaking to you from the control cabin. We'll start asking questions later, Mac. Hickey's our first problem. Sort out the medical stuff while I unfasten his suit. Yes, Bob. Oh, his eyes are opening. Uh, who's there? It's Bob. Oh, Bob, Hickey. How do you feel, Tom? Oh, uh, all right. I had a bad dream. Are you going to drink of water, sir? Yes, of course, yes. Here's my squeeze bottle. Oh. Easy, oh. easy. Don't try to move you. Yeah, I'll hold it for you. Thanks. Steady. Oh, here's the medical box. They've laid on plenty of dressings and surgical instruments. Now, we'll soon have that shoulder as yours cleaned up, Hickey, my boy. Oh, thanks. I remember there was an explosion. Where are we now? Aboard the UFO. What? Oh, yes, dear. There was nothing for it, Hickey. Mac and I had to bring you over. I hope I wasn't a lot of trouble, sir. No, none at all. But who are the UFOs? We don't know yet. Shh, listen. They're transmitting WT. It's being relayed from the control cabin through the talk line. They've cut the speaker. Did either of you get any of that? Mm, not really, but the start of it sounded like our call, sir. Yeah, it did, too. It's obviously something to do with us. Yes, but What? I'd give a lot to know what's in that message and who it's intended for. Anything on the tracking monitors, Ken? Afraid not, Colonel Kent. Only the interference pattern. I don't understand it. Orbiter 2 should be clear of the interference zone by now. Unless, of course, Britain's run into the same trouble which would bradley ship out of action. Colonel, there's WT coming through on Orbiter 2's frequency. Ah, something at last. Now, don't lose it. Cam, check the direction finders and make sure they're beaming onto those signals. Yes, sir. This is CSP Control Woomera calling DF. Are you receiving WT on Orbiter 2 frequency? Check, please. Urgent. Message from Orbiter 2 complete, sir. Here's the transcription. Thank you. Let's see, sir. Orbiter 2 to CSP control. Am in free orbit with oxygen for one hour only. Cause of ship disasters, explosions in compression chambers. Do not sacrifice more ships. Design at port. Bitter disappointment, Britain. Sounds pretty grim, Colonel. It is impossible. Every component in those ships was tried and tested. But he says... Design at fault. Direction finders put his position at ZA70Y51. All right. I'll try to get back to him. Darty's probably wrecked, so we'll stay on WT Brown. Okay, Colonel. Is there anything at all we can do? Not a thing. Bob's perfectly right about not sending up any more ships. The whole matter will have to go before the Commonwealth Government to the inquiries and tests. How long will it take? One year, two years, maybe more. I see. So the Commonwealth Space Project is back where it started, sir. Not quite. Not while Bob and his crew are still alive. They, they still give us some information which could change the whole picture. No response from Orbiter 2, sir. Oh, just keep sending. You, Mac, and I have the responsibility of finding out who the UFOs are, where they come from, and what their plans are. 
We must get that information back to CSP, whatever the cost. Yes, I understand. If only there was some Attention. way of getting... Attention! We are about to move out of orbit. You are advised to strap yourself down on the mattresses which have been provided. Get weaving, boys. If we suddenly start accelerating with about 10G thrust, we'll be spread all over the bulkheads. Yes. You will hear a warning signal begin 10 seconds before we open the jet. Well, they've started the compressors. Fasten your straps. Can you manage yours, Hickey? Yes, uh, just a battery. Yeah, I'll give you a hand. Here's your shoulder. It's fine. Those dressings must have had something pretty good in them. Just the joint that's a bit stiff, that's all. Uh, you'll be okay. Yeah, I'll be okay. You look after yourself, sir. Yes, I think I'd better. Ten seconds to go, Bob. Can you make it? Yes, sir. Yes, I can make it. I'll get your head down. Next stop, Mars. Could be... Colonel Kent. Yes? The interference is clearing on the sound channel, sir. What about the vision monitors? Yes, the pattern is disappearing, Colonel. Picture coming up on monitor one. Yes, it's one of our ships. Which, Bradley's or Bob's? Start calling again. Cape York tracking station reports that the interference zone is fading and moving off to the west. Too late to help us. In his last message, Britain told us they had oxygen for only one hour. And that's long past. Still, I'll try a call on our team. CSP calling Orbiter 2. You are now in the clear. Come in, please. No. Nothing there, sir. No. Nothing. Not long ago, you asked me if we were back where we started, Cam. I'm afraid the answer now is, yes, we are. Right back where we started. <laughs> I said, Bob, huh? uh, wake up. What is it? Ricky, can you hear me? <coughs> yes, I hear you. a peculiar taste in my mouth. So have I. We must have been drugged. Oh. Yes. They've mixed something with the oxygen. Oh, well, where are we? We're still aboard the UFO. It's time, eh? Uh, I'm low. My watch is gone. Oh, mine has too. You got yours, Hickey? No, it's not here. Been whipped. Mm, they all have. Our friends obviously don't want us to know how long we've been in flight. The calendar watchers would have told us plenty. Well, we, we haven't grown long beards, have we? Uh, they could have given us a shave. <laughs> Wouldn't quit past them. Don't miss a trick. Yeah. How about giving the jailer a shout? <laughs> they can't do any harm. But we won't learn much. We'll see. Hello there. Yes, Captain McLennan. We are listening. I thought you would be. What's the idea of the anesthetic? We sent you into a deep sleep in order to spare you the monotony of a prolonged flight through space. What about our watches? We want them back. They will be returned to you. In a few moments, we shall be landing. Landing, eh? Where? You will discover the answer to that if you cooperate. Now, check your safety belts. We are about to open the retro jets. <laughs> Bound to know where we are when we touch down. Can't keep us inside this thing forever. No, and just wait till we do get home. Prepare for landing. Get your heads back against the pads and relax. We're coming down through an atmosphere by the feel of it. Unfasten your straps. I, golly, I can hardly move. 
I feel as if I were about a ton. Yes, yeah, so do I. Well, we're, we're bound to notice the gravity after being in zero G. We must move slowly to start it. Sit up before you, you try to stand. Remember the drill. Uh, it's not too bad. Let me give you a hit, lift, Hickey. Yeah, thanks. I'm oh, shoulder. That's <clears throat> pretty good. That's fine. But take it easy. <laughs> uh, I'm okay. Hello? Ship's moving again. Now, what's going on now? Hey, feels as though we're going down on some sort of lift. I expect they're getting us clear of the landing platform. We'd better collect our gear before we're ordered out. Hello. What's wrong, man? My jet pistol's missing. So is my torch. Yeah, mine have disappeared, too. What about yours, Hickey? Yes, sir. The blighters have whipped the lot. They're making pretty sure we don't give them any trouble. Our time will come. Hello, Captain Britton. The jailer's calling in again. You are now about to leave the ship. For your own safety, it is essential that you should follow my instructions precisely. All right, I'm listening. The ship has passed through an airlock into our underground hangar. You will not need your helmets and breathing apparatus. You may move straight through the inner and outer escape hatches. Do you think this is a trick, Bob? It could be. We must watch our step. Carry on! All right. Come on, boys. I'm going to open the outer hatch now. Are we all set? Yeah. Yeah, all set, sir. Right. Here we go, then. Oh, it's as black as pitch out there. Now we know why they took away our torches. Yes. This is all part of the shock treatment. Hey, look, there is a light. Where? It's coming up. Just a faint oh, glow over that steel yeah. door ahead. Yeah, there is. Hello, they're, they're raising it for us. Yes. Pretty massive affair it is, too. Must have been made as a safety precaution in case of fire out here in the hangar. You are now about to enter the control center. After passing under the raised screen, you will go through the first door which you will find on the right-hand side of the panel. Here we go. Not going to be easy to get out of here. No, it isn't. Close the entrance behind us. We'll just have to play along for a while longer. That's all we can do. Right, keep moving. Stay together. What do you make of the noise, sir? The pumps. Generators are caught up. Maybe it's just part of the psychological softening up process. These people haven't brought us here for fun. If we've got some knowledge or information that they want, they may use unpleasant methods to get hold of it. I wouldn't put anything past them. We seem to have reached the door we were told about. Yes, uh, this must be the one. Now listen, just the last word of warning before we go through. You know the methods of interrogation used in police states, Hickey? Oh, I know, sir. And you, Mac? Uh, I've heard about them, Bob. The old stress techniques, eh? Exactly. And the build-up here seems to fit into the same pattern. Tension and uncertainty are calculated to undermine the judgment. So whatever happens, we must keep a grip on ourselves. Under no circumstances must we let these characters take over our thinking for us. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes, understood, sir. Good. We'll go in and see what we're up against. Follow me. Oh, the light! It's blinding! It certainly is. But look behind that spotlight at the far end of the room. You see what I mean? Yes, there's somebody there. And more than one. I can see a whole bunch of them. Ugly-looking customers. Still, at least they're human. I never doubted there'd be anything else. Well, let's start the ball rolling and see what happens. Hello there. Who are you? I am Commander Gelvin, deputy leader of the Unity Organization. That's the voice we had on the ship's intercom. Yes, he's the UFO character who brought us here. What do you mean by the Unity Organization? The leader is beside me here, Dr. Max Kramer. He will explain everything to you in due course. He must be the egghead with the deadpan look on his face. Yeah, quite it. Dr. Kramer, you've got a lot to answer for. I shall do my best to satisfy you, Captain Britton. Then you can start by telling us exactly where we are, why we've been brought here, and, and what you know about Captain Bradley. 
at this early stage of our meeting, I cannot give you the location of his headquarters. Regarding Captain Bradley, he and his co-pilot, Wilson, are safe and well. I believe that when I see them. You will, when we begin assembling the space station you call Orbiter X. So that's it. You know everything about it, of course. Not everything. Which answers your questions as to why you are here. We need your help. I expected something like this. The components of the station have been fired into orbit, and you know exactly how they should be fitted together. So we hope that you will supervise the work which will be carried out by our space engineers. You're mad if you think we're going to help you. In any case, you must see that when CSP don't get any signals from us, they'll send up more ships to find out what's happened. I think not. We sent a message to CSP in your name, and as a result... All your ships are grounded. Ah, so that was the WT signal we heard in the UFO. I appreciate your feelings, Light Engineer Hicks. But in order to understand the position, you must try to see beyond your own personal problems at the moment. They can all be put right for you. Just like that, eh? Yes. In due course, you may even be reunited with your family. With your wife, Susan, I believe. And your two young children, Charles and Anne. How do you know about them? We know a great deal that would surprise you. But let us think of the citizens of tomorrow, because this leads us to the purpose behind the organization which we call Unity. Its object is to make the world a safer place to live in. Isn't that what our politicians are working for? Some may be, but the only ones who can succeed must be trained scientists. Like yourself? Exactly. I need hardly remind you that in your democracy, no effort is made to connect scientific qualifications with political power. As a result, you have constant tension and uncertainty. So you're for the military state, are you? Not at all. That arises when the scientist's rightful place of leadership is taken by the mere man of action. This argument goes back to about 400 B.C., doesn't it, Kramer? Ah, you remember your Plato's Republic. Yes, Captain Britain, we unitists are planning a new world government led by men of science. Dangerous nationalism will be liquidated. Resources thrown away on armaments will be spent on welfare and scientific progress. And the spirit of the new order is the basic understanding which already exists between the scientists of all countries. Which country do you come from? That is of no importance. Our membership is international. Many of our people continue to work in their own lands. And, as scientists and engineers, they pass on to us information of technical progress, particularly in the fields of atomic and projectile developments. You must find that very useful. We do. By pooling our knowledge, we are already far ahead of you in space travel. You know that for yourselves. Yes. There's something I'd like to ask you about this. How is it your ships haven't been spotted from the Earth? Because they are fitted with electronic deflectors which screen them quite effectively from your radio telescopes and ground packing stations. Very occasionally you see them as unusual patterns on your radar, but they arouse no alarm because similar patterns are produced by natural phenomena. The interference zone we ran into in our ship, Orbiter 2, was that anything to do with you? Yes, it was another product of our electronic department. And you understand that it will provide invaluable camouflage when you join us on the assembly of Orbiter X. Yes. Supposing we did help you, what happens then? You're all very qualified to take your places in our organization, particularly yourself, Captain Britain. We have a very detailed statement of your record. And now I am prepared to answer any reasonable questions on unity. All right, it goes. You aim at a world government. We do. Then how are you proposing to get rid of the existing governments? Well, each country will still have its own administration, but its responsibilities will be strictly limited to internal affairs. It will have no control over its foreign policy. Do you really think that you could make the nations of the world knuckle down to a position like that? No, they wouldn't do well. it. Not without some pressure, perhaps. And what sort of pressure are you thinking of? I can best answer that by reminding you 
that the Second World War ended when Japan capitulated after just two small atomic bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We'd better get this quite clear. Are you planning an atomic war? My dear Britain, the true leader must have such a measure of scientific understanding that he is supremely aware of the relative insignificance of a few individual lives in relation to the future of the whole world. A few lives, the man's man. I've had enough of this. Sorry, I've had. We'll show him what we think of him and his unity organization. Take your hands. come on up. Take them to the detention cells. Oh, no, you don't. Kitty. Put your hands down. What? Take it easy. Is that an order, Bob? Yes, it is. Guard, take them away. Come on, what? Kelvin, we have a lot of work to do on these men. Yes. Britain and possibly McClellan may respond, but I have doubts about the engineer, Hicks. He is probably of little value to us. But he could be of use. In the research department? True enough. <laughs> yes. Yes, separate him from the others and take him along. Splendid. I'll see to it right away. Oh, one other point. Before you do, send that chemist person to me. Ravel? Yes. As she knew Britain when she was working in London, she might be able to help us. doing, Bob. What do you mean by that? Well, you know what's on my mind. At least we could have had a go at the blighters. Couldn't be worse off than we are now, stuck in a cell without a hope of getting away. And where do you suppose they've taken Hickey? I don't know. But, Mac, if we'd tried to tackle those guards, we'd have been finished. They were just dying for an excuse to use their guns. Okay, but at least we could have shown a bit of spirit and we might have got away with it. As it is, we look like a bunch of... Calm down, Mac. I'm going to have my say whether you like it or not. Listen to me, you old idiot. We can't afford to be heroes. We haven't just got ourselves to think about. Somehow we've got to warn CSP about these people. Don't you realize that? Oh, I... I suppose you're right. It's a pretty frightening responsibility and we must keep our heads. Otherwise, we, we'll play straight into Kramer's hands. Okay. Okay, Bob. I'm sorry. The guard's coming back. Maybe we're going to be separated now. If we are, remember what I told you. Sure. I shall be here if you need me, Dr. Ravel. Thank you. Well, what do you know? It's the feminine touch now, is it? Another shot for you, Captain McClellan. Oh, I'll say. Not such an unpleasant one, I hope. Uh, no. Come in. Have you nothing to say, Captain Britton? Yes. What are you doing here? Do you two know one another? Of course. Bob remembers me. Great Ravel, University College. We were students together. Well, tell me what you're doing here. I belong to Unity. Unity? Do you know what it means? Of course. You know that Crown is preparing to start an atomic war? That is not true. He told us himself. No, you're twisting his words. There may be some sacrifices, but there will be more than justified. Sacrifices? Justified? Now, you don't know what you say. I know that unless unity takes over, the great nations will eventually make the earth uninhabitable. But, woman, that's exactly what your people will do in the end. Save your breath, Max. She's been indoctrinated. That is not the case. I joined unity of my own free will because my scientific training enables me to see things clearly. With your background, you can also reach the point of understanding. You're wasting your time. Look, Bob, the guard is listening. I must speak quickly. I have only a few moments with you. You cannot fight these people. If you try to fight them, they will do the same to you as they're doing to your engineer. What do you mean? What are they doing to Hicks? He has been taken to the Space Medicine Research Department. If you give in now, you may save him. Is this a trick? Have you been told to say this? No, I'm risking everything. You must believe me. I can say no more. You must. Is everything all right, Dr. Ravel? Yes, I'm coming. My advice to you, Captain Britain, is think carefully. Don't worry, I will. I am glad. That is all I ask. Do you think this is a plan, Bob? I wish I knew. It's extraordinary she should turn up here. What sort of creature is she? That's impossible to say. I, 
I only got to know her casually in London. It's a long time ago, but... I remember she was on a special course from some university in Europe. She was always a dramatic type, and... Oh, look. She's left her shoulder bag behind. Give it to me. There's a gun inside it. What? A nice, neat little weapon. And, and it's loaded. Well, Kramer may have sent her here to tell us about Hickey, but he wouldn't have told her to leave this behind. No, and she wouldn't have left it by accident. She, she does want to help us, and this was the only way. So what do we do? I'll tell you. Listen carefully. We are not going to do anything unpleasant to you, Hicks. We are simply carrying out a certain program of research. Research, you call it. All right, tell me the worst. As you know, the normal functions of the body can be slowed down by a controlled process of cooling. And that's what you're going to do to me, is it? Yes. Now why? What's the idea? Looking ahead, we envisage space flights that may last months, perhaps years. In such cases, a form of uh, suspended animation based on the cooling principle would relieve the crews of all their discomforts. They will put themselves into this condition soon after takeoff, and a time mechanism would, as it were, bring them back to life as their ship approaches its objective. But it isn't human. You can't do this. Just relax, my friend. I am turning up the cooling control. God's coming this way, Bob. You know what to do? Yeah. Okay. I'll give him a shot. Hello there! Hello, God! What is it? Our lady visitor left something behind. Oh, very well. Here it is. Right, I will take it. What? Keep quiet and don't move. Otherwise, I shall use this gun. It's something your smart friends overlooked when they brought us here. Right. Get busy on him, Mac. Gag first. Okay. Yeah. You can't get the right hand. Try his hands. Good. There we are. Everything according to plan so far. You wanted action, now you're getting it. Is that gag secure? Yeah. Take a turn at this cord around his feet. Right. We'll make him pass the ring in the wall. Come on. Uh, we don't him hammering at the door after we've gone. We certainly don't. Right. Uh, and he's safe now. All right. Let's get away from here. I'm right with you, ma'am. Don't forget to lock up. Okay. And bring the key with you. Uh, won't get out of there in a hurry. Yes, I hope not. Well, now to find Hickey. We didn't pass the medical department when they brought us here. So we'll try the other direction. Come on. Do you think we'll ever find our way out of this place? If we don't, we'll sabotage everything we can lay our hands on. Yeah, they must have a radio center somewhere. Yes, that's a thought. If we could get in touch with Woomera... Listen. Somebody's coming. Through this door, quickly. There's a key in it. Right. Nobody's here. It's quite dark. Good. Here you go. Do you think they heard this? No. We'd better hang on for half a minute uh, until they get well away. Right. Uh, Mac, there's somebody else in here. Let's see if you can find the light switch. There might be one just beside the door. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. All right. It's Brad. Yes. So we found him. There's something wrong here. Yeah? Turn back that cover. Yeah. His legs in plaster. Brad. Brad, wake up. Uh, it must have given him a shot or something. Yes, but we've got to rouse him. Brad, it's Bob and Mac. Wake up. Uh, Brad, open your eyes. Uh, who, who's that? Look at me. Oh, I must be dreaming. Uh, not you know. What's happened? Where am I? Shh, gently does it. You mustn't make too much noise. You're here too, Mac. Yeah, laddie. Just take it easy. Oh, my leg. What's wrong with it? It seems to be broken, old son. Uh, put it in plaster. Eh? Oh. Oh, yes, I remember. I woke up on an operating table under a... Bright light. What happened before then? 
We were aboard the ship, Orbiter One. Yes, that's right. You were attacked. We got bits of your radio message at CSP headquarters. Yes. Carter, the engineer, was killed. After a bit, Wilson and I went out to try and locate a fracture that was letting the air out of the cabin. It was somewhere behind the paneling. We couldn't find it from inside. As soon as we went through the outer hatch, they got us. They must have been waiting for us on the hull. We couldn't believe it. We were too shocked to fight back. They got us just like that. Wow. How'd you break your leg? I don't remember. You've seen Kram and his stooge, Galvin? I've seen them. They give you all this propaganda stuff about unity? Yes, I've had it. What'd you say to them? Nothing much. You know they're prepared to launch atomic missiles on various cities all over the world. I gather that was going to be their way of taking over the government. I'm glad it's good to see you, but uh, do you know what's happened to Wilson? Haven't they told you? They said he was alive and well. They're lying. He was dead when they got him back to their ship after we left Orbiter 1. No. His oxygen tap had been turned off. Oh, poor devil. How did you get here, Bob? Well, there's no time to go into detail. It's, well, it's much the same story as yours. But these people have taken Hickey to the medical department, and we've got to find him. Uh, Brad, you've been there. Can you remember where it is? Uh, let me think. When I came out, there was a lift facing the door. They wheeled me in. We came down. Not very far. Only one floor, I think. Oh, think hard. Was it one floor, or could it have been two? No, I'm sure it was one. Good man. Mac, we'd better get cracking. Okay. We'll come back for you later, Brad. No, don't worry about me, Bob. I can't move anyway. You'll never get away from here if you try to take me with you. We're certainly not going to leave you here, chum. Don't be an idiot, Bob. I can kid these people along. You've got a job to do. You must get out and tell everybody what's going on here. Where is here? Do you know? No. Do you? We haven't a clue yet. Well, you'd better get cracking. Find out. All right, old man, we will. And we won't forget you. I'll be here. Open the door, Mac. All clear outside? Yes, all clear. Cheer up, Brad. All the best. You're going to be okay, Brad. Just hold on. I will. And for goodness sake, close that door behind you. The draft's killing me. Good luck. Good luck, old boy. That's hell leaving him like that. Yes. But we'll be back. Look, Bob. There's the lift. Good. Right. Up one floor and through the door facing us. <laughs> Sounds like money for old rope. And the lift's up there now? Yeah, we'll take the stairs. Quickly while there's no one about. Stop just before we get to the top. We don't want to run straight into the guards. Right. That must be our door over there. Careful crossing the passage. Okay. Good. I'll open the door. Our friend Gelpin will be back shortly, Hicks. Until then, I will look after you. I'll bet you will, Kramer. Naturally, I'm going. Don't to... move, Kramer. What's this? You close uh, the door, Mac. Uh, oh, Mac, by all that's wonderful. Hickey, what are they doing to you? Tried to turn me into a sort of Rick Van Winkle on ice. I'll tell you all about it later if you'll turn off that cooling switch and undo these straps. Okay, I'll see to it. Kramer, keep still. No tricks. How did you get here? And where did you find that gun? Never mind that. Ah, uh, we found Bradley. Hickey. You have? Yeah, he wouldn't come with us. He's got a broken leg. He said it'd slow us up. Oh, it's typical of him. What about Wilson? He's dead. What? No time to talk now, Hickey. Can you move? <laughs> Yes, I'll, I'll soon loosen up. Good. We've got to get out of here quickly and away. I've got it. The test flight. Huh? What are you talking about? A Kramer was just going to take up a new ship he sent Galvin to make the arrangements. It must be all set for launching. We might use it ourselves. What an idea. Kramer, is the ship ready for launching? Yes. Is it similar to the one that brought us here? It's a sister ship. Well, that means it's easily maneuverable and it can carry all of us. Where is it now? Where is it? It should be on the launching platform. And you were going to fly it yourself, were you? I was. Then we're not going to disappoint you. Start walking. I refuse to move from here. In that case, we have no further use for you. Mac, pass over one of those rubber cushions. It'll help to muffle the sound of the shot. Thanks. 
I'll wrap it around the gun like this. Now then. Very well, Britain. You win for the moment. Then take us to the ship. I'm putting the gun in my pocket, but I'm keeping you covered. If any of your staff ask any questions, we're your latest converts. You understand? Yes, I quite understand. And to avoid accidents, you'd be wise to take us out by the quietest route. Get moving. Bob. Yeah? Do you notice the carved stonework in these passages? Yes. What about it? Well, I've seen something like this before, but I can't just place it. You may be more interested in this past door. Why? Where does it lead? Straight out to the launching platform. Then open up. But watch your step. Ah, is he going to close his helmet and turn on his oxygen? No, he's not. Ah, oh, daylight! And fresh air. So we are on the earth. If you thought you were on some remote planet, you have only your imagination to blame. Don't worry. We had a good idea where we were right from the start. Grammar, is that the new ship ahead of us? It is. Well, quite a sight, isn't she? Yes. She seems to be all lined up for action. Who's this coming towards us? One of the engineers by the look of him. Watch out. Are you going aboard, Doctor? Yes. These officers are our newly joined specialists. So you may tell your people to stand down for a moment. I shall call you when I want you. Very good, sir. It's all too easy. There's a catch somewhere. Yeah, that's what I think. But the ground staff don't seem to be taking much notice of us. And keep your eye on them anyway. Right, Grammar. We're going aboard. I strongly advise you to change your mind, Britain. Why? What are you getting at? Well, this ship should have a final check before takeoff. Never mind. We'll skip that. Anything else? No, nothing else. But remember my warning. Okay, in we go, chaps. All aboard? Yeah, no, boss. Right. You can close the hatch now, Kramer. Oh, what a setter. It's just like the bridge on a liner. Hardly as large, but adequate. Uh, the controls look a bit different from these we're used to. Now, let me see. It would be unwise to touch anything. All right, get busy on the intercom and tell your control people to prepare for the countdown. But no tricks. The ship is quite independent of ground control. I have only to press this button to sound the warning on the launching platform and open the compressors. Then go ahead. Now. As you wish. <laughs> Get into your control seats and fasten your straps, Higgy. You too, Mac. Okay. Stand by for takeoff. Ten seconds to go. What are your instructions, Captain Britain? You'll turn into orbit when we reach an altitude of 300 miles. We'll work out our course after that. We're lifting. Watch your controls, Kramer. It is not necessary. The ship is operated by an automatic pilot, which is preset on a fixed course. There is no need to touch the controls until we land. Oh, yes, there is. Our destination is Woomera. That is where you are wrong, Captain Britain. Our destination is the moon. What? The moon? You're crazy. Let me turn on the scanner before the acceleration hits us. Get back at your seat, McClelland. The booster jets are opening. Oi. <laughs> That was quite a punch. It, it certainly was. You, you can turn on the scanner now, Mac. Okay. Look. That's the earth underneath us. Yes, and where did we take off from? Judging by our course now, I could have been from somewhere in South America. Am I right, Kramer? I have nothing to say. Then take over the controls and prepare to turn into orbit. Must I repeat myself? The controls are locked in an automatic pilot. Then unlock them and look sharp about it. Listen to me. This ship has been built for a specific job. It is designed to operate between my Earth headquarters and the unity base on the moon. We're back to that nonsense, are we? Let him go on. Thank you. No provision has been made to operate the ship manually during its journey because we are satisfied that the automatic pilot is virtually foolproof. Then what are these controls in front of us? Auxiliary retrojets. They can only be operated on the point of landing, and they are simply used for selecting the appropriate landing platform at the receiving end. 
And the receiving end in this case is supposed to be the moon, is it? Yes. I gather you find it difficult to absorb the fact, but it's perfectly true. My pioneers landed on the moon in the days when your Orbiter X project was still on the drawing board. Well, how could they get there without stopping at a space station for refueling? We evolved a new fuel based on the formula which the Russians used as long ago as 1959 when they launched their first successful moon probes. Even at that time, Professor Vladimir dobron Ravov revealed to the world that their first projectile was large enough to contain a cabin for two or three people. In view of the general advance since then, I fail to understand your apparent wonder at our unity achievements. Tell us about this moon base of yours. Well, as you would expect, it consists of a series of pressurized caves in the wall of a crater. Yes. We started with one cave, we sealed the walls with plastic, provided double doors and a lock at the entrance, and pumped in air. I see. From that small beginning, we now have workshops, living accommodation, an observatory and control room, even an agricultural center. You shall see for yourselves in due course. As much as I'd like to, it's my duty to hand you over to our people in Woomera. Mac, we must check over the controls for ourselves. Yes, sir, I think we'd better. Dickie, just sort out the radio equipment. I want to talk to Colonel Kent in Woomera. Okay, Bob, I'll have a look at it. You can save yourself the trouble, Hicks. When I started the ship's engines... I also took the precaution of switching the voltage control. You'll find the circuit is burnt out. So, my dear Britain, your friend Colonel Kent will not be hearing from you. BSP Central Control. Brown speaking. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell the Colonel. The Minister of Astronautics is waiting for you in your office, sir. Oh, good. I wanted to see him. Uh, check with the tracking stations and let me know right away if there's any developments. Right, sir. And you might ask for a special report on the Orbiter X components. I want to be sure they're not losing height or deviating from their course around the Earth. I'll be back soon. Good day, sir. Carry on. <clears throat> Ah, hello, Sir Charles. It's good of you to come along. Oh, no, not at all. I know you can't get away from here, and it's easy enough for me to fly over when I'm in Canberra. Oh, nevertheless, I appreciate it. Uh, do sit down. Thank you. Uh, can I offer you a drink? Oh, that's very kind of you. Uh, may, may I have a scotch and soda? Of course. Thank you. Now, um, uh, what was it you uh, wanted to see me about? I'll make it as brief as I can. Uh, ice? Uh, please. Well, thank you. Now then, if I may just review the position. Yes, of course. I've lost my two leading assembly crews. One led by Captain Bradley in ship Orbiter 1. The other by Britain in Orbiter 2. You know how I feel about these men. Yes, don't we all? We don't know what happened to them. All we do know is their ships are now a couple of derelicts circling out there in space. Right. And all our other ships have been grounded, pending inquiries and tests which may go on for a year or longer. Yes, these things take time. Now, uh, we're working on the assumption that there's a fault in the basic design of our ships. But the more I think about it, the less it satisfies me. Because I've checked hundreds of records, and I know that every component was tested to breaking point from the design stage onwards. So, uh, we must have more tests? Which may well prove to be pointless. What exactly are you driving at? Just this. The answer to the problem is not to be found here on the ground. It's locked away inside those two derelicts 1,200 miles above the ground. You may be right, Colonel Kent, but at the moment there's no way of getting to them. That's the point. I must have permission for one more ship to take off and carry out a survey. I hate to say, but uh, aren't you showing some disregard for the safety of your pilots? No, sir. I'm making a formal application to pilot the ship myself, and I can handle it without a crew. Really, I admire your courage. Oh, never mind that, Sir Charles. I foresee that unless we act quickly, the whole Orbiter X scheme is in danger of being shelved indefinitely. I doubt that, you know. There, there's too much money sunk in it. If we have a long hold-up, people will start asking awkward questions. And the government might decide to sell out its Orbiter X interests, perhaps for dollars. I see. Uh, yes. Uh, perhaps I'd better have a word with the Prime Minister. That's what I hoped you'd say. You can speak to him from here. I've already asked for a line to London. It's essential that I should be given permission to go ahead with the survey. And uh, there is one other point. Uh, what is that? As well as our manned ships being grounded, our unmanned projectiles are being grounded too. It's quite ridiculous. Typical bureaucracy. 
There's a moon probe should be on the launching platform now. Why can't we go ahead with that? I did have a word with the PM about it, but uh, I'll mention it again. Thank you. Even the projectile will give my staff a little encouragement and perhaps some hope for the future. I quite agree, uh, yes. Uh, well, 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 now, if you'll just show me uh, where your phone is, I'll uh, speak to the Prime Minister right away. So much for the engine room, Bob. Yes. As far as I can see, Kramer was telling the truth about the controls. The only way we could change the ship's course would be by using a socking great shifting spanner on those compression valves. And where would that get us? Well, by opening the starboard jets, we might be able to turn back towards the Earth. The chances are we'd either burn up in the atmosphere or shoot past without even getting into orbit. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I know I am. You can't maneuver a spaceship by playing around with valves and spanners. To interfere with the automatic pilot would be just as dangerous. So whether we like it or not, we shall be seeing the Unity Moon Base. Yes. The old pipe dream comes true. And it had to happen this way. Well, at least we don't have to worry about how we get there. No. Our worry is how we're going to get back. Come on. Better go to the cabin and see what's happening. Ah, Captain Britton. Have you satisfied yourself that everything is as I said? Yes. No luck, sir. No. What about the radio? That's uh, a complete write-off. Can't do anything with it at all. Why is the computer clicking? As this is still a test flight, I'm checking stresses on the hull. Well, I hope you're satisfied with the results. Yes. Everything appears to be in order, despite the fact that my engineers were unable to make a final check before takeoff. And you will be interested to know that we are following the predicted moon course. And what happens if we don't? The error would be put right by radio control from either the Earth or Moon headquarters. They are tracking us right throughout our journey. You once told us that all your ships are fitted with deflectors which screen them from ground tracking stations. Yes, from your stations, not from ours. Yes, but if we could turn off the deflectors, there's a chance we might be spotted by Woomera. Where's the switch, Kramer? There is none. The screening device and the deflector aerials are integral parts of the hull. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Icky? When we came aboard, I noticed some short aerials up on the forward part of the hull. That's certainly not radio. Well, they could be the deflectors. Yes, the radio array is further up. No, you're mistaken. I don't think so. You're onto something, Higgy. Now, if I went outside with a cutter... Those aerials belong to the intercom. If you had said they were part of the navigation system, I might have believed you. Yes, he slipped up there. Well, what's your plan, Chief? I'd, I'd like permission to go out and nip off those rods flush with the deck. Permission granted. I'll come with you. No, you don't have to, sir. I, I did plenty of underwater salvage work and demolition when I was in the Navy. <laughs> this lark isn't all that different. You mean you'd prefer to tackle it by yourself? <clears throat> well, uh... It is a one-man job, as you might say. <laughs> and you know exactly how to do it, eh? Well, I should do by now. There's uh, some cutting equipment in one of these lockers. I saw it when I was having a scout round. Ah, oh, yes, this is the stuff. Look how glad the gas floating all over the cabin. That gas cylinder merely brains. Oh, sorry, Captain Mack, I forgot about zero gravity. Don't let your enthusiasm run away with you. If I let you do this job alone, you must keep in touch with us by helmet intercom all the time. You understand? Aye, aye, sir. Then check your spaces. Now, don't worry about the gear. We'll collect it for you. <laughs> I'm all set, sir. The suit's okay. Good. Close your helmet and check intercom. I'll turn on my own throat mic so that I can keep in touch with you. Helmet closed. Oxygen okay. Checking intercom. One, two, three, four, five. Can you hear me? I'm not closing my helmet, but the intercom should be working. Yes, loud and clear. Open the airlock for him, Mac. Okay. Got everything you want, Hickey? Yes, sir. Right. In you go. Good luck, chum. Thanks, Bob. And don't forget to make your lifeline fast before you step through the outer hatch. <laughs> no, I won't. This is where old Hickey comes into his own. Yeah, it's rather like leaving a shop. Hello, control cabin. I've opened the outer hatch. I'm stepping out. Is your lifeline fixed? Yes. I'm moving onto the deck. You know your magnetic boots won't react to all the plates. Oh, no, I know, sir. We can hear your thumping great footsteps in here. Are you all right, Chief? Yes. Just looking at the earth. It's like a big green ball. Funny to think that's home. Gotcha. What's wrong? 
the deck. <clears throat> Using my jet pistol to get back now. That's <clears throat> better. I can't believe we're traveling around 25,000 miles an hour. Seem to be standing still. But the, the moon's a lot closer. You find the deflectors yet? Yes, I can see the ones that are in the sunlight. Can't see anything in the shade, not even my hands. Inky black. I'm going to turn on my helmet light. I started working now. I've got the heat cutter working. How are you feeling, Hickey? A bit queasy, sir, but getting over it. Good man. Uh, cutter's going through these rods like a knife through butter. Oh, wow. What's up, Hickey? Metal I've just burnt through is shining like a diamond. That's because there's no air to oxidize it. Blooming world as paradise, this is. Hello, Hickey. What was that? Uh, must have been one of the rods. After I cut through them, they just stay put, so I have to throw them away. The last one hit the deck. Ah, uh, those little rods will stay with us like pilot fish. Yes, all the way to the moon. Grandma, what's the idea behind this moon base of yours? It provides me with a valuable source of raw materials. And a place of retreat in the event of my earth headquarters becoming untenable. So you realize that your plans for world government might not come off? No. I'm merely prepared for minor setbacks. But with a base on the moon, I can't see why you're so interested in assembling Orbiter X. After I have established the world government, the space station will be enlarged as part of the second stage of my master plan. And what is that? Only my very nearest associates know. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Well, I seem to have finished the job, but I'm just checking up to make sure I haven't missed anything. What? Strange to think that the boys at Woman might be seeing us on their tracking screens now. Uh, Don't be too optimistic. Could be ours before they pick us up. Might not even pick us up at all. We're a pretty small target. Don't let Hickey hear you say that. Break his heart. Hello, sir. We're all clear. I'm entering the lock. Fine. I'm surprised that Kramer isn't more upset about this, Bob. Yeah, so am I. I suppose he realizes there isn't much the Earth Boys can do, even if we are spotted. I don't know about that. At least we'll have broken his screen of secrecy. Oh, here comes Hickey. Well done, Chief. What's it like out there, Chief? I'll just wait till I get my helmet off. Well, you're not cramped for space outside. <laughs> Let me take that equipment for you. Thanks. I think I've done the trick. I'm afraid you've just been wasting your time, Hicks. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, Hickey, it's about time you had some rest. No, sir, I'm all right. Now, listen, there's still a long way to go yet. We'll divide ourselves up into three watches. Mac, would you like to take the first one? Sure. I'll take the second, and Hickey can sleep right through until it's time for him to take over from me. Oh, that's very good of you, sir. I'll tell you what. I'll give you both a call when breakfast is served. Mac. Mm. Gabby Mac. Got some nice hot coffee for you. Uh, What's that? Coffee. All right, you, Hickey. How are we doing? Oh, we're getting pretty close to our target now. Yeah, we are, are we? Now, hold on to this squeeze bottle and don't scold yourself. Okay. Oh. Mm. Really is coffee. <laughs> How did you make it? No, I didn't. Grandma told me where to find it in the food store. Wonderful. Oh, of course, I'm strapped down. Did that to avoid floating in my sleep. Oh, Mac. How did you sleep? Hello, Bob. I seem to be dreaming most of the time. So did I. The space doctors say it's caused by the weightlessness. Mm. I dreamt I was floating around the Earth in a spacesuit, marooned on one of the components of Orbiter X. Mm. What's that picture on the scanner? That, my friend, is a close-up of the moon. What? You're looking at the northern hemisphere. The large dark crater is Plato. Over to the left there is the Great Valley, cutting straight through the lunar Alps. Oh, I want to see more of this. Now finish your coffee first. You won't be able to when the retro jets start firing. You mean we really are going to land? Yes, I don't think there's any doubt about it now. According to Kramer, we're landing in a crater which, with his usual modesty, is called Unity. It's right on the rim of the moon as we see it from the Earth. 
I'll turn the television camera over to it. Mm-hmm. There, there it is. Not far from the crater of Wajenti. Uh, I see. Well, if that's where the moon base is, he's chosen a good spot. Yes, being on the rim, it's safe from Earth observation. Exactly. Oh, you're awake, are you, Crowler? But of course. Uh, how big is this unity crater? It is no more than 20 miles across. And how high are the walls? The almost vertical cliffs rise to a height of 1,000 feet. Now, there seem to be one or two breaks in them. Yes, those are canyons. And where's the base you were telling us about? Inside the western wall. I can see something flashing down there. Yes, what is it, Cromer? That is our landing platform. As you see, my staff are there to receive us. I shall now stand by the auxiliary rotor controls in order to make any final adjustments necessary to bring us down onto the target. Hello, what's that? The warning that the ship's inverters are about to start prepared to landing. Here we go. We're turning over. No, the tail. Get into your contour seats and fasten your belts. When the tail is pointed towards the landing platform, the retro jets will open. The jets are about to fire. Prepare for deacceleration. We're not breaking as hard as I expected, Mac. No. I suppose Kramer knows his stuff. But if I was at the controls, I'd open the auxiliaries pretty quickly. He's doing it now. Something's wrong. Bob, look at the scanner. We're turning away from the landing zone. Yes, and we're still coming down too fast. Karma, where's the trouble? A halt in the fuel supply to the auxiliary compressor. I must get to the taps. Where are they? On the starboard bulkhead. By the chair where my engineer would have been on duty. Can't do it on his own. Mac, he can give him a hand. Right. Uh, leave it to us. Yeah, hold on yourselves. If you let go, the chief thrust will throw you through the bulkhead. Don't worry. We'll hold on. All right. Come up. I'll take the controls. Keep them steady as they are. Okay. Right, Karma, we've got dinner. Come on over, uh, we go. Hang on to the hand grip. Help me into the engineer's seat. Uh, that, that, that's it. Now return to your nose. Quick as you can. You've got about 20 seconds. Go on, the gate. Okay, Max. If we get the jets on full boost while they're crossing the cabin, we'll be finished. I have located and corrected the fault. Hold it, Karma. Wait for the boys to get into their seats. Hurry up, Mac. All right. What are you there for? Okay, Bob. coming up. There are too many rocks. I'm aiming towards a small crater. Stand by for crash landing. Here we go. Bob, you hurt? No. no. Nothing serious. What about the rest of you? I, I'm all right. And me, sir. Just passing my belt in time. Good. And Karma? Uh, thank you for your interest, but I'm uh, quite safe. We are losing pressure through the engine room. I must toss the bulkhead. Funny, I'm rather glad Karma's all right. I must be moonstruck. No, Hickey, it is a strange character. I wonder why he gave us time to get back to our seats like that. Yes. Why did you do it, Kramer? For purely economic reasons, you happen to be of more potential value to me alive than dead. Oh, I thought we might have been on the brink of a beautiful friendship. Turn it up, Hickey. Okay, sir. Well, so we're on the moon. It's good to feel a bit of gravity again. Well, there isn't much of it. What's that? Ship moved. Yes, it did. Can't see much from the observation windows until the dust clears outside. Something's going on. Cromer, have you any idea where we are? Yes, I have. But go on, what's wrong? We have landed on quicksands. What? Quicksands? Are you sure? Yes, I know these areas only too well. Well, we'd better get out of here. If you leave the ship, you'll be swallowed up. In fact, there's a very real danger that the whole ship might be buried. Are you serious? Quite serious. We are sinking now. Well, can't we start the jets? They are choked in dust. If you turn them on, the compressors will explode. Well, you're supposed to be the mastermind. What about it, eh? What do we do? Our course will have been plotted by the staff at Moon Headquarters. It's probably been plotted at Woomera, too, but that doesn't help us to get out of this mess. Listen to me. My HQ staff will have put rescue measures into operation already. 
They will know our position and no time will be wasted. But how are they going to reach us here? They can't travel over those sands. Nothing is impossible. And regarding your remark about Woomera Hicks, you and your friends have overlooked the most important point. Oh, yes? You did indeed destroy the ship's deflectors. But this will have become immediately apparent to my staff, both here and on the earth. Within a very short time, they would have started their interference transmitters. We'll have been screened from your tracking stations throughout our entire journey. I shouldn't be too sure about that if I were you. As you say, nothing is impossible. And strange things can happen to space radio. Prime Minister, I quite understand. I'll tell Colonel Kent. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, Sir Charles, what's the verdict? Well, as you heard, Kent, I put all your points to him. Your offer to take up a ship single-handed is regarded as a very gallant gesture. He asked me to tell you that. Thank you very much. But has he given permission for me to go ahead and do it? No. He's got to discuss it with the Commonwealth governments. Uh, there'll be a meeting in about six weeks' time. Six weeks? Uh, yes, I explained the urgency. <sighs> And what about the moon probe? Uh, the moon probe? Oh, well, he, he was good enough to leave that to my discretion, uh, providing I keep him well in the picture, of course. At least with one point there. I take it you've no objection to me launching the probe? It's, 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 it's rather difficult, Kenji. You, you see, the PM drew my attention to the fact that if there should be an unforeseen accident on the firing platform... Oh. I'm not saying that it's likely, but, but if there was an explosion... And if it involved any serious loss of life, uh, the results would be most damaging to all of us. So the main risk is to our reputations, is it? No, no, no. I, I'm considering the broader issues, the entire Orbiter X project, in fact. So even the probe remains grounded, does it? In the circumstances, I do feel it would be foolish to take any unnecessary risks for no immediate reason. And that's your final word? I'm afraid it must be uh, for the moment. Come in. Uh, yes, Brown, what is it? I've just had a tracker report in, sir. I thought you ought to be told right away. Well, what is it? An unidentified flying object has been seen approaching the moon at 1835. What? There was a good deal of interference, but the report has been confirmed by no fewer than ten tracking stations. Uh, uh, couldn't this object have been a meteorite? Not a chance of that, sir. The trackers held it for almost a minute before it disappeared into the Wargenton area near the rim of the moon. Did they get a description of it? Only that it was cigar-shaped, made of metal, and rather bigger than anything we know to be in production on Earth, sir. Right. I'll follow this up at once. Right, sir. Sir Charles, a moment ago you said it would be foolish to take any unnecessary risks for no immediate reason. Now we have that reason. So, can I have permission to launch the probe? I... I don't want to be difficult, Kent, but what practical purpose will it serve? The projectile can be aimed at the area where the UFO landed. Its TV cameras may or may not send us back pictures. That depends on the interference level. But there's a good chance that its film cameras will bring us back some very interesting material. Yes, but we, we, we don't want any diplomatic complications. This UFO, or U UFO as you call it, must surely be a Russian or American rocket of some sort. We'll check with the UN Space Department if it is. We might consider ourselves fortunate. But if this object, which has just been sighted, is a genuine UFO belonging to no country on Earth, then it follows that our boys were not alone in space when they met with disaster. They could have been attacked. Yes, I... Yes, I, I, I suppose it is just possible. I'll get on to the Space Department now. But if my theories are correct, there is still one ray of hope. Britain and his colleagues may not be entombed in their derelict ships out there in orbit. They may be still alive... But under what circumstances and in whose hands, heaven alone knows. Uh, temperature in the cabin's getting a bit trying, Bob. Yes, Mac. The ship's in the full glare of the sun. That dust bowl outside is like an oven. Crom, is there anything we can do to step up the cooling plant? No. The main generators are wrecked, and we are already overloading the batteries. There is no more power available. We'll have to be getting out of here soon anyway. Look through the observation port, Bob. The dust's beginning to settle, and you can see what the situation is now. Yes. Quicksands are doing their work. The ship's tail section's entirely buried. 
We must get out of the airlock before that's swallowed up, too. Yeah, we'd better move fast. Yes, collect your gear, check spacesuits, and bring all the reserve air bottles you can carry. Aye. Uh, okay, sir. You know, ever since I was a kid, I've dreamed of landing on the moon. Yeah, but not this way, Mac. No, never like this. Huh? What's going on? The ship's moving. Yes, it's turning over. We've got to get out. Open the airlock. Now close your helmets, all of you. Turn on helmet intercom. Jump to it, boys. Jump quickly. Come on, I'm up here, Bob. Okay, Bob. Okay. Okay. Open the air, Alf. The ship's toppled over from the vertical into an almost horizontal position. Yes, and it's listing on this side, just where we want to get out. Pressure zero. Open the outer hatch. Everybody out, quickly, before the lock fills up with sand. Another half a minute and we'd have been trapped. Yes. You all okay? Yes. We're all right, Bob. Climb up further, onto the highest part of the hull. Can't see a thing through this dust. Maybe it's just as well. Yes. What's happened to your rescue party from the moon base, Kramer? How far they've got to come? I estimate the distance about 60 miles. They should be here in a moment. How are they traveling? By hover car. It is not unlike the so-called saucer which was developed in England. But that travels on air cushions. There's no air for the lifting jets here. We substitute electrically charged atoms. You mean you've developed ionic jets? Exactly. They lift the machine just clear of the ground, whatever the nature of the surface may be. I suppose the thrust doesn't have to be very strong to offset the moon's gravity. There they are. Well, thank goodness for that. Are you receiving me? Hello, Neeson. Yes, I'm receiving you on my helmet intercom. You are most welcome. What is your distance from us and your speed? We are closing with you at 1,000 yards. Have you got our position? Yes, I am watching you on the scanner. Hold on. Beware of my jets as I move in. I understand. Range closing. Seven hundred yards. And we still can't see him. Captain Gritton. Yes? You heard Commander Neeson's warning about the jets. When he comes alongside, the blast could sweep you away. Wait for instructions before you jump aboard. Right. We'll lie flat. Don't you get Mac? You too, Hickey. Okay. The ship won't last long now. See how the sand's creeping up on us? Yes. The rescue party's just about made it in time. Bob, I can see something moving through the dust. Uh, uh, here. Oh, thank goodness for that. Crom, I, I never thought I'd be pleased to see any friends of yours. I certainly am now. Quiet. Hello, Unity Leader. I am about to come alongside. I shall cut the lifting jet for five seconds. Understood. Britain. McClelland, Hicks, during that five seconds, you may jump onto the hover car. If you miss your footing, you will be lost. The jets must restart immediately, or the machine will be trapped in the sand. Okay, I'll get it. Fair enough. Here she comes. The Grace Darling. Looking more like a flying saucer than a blooming lifeboat. I keep down. I can feel the blast. She's coming alongside. Jump aboard. I am cutting the jets now. Right. Jump. Here we come. We are entering a canyon which leads into the Unity Crater and our moon headquarters. And just look at those cliffs on either side of us. They must go up a couple of thousand feet. And although the sun's shining on the tops of them, it would be pitch dark down here without the searchlight in front of the hover car. I wouldn't like to be lost around these parts. Neither would I. We're coming out into the crater. Gosh, it's enormous. It stretches as far as you can see. 
Actually, it is comparatively small. But distances are deceptive because of the sharp curvature of the moon's surface. We are now turning and following the line of the cliffs. I say, Bob. Yes, Hickey. If you look back across the crater, you, you just get a glimpse of the tip of the earth. It's right down on the horizon. Yes. Earth set. That is as much as we ever see of it here, because we are in the libration area on the rim of the moon. From other locations, the Earth appears to be some 12 times the size of the moon as you see it from home. Ah, that's a lot more attractive than this countryside. Give me the highlands any day. Yes. This is a dead world. Mountains, craters, and dust. How long have you been here, Neeson? I have been in charge of the moon base for almost a year. Aren't you fed up with it? No. I live for my work. How many people have you got on your staff here, Kramer? Not enough. That is why we are always ready to welcome new workers. Oh, I see. Our base is built inside that cliff wall there, now directly in front of us. The square opening at the foot leads up to the airlock. Oh, there's not much to see from here. Wait till you're inside. Is this where we stop? Yes. We enter the lock on foot. Step out and follow me. <laughs> Talk about being as light as a feather. How'd you like to play a game of lunar cricket, Bob? You could throw the ball miles. It'd certainly be interesting. You will enter the airlock, please. Come on, in we go, Hickey. When our pioneers arrived here, this, of course, was an open entrance to the cave system, which has become our headquarters. What's the composition of the air that's being pumped in? Normal, except that we substitute helium for nitrogen. As you know, it is less ready to gasify the blood under sudden decompression. Right. How much oxygen do you allow each man for a day? I aim at three and a half pounds, but we recover about 80% from exhaled carbon dioxide. Pressure normal. The inner hatch is opening. You may now dispense with your helmets. The air smells good. Yes, it is. And by the way, the sound you can hear is the solar generating plant. I see. And now, Captain Britton, since we arrived here on the moon, you have all behaved sensibly. You appear to understand your position. You are utterly dependent upon unity for your continued existence. Even the air which you are breathing is supplied by us. Escape is impossible. I therefore expect your cooperation. All right. We'll accept orders within reason. But we still owe our allegiance to CSP. Is that clear? Perfectly. You understand, Mac? Yes, Rob. Well, you too, Ricky? Aye, aye, sir. Good. Good. I am glad we understand one another. And now you may be interested to see something of our work. Uh, come with me. I will realize that everything here is on a reduced scale. But first, we'll look into the control room. Hello, sir. Hello, Littman. Glad to see you, sir. Thank you. Anything to report? Yes. Commander Gelbin is prepared to take off from the Earth headquarters with a relief ship. He is waiting for your instructions. I will speak to him later. Yes, sir. As you see, Britain, we have everything here which is necessary to the handling of our ships. Visual monitors, radio control, beam approach, interference transmitter, and so on. Come with me. Well, it's uh, quite a setup. Yes, it is, isn't it? I want you to see what we have achieved on our comparatively slender resources. You will realize that when we have formed the world government, there will be no limits to our scientific progress. What's that I can hear? Drilling operations. We are opening up a new gallery. Now, this is the air conditioning room. I'm sure it will interest you as future orbiter ex-officers. The pumps are extracting stale air from the headquarters and circulating it through cooling pipes. First, the water content is frozen out and separated, then the carbon dioxide. So we are left with clean oxygen and helium, which shall return for use. Yes, and you're getting oxygen from the chlorella plants in the illuminated water tanks. Yes, but the main object is to harvest the plants themselves and process them for food. When the sun is in a suitable position, they are exposed to its light by opening the shutters. What on earth is this? What's happened? Stay here. He'll soon know. 
Explosion in the drilling tunnel, sir. There are five men trapped in there. Now, what could have caused this? Probably an escape of gas. You said that the moon was a dead world, but that is not entirely correct. When you dig below the surface... Has anything like this happened before? Yes, once. Were there any survivors? No. And it is unlikely that there are any now. But you'll organize a rescue party? We shall see. Dr. Grammer, I have just looked through the airlock. The tunnel is completely blocked. I'm afraid the men are trapped. Their position is hopeless. There's nothing we can do. Get back to your post. Grammer, aren't you going to try and help those men? They are almost certainly beyond our help, and I'm not prepared to risk more lives. Our numbers are too small. But you just can't leave them. It's no concern of yours. I swear you're wrong. Some of the victims might still be alive. Hmm. Yes, I wonder. You would like to help them, hmm? Yes. Whether they're unitists or not, they're human beings. Very well. I have endeavored to meet you on all points. You shall be the rescue party. All right. I should not like to be thought inhuman. Neeson, take Captain Britton and his friends down to the tunnel. See them safely through the airlock. I must say it. Seems pretty hopeless, Bob. The tunnel's blocked good and proper. Yes, it certainly is. It's not going to be easy. Working in spacesuits. There's no help for it, I'm afraid. The pressure's almost down to nothing. There must be an air leak through to the outside surface. Yeah. That's why they've installed the airlock here. Safety precaution. Exactly. Kramer's too wily to be caught by explosive decompression. Without that lock... The whole HQ would have been vacuumized. All right, chaps, start working. Hello. I found a small gap in the debris here. Where am I? If we can open it up, we might be able to squeeze through. There could be somebody on the other side. Mind out. There he goes. Fine. Let me shine my torch to you. Uh, what can you see? I can see that the tunnel continues on the other side of this fall. That's about all. Hello. Somebody's coming through the lock. They're keeping an eye on us, I suppose. Hello, Captain Brayton. Yes, what is it? Dr. Kramer wishes to see you in the control room. Oh, what for? I cannot say. My instructions are to take you there immediately. All right. Carry on, boys, but don't kill yourselves. I'd better see what this is all about. Ah, Britain. How is your risk? You were proceeding. Well, you've hardly started yet. But you didn't bring me here to ask me that, did you? No. I want you to tell me what you know about certain activities at Woomera. Well, what are you getting at? Mason, stand away from the monitor screen. Now, Captain Britain. What do you see? No. Ah, you recognize it. Why, well, it's obvious what it is. Yes. A moon probe. Our Earth headquarters inform us that it was launched from Woomera, and according to our calculations, it should reach this area in another six hours precisely. So what? Tell me, will it land or will it go into orbit and then return to the Earth? I don't know. Don't fence with me, Britain. As a senior pilot, you know perfectly well what this projectile is designed to do. Well, it could land or it could orbit, you know that. Quite. But assuming that it does land, which seems most probable, judging by the design, what is its program of operations? Oh, well, why ask me? You'll probably find out for yourselves. We certainly shall. Because we intend to recover the projectile and bring it back here by hover car in sections if necessary. Uh, and incidentally... The hover car can be perfectly screened from observers on the Earth. I was wondering about that. And with the projectile safely in our workshops, you, with your expert knowledge, can help us to dismantle it completely. We shall see. I shall tolerate no nonsense. Machines such as this provide us with a valuable source of materials and components. But how do you hope to find the thing when it lands? It is transmitting a most convenient signal. 
which will doubtless be familiar to you. Litman, turn up sound. Yes, sir. Now, listen. Our hover car simply homes on that after the landing. Yes, but your interference transmitter isn't working yet. When you switch it on, surely it'll swamp these signals? No. We shall still be able to pick them up at short range. All right, Batman. You can cut sound. You seem to have everything worked out nicely. I think we have. Now go back to your good work. Now, there's just one more point. Well? For the sake of your friends, I hope you will help us. What do you mean? Think it over. All right, Letman. Take Captain Britton back to the tunnel. Yes, sir. This way, Captain Britton. So that's the position, chaps. And I hate the idea of Kramer getting hold of the moon probe. It's rather a nice piece of machinery. It's still classified. I don't think... uh... Hickey knows very much about it, Bob. No, I don't, as a matter of fact. Well, Hickey, the, the idea is that the rocket carries a small tractor. Huh? After the landing, the tractor comes out and travels around on the surface of the moon for about 12 hours. I see. It carries film and television cameras. And it picks up samples of soil and rock. And at the same time, instruments record cosmic radiation, temperatures, ultraviolet and so on. Well, I did hear a whisper that it was in production, but isn't it steered from the earth through the television link? Yes, but if that breaks down, it feels its way along and avoids obstructions and very soft ground. And then, Hickey, when it's done its job, it toddles back to the pen ship, the action of it going aboard triggers off the rocket, and the whole issue returns to the earth. Oh, do you think it'll work? I was sure it would, if Kramer didn't fool around with it. I saw the thing under construction, and it's a masterpiece of engineering. Ah, it certainly is. And it's got tremendous possibilities, because without the tractor, the rocket could take a cabin big enough to carry two or three men. Yes. Say that again, Mac. Oh, George, yes. It could carry us back to the Earth. Yes. Are you serious, Mac? I was never more serious in my life. I can't believe it. This is our answer. It's our only chance. But how do we get out of here? We can't go back. I'll show you. Follow me. We've got a surprise for you. I haven't had a chance to tell you about this yet. We've opened the gap in this stuff. You can see through it. Look. I don't see a thing. Over to the right, sir. Ah, daylight. Yes, it's a crack in the wall. It must go straight through the cliffs. And if we wipe it up... We can get through into the open. My golly, and break at last. We'd be quite close to the spot where they parked the hover car. That's right. And all we got to do is to grab it and get going. I know how it works. I watched Neeson pretty closely when he was bringing us here. Yeah, hold your horses, chaps. Now, let's think. The moon probe isn't pressurized. Ah, we'd have to rely on our spacesuits. What about oxygen? Well, there's cylinders of the stuff on the hover car. Yes, that's true. We could take some with us. But can we stand the takeoff acceleration of the rocket, Mac? Ah, uh, sure. It's far less than we're used to in takeoffs from Woomera. We might be a bit uncomfortable when we get into the Earth's atmosphere, but the rocket has a good cooling system to protect the gear. <laughs> that sounds like a piece of cake. And don't talk too soon, Hickey. We've got to stay here in the tunnel until just before the probe lands. During that time, we must take it in turns to give the unitists... Progress reports. We know the poor devils who are trapped here are finished, but as far as Kramer and Neeson are concerned, we haven't given up hope. Okay, Bob. Within the next five hours or so, we've got to hack our way through that wall. Once outside, we sprint over to the hover car and drive off. Hell for leather. And as there's only one hover car, the unitists can't follow us. No. Once we're aboard, we're halfway home. <laughs> Probe bearing TK seven HX five four. It's well inside the moon's gravity pool now, Sir Charles. Still no interference. No. How does that fit into your theories? It doesn't yet, but I'm certain that we shall lose the picture on the monitors. 
The interference is bound to begin any moment now. In the meantime, the probe's sending us some magnificent TV pictures of the moon's surface. Just look at the great ray crater of Tycho. Do you see how the walls rise in terraces? It's, it's almost dazzling. Sir Charles, look at the picture. Yes, I'm looking. You see those ripples creeping across it? Yes. It's the same interference pattern we've seen before. Now, sound gone, vision going. So you were right, Kent. Yes. The interference is being generated. It must be the work of somebody or something. But what's at the back of it? I don't know. But I won't rest until I find the answer. Neeson, I want to know where the projectile will land. Give me the information quickly. Right, Dr. Kramer. I am feeding the details into the computer now. The CSP people seem to have produced a rather successful machine. It's behaved very well. I shall be most interested to see what they put into it. According to our calculations, if it holds to its present course, it will land very close to us. Where? About 40 miles to the north. Almost on the fringe of Argentin. I wonder why. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Oh, Letman, have you checked the interference transmitter? Yes, sir. It is quite in order. Dr. Crummer! What is it? I am looking at the time figures. The projectile is slightly ahead of schedule. How far ahead? Approximately 15 minutes. Very well. Go and prepare the hover car. I'll join you shortly. Then we can set out towards the predicted landing zone before our Woomera visitor arrives. Uh, this is a tougher job than we thought. Yes. Keep going, Hitty. We're almost through. Oh, we should see the hover car as soon as we get this last bit of rock out of the way. The trouble is, the sweat keeps running into my eye. Okay, Mac, I'll take it. Oh, thanks, old boy. We must remember to localize our intercom before we go out. We're screened while we're in here. But we don't want the, to broadcast our conversation when we get outside. Okay, Mac. Yes, Mac. How's the time going? The projectile's due to land in about half an hour. Uh, Mind your hits. Uh, 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 nice work, Bob. Last barrier's down. Right. Out we go. Straight for the hover car. You watch your cables. Right. Uh, I'm coming. Hold it. Oh, no. What is it? A hover car. It's taking off. Uh, too late. Kramer's beaten us to it. Uh, there must be something we can do. Yes, I think there is. But I shall have to move fast. What do you mean, Bob? I'm getting back through the tunnel, through the airlock, and up to the control room. We've got to get that hover car back here. And the only way to do it is to send Kramer an emergency message on the radio. Oh, what will you say? I don't know yet, Mac. But I, I think of something. Maybe I'll make the radio operator do the talking. Oh, I suppose he refuses. Yeah. Remember I picked up a knife in the tunnel? I don't think he'll argue when he sees that. Uh, it's worth having a go. Let's get cracking. No, Hickey. You and Mac will stay in the tunnel entrance. If the plan works, you'll see the hover car come back pretty soon. Wait until Kramer gets out and goes back through the main airlock into the base. Then run like blazes. Get aboard the car, deal with the crew, and set off straight for the rocket. You know how to find it by steering on its radio bleeps. Wait a minute. What about you, Bob? I'll join you if I can. But if I don't show up by the time you're ready to start, don't wait. We're not leaving without you. Uh, not likely. You will if I'm not there. Now, listen, Bob. And that's an order. We've got to tell CSP about unity and nothing else matters. But, Bob... Don't argue. There's no time to lose. I've got to get through the tunnel and into the control room quickly. Hope to see you later. Okay. Good luck. Good luck to you, chaps. Thanks, Bob. We'll be watching for you. Hello. This is Moon Control calling. MHQ to other car. Are you receiving me? Hello, MHQ. Yes, we are receiving Dr. Kramer, this is radio operator Letman. I have just received a signal from Unity Earth headquarters. Commander Galvin has taken off aboard relief ship Unity 4 and will be landing here as arranged. Message understood. 
Thank you. That is all. No. Not quite all that money. What is it? What are you doing here? Don't move. Keep your hand away from that transmission key. What do you want? I want Kran. I've brought back. Right away. But that's impossible. He's going to recover the woman of projectile as soon as it lands. Exactly. That's why I'm here. I don't understand. Now listen. You're going to call him up again. You're going to tell him that you've just had another signal from your Earth headquarters. I can't do that. Tell him that you have an intelligence report saying that the Woomera moon probe is a trap. It's believed to be fitted with an atomic charge which is likely to explode as soon as he starts the recovery but work. He was Say that been... Captain Britain should know about this and could probably make the charge harmless. You will also tell him to return here at once for more information. Have you got that? You'd better talk to Dr. Kramer yourself. I shall have nothing to do with it. I think you will. Oh, take that knife away from my throat. Are you going to talk or not? No. Well, in that case, I... Oh, all right, I'll do it. Good. But be very careful what you say. Have you got the message straight? Yes, but I don't understand what you hope to achieve. Now, never mind. Press that transmission key and start talking. Hello? Moon control calling. MHQ to hover car. Come in, please. Urgent. Hello, MHQ. Hover car answering you. Dr. Kramer, I've just received an intelligence report about the woman of projectile. It is believed to be a trap. It has an atomic charge which may explode if you approach it. EHQ say that Captain Britain knows this and knows how the mechanism works. Yes, this is interesting. Earth headquarters ask if you will return to base as soon as possible for more information. Very well. I shall go into this most carefully. It confirms my suspicions. Your, your suspicions? Yes. It seemed a strange coincidence that the probe should be landing so close to base. I shall be with you shortly, Ledman. Very good, sir. Well done, Ledman. Now perhaps you will tell me what you hope to get out of this. You shall see, all in good time. And while we're waiting, you will cut the interference transmitter so that my friends in Woomera will be able to pick up the rocket on their monitors before it lands. You heard me, Letman. Ah, very well. That's better. Hey, you are free to speak to them on the radio if you wish. <laughs> Thanks for the suggestion, Ledman, but I know what you're thinking. Kramer might intercept the transmission. No, I shall wait until he's safely back and halfway through the airlock. That, my friend, is when I shall call Woomera. Inky, hey, listen. We're picking up the sound of engines on our helmet receivers. It must be the hover car coming back. Yes, you're right, Mac. Yes, look. There it is. So Bob's plan has worked. Yes, but where is he? He should be back with us now. What should we do if he doesn't show up? He's given us our orders. We carry them out. Yes, I suppose we must. Uh, a hover car stopping outside the entrance to Moon HQ. Yes, so I see. Keep time. Uh, Kramer's getting out. Uh, so is his station commander. What's his name? Uh, Neeson. That's right. And the uh, rest of the crew's following. Yes. We're in luck. Uh, all going into the airlock. Do you think we can get the hopper car moving as soon as we get aboard? Yes, sir. I watched exactly what Neeson did with the controls when he brought us here. I think I've got them taped all right. Good. I think I have to. Now, you're all set. Yes. I hate going ahead with her, Bob. But there's no alternative. Come on. Run for it, right? <laughs> Hello, hello. This is Captain Britain calling CSP Woomera. Captain Britain calling CFP Woomera. I'm speaking from a base 40 miles south of Wagentin in the third quadrant of the moon. Kramer's arrived back. You are too late. Go away, Ledman. This is urgent. There is nothing wrong with the CSP ships. We were attacked by a hostile force called Unity, which is planning to take over Orbiter X as a preliminary... To world conquest. You must take action right away. All right, leave him to me. I can't say any more. That stopped him. Letman, did you cut the transmitter? No, but it's all right. The power was turned down. 
Huh? Trying to talk to CSP. Was he? He was, but he will not have been heard, Dr. Neeson. Where are McClellan and Hicks? I haven't seen them. But what has been happening? Britain came in just after I sent you the signal about Commander Gelbin. He had a knife and... So he was here when you sent the second signal, the warning about the projectile? Yes. Why did he let you send it? Answer me. He made me. What do you mean he made you? Speak up. He forced me to send it. I, I thought it might be genuine. Had you any reason to doubt it? You got the warning from EHQ Intelligence? Oh, did you, Lippman? No, I did not. What? Britain gave it to me. So, it was a trick. Yes, a trick. And you knew it, Lippman. He had a knife at my throat. You and all the rest. Take him away. No, let me explain. I believe you were... Get him out of my sight. I shall deal with him later. Hammer, the interference transmitter has been turned off. Turn it on quickly. And turn up the monitors. Right. What's that on the screen? Hmm. Why, it's... It's the other car. It's moving away. I don't understand. I think I do. Hello, hello. This is MHQ calling hover car. Answer me immediately. They're not speaking. Who? Who is aboard? Britain can answer that. Give him a shot of restorative. My jet pistol has only knocked him out. He's not seriously hurt. Right. He has succeeded in making idiots of us all. I still don't follow. It is obvious that he and his friends found a way out of the tunnel. They hope to reach the hover car and meet the Womera projectile when it lands. We left before they could reach it, so Britain used Littman to call us back. So McClelland and Hicks are aboard. Exactly. And look at the screen. They are steering straight for the Wargenton landing area. Uh, the restorative is beginning to work. Good. Uh, Britain. Uh, Britain. Uh, Rouse yourself. Uh, Kramer. Open your eyes. Now listen to me. You are going to the radio, and you are going to speak to McLellan and Hicks. What? Now I'm going to do the dictating. I have a message for you to broadcast to the friends who are trying to leave you behind. You mean they've got away? Oh, that's wonderful. Don't be too sure. I congratulate you on your enterprise... But you cannot match yourself against me, not even when you have the assistance of one of my own staff. But you have overlooked two points. Oh, what is that? First, I can stop your friends at any moment I choose. Huh? How? I will explain in a moment. The second point is that Littman did have the wit to turn down the power of the main transmitter. So you will not have been heard at CSP headquarters. It was a good effort, Captain Britain, but not quite good enough. Monitoring station at Alice Springs should be coming through to us any moment now, Colonel. Of course. What exactly was it they said to you? Well, it was a junior engineer who came on the phone. All he said was he'd been playing around with a radio lash-up he'd built himself, and suddenly he picked up some RT. The signal was very weak, but when he heard CSP mentioned, he straightway flicked on the switch of his tape recorder. That was at uh, 1705. Smart boy. You've arranged to have the tape played down to us over the radio telephone link. That's right. Uh, it only runs for a few seconds. There's probably nothing in it, but I thought we'd play sack. Of course. It's a tragedy that we should have lost touch with the moon probe, just when it seemed to be more or less in the clear. Yes. Uh, I've checked up on the atmospheric conditions, sir, and the funny thing is that there's no evidence of any unusual sunspot activity and nothing really to account for the loss of reception. So my theory becomes more and more logical. I think it does. Yes. If there is an intelligent agent working against us... Seems reasonable that he should screen his activities behind this interference. Hello, CSP control here. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, I'll switch it on. Alice Springs, sir, they're playing the tape over to us on channel seven. Oh, good. 
Hello, monitor. Yeah, we're getting you okay. You can start the tape whenever you like. Okay. So long. Turn on the recorder and we'll take it down ourselves. You never know, it might be interesting. Right, sir. Here we go. Wrong with the CSB ships. A hostile unit. Take over Orbiter X as a preliminary. Do you recognize the voice, Brown? I wouldn't like to say, but it could have been Captain Britain. That's exactly what I thought. Ah, it looks as if that's all we're going to get, sir. Ask if they got any direction on the signal. Right. Hello, Alice Springs. Is that the lot? I see. Tell me, did your bloke get any DF on that? No? Or did he hear anything else before he started recording? Just the words calling CSP. I see. Okay, then. Thank you. It couldn't have been Bob. Must have been some radio ham talking about the project. I wonder. What was the position of Bob's derelict ship when that signal was picked up? Oh, I can soon tell you that, sir. Here's the orbit chart here and the timings. Well, look here. This is Orbiter 2's course. Yes, and at 1705, it would have been passing over us. That's right. It was more or less between us and the moon. But you don't think the signal came from Orbiter 2, do you? No, there can't be anybody left alive in the ship. Strange things do happen. Listen, I want to speak to the engineer who monitored that signal. I want to know everything about it. But everything. Right, sir. And I shall play the tape over to the minister. If Bob is still alive, I shall do everything in my power to help him. Even if I have to take off a ship myself, with or without permission. You seem to have got the hang of the controls, up to. Yes, they're dead simple. The main thing is to keep the hover car just the right distance above the ground. Four or five feet seems to be about the best. I wish I knew just how the lifting jets work. Well, they work on ionic drive. That's all we need to know, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, until you left a bit. Keep on the signals. What's the probe doing now? Uh, retro jets are firing. Uh, There's no reason why it shouldn't make a safe landing. Do you think we were right to leave Bob behind? Yes, laddie. He was quite right. You know, when he left us, I think he knew he wouldn't be able to join us again. I oh, don't be too depressed. And Bob's a tough customer. He knows how to look after himself. Yes, but now it's him against the rest. I wonder what's happening back there in MHQ. Uh, it's certainly strange we haven't heard from any of them. I'll turn up the radio again. What's that? I've got it. Listen. This is MXQ Collie Hovercar. Are you receiving me? What do we do about it, Mick? I'm going to answer. They must know what's happened. They should hear me now if I press the transmission key. Hello, MXQ. We are now receiving you. Captain McClellan, you will return to base immediately. You do nothing of the sort, Mick. Bob, hello, Bob. Are you all right? I'm fine. Hello. Hello. McClellan, your position is hopeless. We know your intentions, and you cannot get away. If you attempt to take off with the projectile, we shall launch missiles against you. If you are down to base now, we promise you there will be no reprisals. We shall carry on. Do you agree, Hickey? Yes, we'll take our chance. All right. You can ease up a bit, right? Look, where's the projectile? It's coming down straight ahead of us. Look, you can see it through the windows now. Yeah, just like a falling star. It's making a perfect landing. It's touching down on hard ground. You can tell that because there isn't much dust being stirred up. How far away would you say it is? Mm, two or three miles. All oh, right, then I'd better slow down a bit more. Oh, you're, you're still clocking around the 60 miles. Yeah, it's okay. I know how to brake with the jets. Oh, I hope you do. It's... Is that the hatch beginning to move? Yes, it's opening out like a miniature drawbridge. All ready for the tractor to run down. Everything working beautifully, eh? Yeah. The tractor's coming out now. There it is. <laughs> it's difficult to believe it's all automatic, oh, isn't it? Wonderful piece of machinery. 
You can actually see the cameras panning around on top of the tractor. Yes. You know, and the one in the middle uses microfilm. Uh -huh. It's supposed to go on working for 12 hours until the tractor goes back into the ship and the whole bag of tricks takes off and returns to the air. Yeah, but we'll be going instead of the tractor. We hope. Well, I'm going to start breaking, Mac. Okay. Draw up as close to the projectile as you can, but for heaven's sake, don't ram it. After we've stopped, I'll turn on the intercom again, and we'll try and have a quick work with Bob. Well, Captain Britton, I'm giving you your last chance to order your men back. Their lives are in your hands. The decision is yours. I'll let you have it in due course. If you wait too long, we shall launch the first missile. Neeson, is the interference transmitter working correctly? Yes, all is well. Good. It'll be safe, then, to call up McClellan and Hicks. I wish to speak to them. Right. Hello? This is MHQ calling Hovercar. MHQ calling. Are you receiving? Yes, we are receiving you. I'll take over. Captain McClellan, you've been warned that you are in serious danger. I'm holding my fire only because I wish to avoid unnecessary waste of life and valuable materials. Nevertheless, if you continue to ignore my warning, I shall be compelled to take action. You understand? Yes, we understand. I have told Captain Britton that the final decision rests with him. He seems reluctant to talk, but I shall now tell him to give you your official instructions. Pass to you, Britain. All right. Hello, Mac. Hello, Hickey. Hello, Bob. Bob, what's been going on? I'm afraid I haven't made much success of things at this end, but you've done your job wonderfully well. Congratulations. I see on the scanner here that you've stopped the harbor car alongside the projectile. And it only remains for you to put oxygen aboard and take off. That's the idea. But I know these people mean business. They'll certainly launch missiles against you. Yes, we will take that risk, Bob. They will probably fire just after you take off. You'll be a difficult target, and if the first missile doesn't stop you, you may get away. Now, it's up to me to tell you whether or not to go ahead. You don't have to say any more, Bob. Leave it at that. Okay, Mac. Good luck to you both. This unity organization has got to be broken. Don't you know what to do? Right enough! God! Keep Captain Britton well away from the instrument panels. Watch that he doesn't try any tricks. And Neeson, you will line up the first missile. Very good. But do not fire until I give you the word. <laughs> Two full oxygen cylinders in the back of the hover car, Mac. I reckon we'd better take both of them. Yes, we should be able to lift them all right. <clears throat> if they don't weigh much in moon gravity. Oh, you're right. right. Well, we'll take one each and get straight aboard the probe. <sighs> Up the ramp, laddie. <laughs> That's your stuff. In you go. We shall have to use our torches inside because there are no luxuries like lighting. Dump the cylinders down in the clamps that hold the tractor. Okay. Well, what do you think of your new home? It reminds me of the engine room in my last ship. Except this is vertical, that was usually horizontal. Ah, you'll find this is safer than those atomic subs of yours, Chief. Safer, eh? I suppose it might be all right if Kramer wasn't lining up his missiles for the Big Bang. Uh, better not think about that. Oh, well, I'm not worried. Not much, anyway. I bet he misses. Sure he will. Now, look, there aren't any seats in this machine, but I've got a couple of rubber mattresses here from the hover car. They'll help us on takeoff. Right, fine. And we can strap ourselves down to those rings in the deck. Sure. There's no way we could control the jets at the moment, I suppose. No, I'm afraid not. After takeoff, the automatic pilot will lock onto woman. And 300 miles above the earth, it should turn the ship into orbit. We should start losing altitude until we reach about 200 miles. Uh, that's when a tender will come out to collect the films and instruments. Whoever comes aboard is going to have a terrible shock. 
And if he's got us instead of the tractors and his <laughs> instruments. <laughs> and now, shall we get ready for the big moment? Yes, okay. And to close the hatch, I have to do is to trigger off the compressors and move this lever. Here. Which I suppose it's normally operated by the tractor as it comes back. Yeah, go on. Yes, the hatch is closing. And better strap ourselves down. All right. Ah, the compressors are working. So it won't be long now. Are you all right? Yes. What did you say the thrust would be for the takeoff? Uh, about five or six G, I think. Not too bad. Oh, uh, we can take that all right. Catch fire. And talk to the CSP designers now. If they've done their job, we should stop lifting. Yes, here we go. Get away! Yes, all right, by the feel of it. Here's a, it's a perfect takeoff. This is where we start counting the seconds. Yes, I expect the unit is uh, watching us on our screens. If we can survive the next minute or so. Uh, we might be all set for home. Yes, home. And just a few seconds can make all the difference. I feel I want to start counting. <laughs> oh, well, we didn't have to wait long for missile number one. No, it's oh, I'm nearly on target. Jets sound okay still, don't they, Mick? Yes, they do. Uh, Mick, what's the matter? I just... Suddenly I had a nasty thought. If I'm right, we're in real trouble. What is it, Mac? That explosion may have shifted us off course. Yes, you're right. But we can't check the course anyway, not without instruments. No. But if there's been any terrific change, we might see it if we look down at the surface of the moon. Now, that means opening the hatch. Okay, open it up. Here we go. Just unfastening my straps. What can you see? I don't, don't tell me we've turned into orbit. Mac, what's happening? I'm afraid you're in for a shock, Hickey, old son. We haven't turned into orbit. It's worse than that. You mean we're not heading for Earth? No. Well, where are we heading for? As far as I can judge, we're heading straight out towards infinite. Eh? Hey? What do you mean? Well, come and see for yourself. Oh, don't worry, I'm coming. Do you recognize the surface of the moon underneath us? No, it looks different. It is. We're looking down at the side that's always turned away from the Earth. Ah, so that's it. Yeah. We don't need instruments to tell us we're traveling the opposite way from home. Hello? The port jets are cutting. That means we've passed escape velocity. So in a couple of seconds... We'll be in free flight. Yes. A flight that can last for eternity, eh? Shut up in a chunk of flying metal with no instruments, no controls, no pressurized cabin, and no means of getting out of these spacesuits ever again. Yeah. We've got to face up to the situation. It's pretty grim. How long do you think we can hold out? Uh, the oxygen cylinders that keep us going for it. Three or four days. Well, we'll have nothing to worry about after that. No, we'll just be part of a very small planet, I suppose. I'm sorry you had to be in on this, Hickey. Why? Well, what do you mean? You've got a wife and a couple of kids. I've got no responsibilities. I reckon I've behaved as if I hadn't either, Mac. I wouldn't say that. Well, if I'd stayed in the Navy, I might have had a nice little shore job by now. Not too bad with the chief petty officer's pay and allowances these days, but now I went and transferred to this lock. Why? Um, why did you do it? Same reason you and Bob transferred from the Air Force, I suppose. It's a sort of a challenge. I was always a sucker for anything like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Look at me. I'm talking as if we'd got one foot in the grave already. Oh, we'd better snap out of it. I reckon I'll have a look at the engines. Can't do any harm, and you never know. I might hit on something useful. Good idea. I'll join you. Give us something to do. I don't suppose we'll be having any more interruptions, eh? No, I should think that man Kramer and his stooge, what's his name? Neeson. 
They'll have written us off by now. I expect they're enjoying themselves, watching us on the scanner down there in their moon headquarters. Yeah, I know anything about those blighters. They'll make sure that Bob's watching, too. The poor chap must be having a pretty bad time. Yes, I bet he is. He's on his own now. One man against unity. You're looking upset, Captain Britton. Does that surprise you? Yes. I expected you to show better self-control. Remember, you have only yourself to blame for the present situation. Hello? This is ship Unity 5 calling MHQ. Unity 5 bound from Earth to Moon headquarters. Are you receiving me? That's Gilbin. You speak to him, Neeson. Of course. Hello, Unity 5. This is MHQ answering you. The damaged projectile is now visible on my screen. Bearing QZ-54 TK-7. Range 15,000. Its engines are stopped and its line of flight is steady. Good. Neeson, tell him to maintain his present course. I shall expect him to land here at 2159. Very good. Hello. MHQ to Unity 5. Yes, I am listening. You will hold to your course and touch down at 2159. There will be no deviation. Message understood. That is all. No, hold on. That ship could be diverted. It could intercept the projectile. For what purpose? Explain yourself. You know perfectly well what I'm driving at. No. In the matter of mind reading, you have the advantage, Britain. All right. Unity 5 could change course now, and by increasing its speed, it could meet the projectile at a point which, well, it can be worked out right away on the computer. But the projectile has ceased to be important. What sort of man are you? McClellan and Hicks must be taken off before it's too late. Gelbin is in a position to do that. This is the only chance we shall have. We? Are you now associating yourself with unity? For the purpose of the rescue, yes, I am. That is not enough. You mean you do nothing to help those men out there? Really, Captain Britton, you are too naive. What possible reason could I have for bringing back people who threaten the security of my organization? Where is the advantage to me? There is none. All right. What's your price? For the survival of your friends? Yes. So you wish to bargain? Yes, Kramer, I know what you want. I'll give you all the information you need to assemble Orbiter X. If you will bring McClellan and Hicks back here alive and well. I welcome your new approach. But I should need more than mere information. What do you mean? I should require your active assistance in the assembly work. I should also require your solemn pledge to carry it out to the best of your ability. I give you my word on that. Are you quite sure? Yes. Very well. Neeson, turn the trackers onto the projectile. Yes, Dr. Kramer. There you see its course up to date. And the predicted course. Yes. Interception is still possible. Call Unity 5. Right, Dr. Kramer. Tell Gilvin to stand by for instructions. I shall work out his navigation details myself. Lieutenant Kent? Uh, yes? Uh, Sir Charles Day, the Minister of Astronautics. Is here, oh, Sir Charles. Do come in. Oh, thank you. Well, Kent, I flew up from Canberra as soon as I could after I got your telephone call. That's very good of you. Let's do sit down. Uh, can I get you something to drink, uh, Scott? Oh, thank you. Good. Thanks. Thanks. I'm most interested to hear the recording of the radio signal you were telling me about. Ah, yes. Well, I've got it here on tape. But before you listen to it, I'd like you to look at this picture. It's just been radioed through from our Canadian observatory at Fort Churchill. Another photograph of the moon? Yes. As you see, it shows the third quadrant in fair detail. You'll recognize the Wagenton area. Yes, of course. That's where our projectile should have landed. Quite so. And it's the area where the UFO was spotted sometime previously. Exactly. Now, naturally, we can't expect to see any strange objects on a telescope picture like this. No. But our Canadian colleagues sent it straight through to Woomera because they thought they would be interested 
In a spot of light which you can see, uh, just off the moon's rim above Argenti. Yes. What is it? Well, it must be an explosion. Explosion? Fantastic as it sounds, I believe that the projectile has been deliberately destroyed by some intelligent agent. Mm. Remember, it was bringing us back film. And whoever this agent is, he had to make sure that it never reached us. Yes. Now, we shall have to go into this very carefully. I think we should. And uh, and now, shall I play the recording I mentioned to you? Ah, yes, this... This extraordinary message that was picked up at Alice Spring. Yes, well, it's very short. Uh, here it is. Wrong with the CSB ships. A hostile unity. Take over Orbiter X as a preliminary. Is that all? Yes. Do you recognize the voice? Well, it was very distorted, but it seemed to me that it could have been Captain Britain speaking. Well, of course, now and now you're opening up a completely new line of thought. As far as we know, Britain and his crew died in their ship, Orbiter 2, which is still circling around the Earth. Yes, I realize it sounds fantastic, but it's significant that at the moment when this message was transmitted, Orbiter 2 was traveling directly over us. I've marked its position here on the astral chart. I see. I agree that the message doesn't make much sense as it stands. But I've tried filling in the blanks by putting in the sort of words that would fit the context. May I read you the result? Do, by all means. Right. I think the message could read, There is nothing wrong with the CSP ship. Mm-hmm. A hostile power called Unity is planning to take over Orbiter X as preliminary uh, to, uh, well, attack on the Commonwealth. Mm. Invasion. It's impossible to say. I take it you've spoken to the communications department about this message? Yes, well, they say that technically it's quite possible that it did come from Britain's ship. Well, while we're in the realm of possibilities, we might as well go the whole hog. Looking at this chart, I notice that at the time when our mysterious message was transmitted... The Earth, the ship, and the moon were in a straight line with one another. Yes. You suggest that the message was transmitted from the ship. But surely, from the technical point of view, it might equally well have been transmitted from the moon. Oh. And that, my dear Kent, might have some bearing on the explosion picture and the fate of the projectile. <laughs> No doubt about it, Mac. Everything comes back to the automatic pilot inside this pressurized box. This is the joker that controls everything. Jets, stabilizers, inverters, the lot. The trouble is, if we break the seals and try to fiddle with it, we wreck the thing anyway. Yes. Can only work under pressure. We must think of something else. Mac. What's wrong? I'm okay with you. No, you're not. Oh, don't worry about me. There's nothing you can do. What do you mean? What's happened to you? It's my breathing apparatus. I'll be all right if I stop moving. Hello. Right. Hold on. I'll, I'll give you a new oxygen cylinder. Oh, the one I've got's okay. I checked it a few minutes ago. Well, then, for Pete's sake, what's the trouble? I think I'm rebreathing too much here. Carbon dioxide. Must be something wrong with the extract. Can't do anything about it while we're in vacuum. It means opening the suit. Oh, take it easy, Mac. Oh, it feels so dopey. I'm trying to keep awake. There's a noise in my ears. It's coming through the intercom. I can hear it too. And I'm not imagining it. No. It sounds almost like a carrier wave. Listen. Can you hear a voice? Yes, I can. What does it mean? It must be a freak reception from the Earth. Or it could be from the unity transmitter on the moon. Yeah, I wonder. Hello, FHQ. Listen. This is Unity 5 calling FHQ. 
Uh, am I dreaming? No, you're not. Now keep still. I'm going to open the hatch. Mac. You must come over here and look. Why? Oh, I'll give you a hand. Just tell me I'm not imagining things now. I know the sort of crazy ideas you can get in space, but we can't both have the same illusion. Can you see a ship out there? Oh, it's wonderful. Yes, I can. And it coming alongside. Hello, MHQ. I can now see them. They have opened the hatch and I am closing in. It's Kelby. Hello, Captain McLaren. Can you hear me? Yes. We're listening. Have you got jet pistols to guide yourselves across to my ship? No. We haven't. In that case, I will come immediately alongside you. I don't get it. Why is he doing this? First they try to blow us to bits. Now they're risking a collision to pick us up. Look out. Here he comes. The outer hatch of my airlock is open. When it is level with you, jump aboard quickly. You understand? Yes. We understand. I reckon this is a case of Hobson's choice, Nicky. I hope I can make it. Yes. You'll make it all right. Now then, are you all set? All set. That's all right. I've got you. It shouldn't be difficult. There's only about ten feet between the hulls. Can't go wrong. And we can't fall. Right. Now, push off and over we go. Are you okay? Yes, just a Good. You'll soon be breathing clear air again. Right now. Into the lock. That's the stuff. Now I'm closing the outer hatch. You hear that, Mac? The air's coming in. Oh, good. Oh, I don't know what's behind all this or... Whether we shall land back on the Earth or the Moon. But the one thing that matters at the moment is we've got another lease of life. Hello, MHQ. Unity 5 calling MHQ... Hello, Unity 5. MHQ answering you. Mission completed. I have McClellan and Hicks on board and am approaching base. Good. Your course and rate of descent are correct. You will touch down on number one landing platform. Message understood. We are standing by. Listen, have you made the preparations for immediate refueling? Yes, Dr. Kramer. The ground staff have been told. Well, Captain Britton... We've kept our side of the bargain. Yes, and I shall keep mine. Now that you have observed our efficiency at first hand, I hope that you will cooperate with good spirit. You certainly are efficient, Kramer. Of course. Every member of Unity is a specialist in his own particular field. And as you know, all over the world we have experts sending us up-to-the-minute information of scientific developments. Our technical progress is therefore not surprising. But now I imagine that you will wish to satisfy yourself that McClellan and Hicks are safe and well. Yes, I'd like to see them. So you shall, after the refueling is complete. In the meantime, you should check your spacesuit. We're going outside? Yes, we are going aboard Unity 5 as soon as it lands. Oh, why? The Commonwealth Space Project has spent a great deal of time and money training you for a specific job. We shall now see how effectively you can put your training into practice. You mean we're to start assembling the space station right away? That is exactly what I mean. As soon as Gelbin's ship is refueled and ready for flight, we shall take off for Orbiter X. In other words, the people at Woomera are now going to have their work done for them. But perhaps not in a way that they will appreciate. <laughs> Yes, 
I thought you'd be surprised to hear me talking about radio signals from the moon, Colonel Kent. But after all, we are living in an age when almost anything's possible. My dear Sir Charles, I couldn't agree with you more. The point is that as Minister of Astronautics, I've got to go very carefully. I'm always prepared to supply the Commonwealth governments with intelligent theories based on expert opinion. But we're not going to get any material backing until we produce hard and fast facts. I quite understand. Well, what have we got? The components of the space station were launched into orbit without undue difficulty. We didn't really run into trouble until Captain Bradley took off in his ship Orbiter 1, but we lost all contact with him. And it was the same story when Captain Britain tried to go to his relief in Orbiter 2. Quite. Uh, but he did succeed in getting one WT message through, warning us that there is a basic fault in the design of our ship. If you accept my construction of the latest message, you'll have to discard the first one as a trick. It may not have been sent by Britain at all. Perhaps not, but I'm trying to concentrate on the facts. Now, what have we got next? We had a reliable report that a UFO was sighted over the Wajentian area of the moon. Yes. And as a result, I agreed to the launching of the projectile. Again, we lost track of it because of interference, which blotted it out just before it landed in Wajentia. And now we have the pictures of an explosion over that very same area. There's no doubt something is going on up there. Yes, but unfortunately, we haven't got the means of landing a man on the moon and proving it. No, but give me permission to take off and examine Orbiter 2, and I might find the solution to some of our problems. Yeah. Our electronics people are working on the interference transmissions, aren't they? Yes. And at the same time, one group is developing a deflector system which could screen our own ships. How long will it be before they can start testing on the ground? Well, they say it might be any time now. And, of course, this is terribly important. If the hostile force really is working against us, those deflectors would help to change the entire situation. In fact, I'll make your promise. Yes? They shall be fitted to a ship the moment they're ready for a test. You can travel aboard that ship and try them out in space. And... If by any chance you should happen to find yourself alongside Orbiter 2, what is it, 1,200 miles above the surface of the Earth? Yes. Well, uh, do I have to say any more? <laughs> no. Thank you very much indeed. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have rather urgent business to hurry along in the electronics department. <laughs> We're approaching the space station components now. And I have pledged myself to work on them until the job's done. I'm more than grateful, Barbara. Yes, me too. But what a price to pay for saving our skins. Oh, there's more to it than that. But don't worry. Just do as I say. Captain Griffin. Hello? We are about to turn into orbit. Will you please give your attention to the scanning screen? All right, I'm coming over, Gelvin. What's your altitude? We are 1,050 miles above the surface of the Earth. As you see, we are now passing over the northern ice cap. According to my calculations, the Orbiter X component should be visible on the screen. Yes, there. Look, they're coming up now. Ah. Now, I will start matching our speed to their orbital velocity. Get into your seats and pass your belt. Before we come alongside, we shall require some preliminary information from you, Britain. Very well. I'm opening the retrojet. Stand by. You can start talking, Britain. Well, you're, you're now looking at the cluster of rockets which contain the components of the space station. Mm -hmm. As you see, each rocket has a large identity number painted on the hull. Yes. We should position ourselves as near as possible to number one. What is the importance of number one, Britain? Well, that's where the officer in charge of the assembly will make his headquarters. It contains the workshops and a large-scale plan of the complete station. We will start, then, by looking at the plan. And you can put us completely in the picture. One more burst, and we shall be alongside. <laughs> there. Good. Open the inner hatch of the airlock. No. 
Now, you will cross over to the Rocket Britain and bring the plan back to us here. Very well. Mac, Kiki, you better come with me. You can start setting up the workshop here. Okay. I am glad to see that you are now all willing to cooperate. I'll take my orders from Captain Britain. Of course. Britain. Have any special provisions been made for radio communication between the workshop and the assembly crews when they start working on the other rockets? I well, know. We decided to rely on normal helmets intercom. Setting up the radio proper will be a major job. It can't be tackled until the station has been fitted together. Then how did you propose to keep in touch with TSP Woomera during the assembly period? Oh, by the transport ship's radio. We assumed that there'd always be plenty of our ships around. I see. And Mac, is your breathing apparatus okay now? Yes, quite okay. Right. Close helmets. We'll get into the airlock. I'll be back shortly, Kramer. With the plan. Yes. Come on, here we go, chaps. Close the hatch on them, Gilbin. Well, we seem to have tamed them at last. Yes. There's no doubt that Britain will keep his word. And, of course, the others will carry out his instructions. Exactly. They will save us a great deal of time and effort on the construction work. And when it is completed, we shall be in a position to launch our attack. Good. And I think our first target will be Womera, just in case they should consider further launchings. Does it not seem to you that TSP have been suspiciously inactive? Strangled by what they call red tape. This is Earth headquarters calling Unity 5. EHQ to Unity 5. Come in, please, urgent. Uh, I will take it. Hello, EHQ. Unity 5, answering you. Dr. Kramer, I regret I have had you. Very serious trouble at the interference transmitter. What has happened? Fire broke out in the main generating room, and it has spread to the transmitter hall. The fire squad are trying to get it under control, but screening transmissions may be cut at any moment. Impossible. How did it start? There must have been a fault in the power cables. The engineers are working on the emergency transmitter, but you are in danger of being picked up on the CSB tracking screen. You must return to Earth headquarters with all speed. I shall be back immediately. And tell the chief engineer I hold him responsible. He will answer to me personally. There can be no excuses. None at all. A situation like this could be disastrous. Yes, of course. And now we have to rely entirely on the ship's deflectors to screen us. I will recall Britain and his team right away. You will do nothing of the sort. He can do us no harm. But how long can they survive in space? We must think of our security. There is no time to lose. Start the compressors and open the jets. Britain and his friends must take a chance. Okay, Bob. What's Kramer playing at? I don't know. He must have had a heck of a shock to suddenly pull out like that. Maybe the CSP ships have been armed and they're coming up. Talk about it after we're safely inside this thing. Pretend on your boot, Megan. Yeah. It's mine, Bob. All right. But don't rely on them. Remember, we've no jet pistols to guide us back if we go adrift. Just follow the rail. Along the hatch of the airlock. Okay, I can see it. Good, open it up. Should be normal pressure inside the house. Just about everything we need. Keep us going. That's fine. Here we go. That's my idea of sweet music. Yeah. Pressure gauge is rising. I have an idea that if Carmen doesn't come back too soon, we might think up a little surprise for We him. might at that. Okay. Pressure's normal. Open the inner hatch. Let's get these helmets off. Oh, 
Oh, it's a relief. Uh, the atmosphere's not too bad. Oh, no. We'd better get the air plant working right away. Yeah, and we need some light, too. Okay. Just stay where you are. I know where the generator switch is. Good man. Now, oh, that's the stuff. Now we can see what we're doing. Yes. You can start the air plant. All right, Bob. Well, everything seems to be working. Shall I open the covers of the observation ports, Bob? Yes, we shall have to keep a watch out for Kramer. He'll be back sooner or later. Uh, no sign of the blighters yet. And there aren't any of our ships around either. Uh, I didn't think there would be. Uh, beats me why Kram and his stooge Galvin should buzz off and leave us like this. Well, they know we can't get in touch with Woomer. And they also know that these rockets weren't built to make the return tip to Earth. Yes, but why do they suddenly shear off like that? Well, they obviously had a sudden panic on their hands. Maybe their ship developed a fault. Could be trouble at their Earth headquarters or their moon base. Yeah. Whatever it was, they've left us to it. The moment Orbiter X was completed, it was up to us to see if they couldn't use it. But now, if they'll give us a little time, we might find a better way out. Anyway, try and relax for a couple of minutes. Let's see what our position is. I'll do a bit of thinking out loud, mm, eh? Good idea. Right. We're more or less in the center of a cluster of 40 rockets which contain all the components of Orbiter X. Fortunately, we happen to have landed on the only one which can supply us with the essentials of life. Uh-huh. And there's a good food store up for it. We've got oxygen, light, temperature control, and, of course, the workshop machinery. Yeah, bag the machinery, but what are we going to use it for? Well, we can assemble one of the space chariots to start it. All the parts are packed away in the stores, and it's fairly simple to take them out through the airlock and put them together. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bob. I only saw the chariot on the drawing board. What's it really like? Well, it's pretty good. It's so simple. It's just a skeleton framework, rather like an old-fashioned car chassis. It's got two small thrust jets on one end, where you go, and a couple of retros on the front to stop it. Yeah, and it, it was designed as a means of transport between the components of the space station. I see. You ride it, Hickey, rather like the Roman gladiators used to ride their chariots. Hence the name. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'd be much good at that sort of caper. In any case, where would it get us? I think I've got the answer. Yes? And it might work. Oh, come on, what is it? Bradley's old ship, Orbiter 1, and our ship, Orbiter 2, are still circling the Earth at more or less the same altitude we're at now. Yeah, but they're a couple of derelict wrecks. You think so? Oh, of course. On Orbiter 2, the jet outlets are smashed, the starboard compressors had it, the cabin pressures down to zero, yes, and... Yes, yes, I know all that, but look around you here. We've got all the facilities for carrying out repairs in space. And if you look in the store... You'll find all the replacements we need to get our ship working again. Yes, you're right, Bob. Spare jets, compressors, tools, we've got the lot. And we can load them onto a chariot, fry them over to orbit it, too. Yeah, that's a great idea, Bob. It may take a week to see the repairs through. But if we can get away from here before Kramer comes back, I never dream of looking for us aboard the old ship. No, he'll probably assume that we were either swept away by his jets when he pulled out, or he'll think we just drifted away in our space suits. Yes, which could easily have happened. Yes, the problem is navigation. We're traveling in orbit over the poles, and Orbiter 2's course is inclined at an angle of about 45 degrees to the equator, as far as I can remember. Uh, 47.5, actually. Oh, you know that, do you? Yes, I remember what our course and velocity were when we bailed out. Oh, good for you, Mac. Well, I was in charge of the navigation. Oh, <laughs> and if you give me a little time, I can calculate just when she'll be at our nearest point to which is when we should pick her up with a chariot. Exactly. It's marvelous. If you'll start working on that, Nicky and I will sort out the spare parts and begin putting the chariot together. Okay, but all this is going to take some time. Grandma might just be back before it's finished. That, my boy, is a chance we've got to take. <laughs> Well, Gelbin, what news? Almost our entire headquarters staff are working in the interference transmitter, Dr. Kramer. But it will have to be virtually rebuilt, I'm afraid. I knew that hours ago when I made my first inspection. What I want to know now is how long will it take? Several days. And I don't like leaving Britain and his team on Orbit X. They can do no harm. Uh, perhaps not. But we have an emergency interference transmitter ready for service. 
It can work for short periods, and it would screen us from the ground monitors if we did decide to fly out and collect for it. But why? He has no radio and no transport. No, that's true enough. Yes, I think our main concern is Woomerah. We know the ships are grounded, but what is happening there? We have no information at all. What we need is an agent of Woomerah. Yes, but who? Hmm. What about this pilot, Captain Bradley? I understand he's changed quite a lot during the past weeks. Oh, yes. Our new methods of indoctrination work quickly. Bradley is quite ready to work for us now. But uh, CSP believe he's dead and still aboard his derelict ship over the one. Obviously, it will be out of the question for him to reappear suddenly in Woomera. I wonder. I like to see him. Yes. Have him brought here. Right. Have Captain Bradley sent to Dr. Kramer's office at once, will you? Yes, very good, sir. I will see you. Before he comes in, tell me something about him, Gilvin. Tell me about his mental condition. Well, as a result of our treatment, he's lost interest in all his old associations, including his wife and family in London. Good. He is now opposed to the Commonwealth Space Project, and politically he despises both democracy and military dictatorship. <laughs> In fact, if you ask him about these things, he will repeat our own party line. He's dedicated to unity. How does he look? Well, as you'd expect. It's obvious he's been through a period of stress, shall we say. You remember his leg was broken, so he still walks with a limp. And he's lost quite a bit of weight. Does he need any drugs? No, not now. His convictions have been stabilized. So he might make a good agent. I'm sure he would. If he could be planted without arousing suspicion. Of course. What have you got in mind, Kramer? I'll tell you later. First, I want to examine Bradley myself. I shall keep the interview very short, just one or two questions, and, of course, part of the test will be to offer him his freedom. Not that he'll get it, but if he declines the offer, we shall know that he's probably reliable. Yes, I'm certain he is, but you'll see. Ah, that'll be him. Come in. Oh, uh, come in, Captain Bradley. You remember me? Yes, you are Dr. Crumb. Of course you do. Uh, Gelvin, give him a chair, and perhaps uh, he would like a little refreshment. But of course. Let me see. You had a small fracture in that right leg of yours, didn't you? I hope it's not troubling you too much. As you see, Dr. Crumb, we've been able to take the plaster off for him. I think our medical people have done quite a good job there. Good. I'm glad to hear it. How are you feeling in your general health, Bradley? I'm feeling very well, thank you. Excellent. Here, take this. I expect you'd like to drink to our new understanding. Yes, I should. To our new understanding. <laughs> We've had some difficult times together. But now that is all behind us, hmm? Yes, you have been very patient. I hear that Gelvin has talked a lot of politics to you. I hope he hasn't killed your interest in the subject. No, far from it. It's very important. It is indeed. You have lived in the British Commonwealth, so naturally we've been interested in your views on that form of government. I believe you've developed some strong views. I see things more clearly now. That's most interesting. You now see faults which didn't strike you before. Yes, I do. Well, we all have to learn. What do you think is fundamentally wrong with democracy? To me, the basic fault is that there is no effort to associate scientific qualifications with political power. So we have governments which are dangerous and quite unsuited to lead their countries in a world of scientific progress. I think you're quite right. But does this mean that you've swung over to the military state? No, I believe that arises when the scientist's rightful place of leadership is taken by mere men of action. You know, Gelbin, that's perfectly true. Yes, how very interesting. Now, if you take those views out into the world, Captain Bradley, you might do a great deal of good. What do you mean, Dr. Kramer? I mean, you are perfectly free to leave here whenever you like. We are not monsters. You can go to any country of your choice. If you choose to keep in touch with us, 
You're very welcome to. In fact, you might find it to your advantage. No, I'd... I'd prefer not to go away. Well, that's a very nice compliment to us. But what are your hopes for the future? I hope to see a world government created by unity and led by yourself, Dr. Kramer. And I want to help you if I can. So you are prepared to work for us? Yes. You said you would like to stay here at headquarters. But perhaps you could serve as this, as a unity agent. Would that interest you? Yes, I'm ready to do whatever you think best. We might send you to Woomera. What about that? Woomera? Yes, I'd even go there. Good. Now, don't worry. That's all for the moment, Bradley. Off you go and try and get some rest. Thank you. I'm most grateful. Oh, by the way... Yes, Dr. Carmen? I should have mentioned it before. I believe your wife and family are in London... How would you like to send a message to them? No, thank you. It's not important. Well, Kramer, are you satisfied? Yes, we can use him. Sure. But he, we won't let him know the location of his headquarters. He'll have to work through a contact. Now, you were saying that you know that his appearance transmitter is ready for service? Yes, we can operate it for, for a limited period. Good. We shall only need it to screen a very short flight. You see, Captain Bradley is going back to Womera. But where will you have him picked up? He's supposed to be... Exactly. Our CSP friends will pick him up in the most obvious place of all. How's this space chariot shaping up, Bob? If you look through the observation port, you can see for yourself. It's floating right alongside. Vicky's out there fixing the control panel onto the framework. Framework is right. Looks a bit flimsy, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> Good enough for short hops. Uh, that's what's worrying me. I've just worked out a course for orbit at two. Oh, why didn't you say so? Well, I'm afraid there's a snag. Oh, what's the trouble? Well, the nearest she'll ever come to us is 500 miles. Oh, and 500 miles on that piece of ironmonger is going to be a rather shaky do. Yeah. I don't even know what speed it's capable of. Neither do I. It was only built for pottering about, so nobody ever worried very much about that. In fact, the design is aimed at keeping the speed down as far as possible. Ah, uh, Icky's coming back through the airlock. Yes, I'll take him on a test run in a moment. But tell me, Mac, how long have we got before Orbiter 2 closes into the 500-mile mark? About eight and a half hours. Hmm. So that gives Kramer plenty of time to come back and step on us. Yeah. Well, how's our flight engineer? <clears throat> oh, dear, oh, dear. I'd like to meet the bright boys who designed that little lot out there. All right, Chief. Now, listen. I got a nice little surprise for you. Uh, okay, I'll buy it. We're going 500 miles on that chariot. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And we've got about eight hours to kill before we start. So that gives us nice time for a test run. Yes, well, uh, shall I stay here while you and Mac go? No. I want Mac to stay here and work out our speed by time and distance measurements. All right, Mac? Sure, Bob. Well, we'll just take a trip round the Orbiter X component, Hickey. See if we can remember what's inside the different rockets. Oh, so it's to be a revision test as well, is it? Oh, come on, Chief. Snap out of it. Cheer up. Let's get into the airlock. Okay. See you later, Mac. You hope. Thank you. Helmet intercom, okay, Hickey? Yes, okay. Got your anti-magnetic spanners with you? Oh, no, turn it up, Bob. You'll probably need them. Yes, I reckon I will, too. Uh, yes, I've got them. Uh, pressure zero. I'll open the outer hatch. Oh, no, we're just about over the tip of South America. Look at the reflection of the sun on the water down there. Yes, and look at the space chariot right here. All right, all right, Jump. Stim aboard. The boot maggots on? Yes, sir, on okay. Good. We better check the mountings for the jets before we start them up. Well, the thrust jets are okay aft. Yes. Retro seem to be okay up in the front. How about the seats on the middle section? Are they secure? <laughs> yes, I made sure of them. Right. Sit down, fasten your straps. All right, I'll start the compressors. 
That's a funny little joker, isn't it, eh? It certainly is. Well, it works, anyway. You all set? Yes, all set. Then I'll open them up slowly. What? We're moving. Riding through vacuum on an old car chassis. Oh, what a performance. Well, as a matter of fact, the performance seems to be extraordinarily good. Well, let's see how she turns when I open the starboard jet. As she goes, round to the left. Now I'll turn the other way. Uh, uh, not too bad at all, is it? Uh, now, before we get too far from the workshop, drug it, I'll try the red dress. Hold on! What do you think of that? Here's brakes for you. Yes. Do you mind if I take over, Bob? Yeah, I hope so. All right. Can you get it? All right, okay. All right. Steer for rocket number two. You can see it almost between us and the boat. Oh. Yes, I've got it. Oh, I must say, the hand was all right. You're changing your ideas a bit, eh? Can you remember what's aboard, rocket number two? Yes, now let me think middle section of the rocket itself will be part of the space station's central hub. And the station airlock is inside, already assembled. That's right. Yes. Now, uh, open the jets and we'll cross over to the far side of the cluster. Skim round the rockets over there. Right. Oh, oh, I say, the thrust doesn't rock push you back into your seat, doesn't it? It certainly does. Yeah. You'd better slow down or we'll be landing on the south pole. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you've got to be careful with this thing. It wouldn't be difficult to shoot right down into the atmosphere and burn up. You're right there. Make a turn round. We'll go back to the central workshops. Okay. The rest of the rockets are really expensive ones. They're carrying the power plant, communications equipment, the laboratory apparatus, and... Can I say, what's your target? We're closing in fast. Right. Starting the retro jets. Now, come up alongside the workshop's hatch. Okay, you're the pilot. There we are. Uh, how's that? Uh, well done. Well, what do you think of this space yeah, chariot well, now? I must say, I take it back everything I said. She may look like an ugly bit of hardware, but my gosh, she handles like a dream. She certainly does. And if Kramer will just keep away a bit longer, we'll be aboard Orbiter 2 and back at Boomerang within a week. That'll be a shock for him. Quite a shock for Colonel Kent, too, I think. Oh? Uh, yeah. Uh, come in. Sorry to disturb you at this time of night, Colonel Kemp. Oh, I, I was only dozing in the chair. Uh, what do you want? Could you step into the control room right away? It's very urgent, sir. What, what's happened? It's going to shake you, sir, and I'm not kidding. We're all wondering whether we can believe our ears in there. Oh, come on, man, out with it. We're in contact with Captain Bradley. Uh, well, what? Where is he? I know it sounds unbelievable, but he's talking to us from Orbiter One. Orbiter One? His own ship? But... This isn't a hoax, is it? No, I assure you, sir. Right, come along. When did you first make contact? Only a couple of minutes ago. We had about an hour of strong interference, and when it cleared, we heard him. We thought it must be somebody playing a crummy trick at first, but then the monitoring station started ringing up in a heck of a panic, and they all say it's Bradley's voice. Have you alerted the direction finders? Yes, the report should be coming in now. Any more news, Arthur? Yes, direction finder says signals are definitely coming from Orbiter 1. It's impossible. I know it doesn't, sir, but you can talk to Brad yourself. Take my chair. The mic's on. Oh, all right. Hello? This is PSP Woomera calling Orbiter 1. PSP calling. Come in, please. There, we know you. Hello? Orbiter 1, are you receiving me? Hello, this is CSP Control. Hello, CSP. Orbiter One, answering you. Yes, that's him. Brad, this is Kent here. Tell me, what's happened? Can't talk very much. Take your time. Is anyone with you? No, flight engineer. 
father was killed by an explosion in the engine room. Wilson went out to inspect the house, never came back. I've been living on oxygen from the fuel tank. Almost gone now. Can't hold out very much longer. Brad, after you first took off, you sent us a signal saying that your starboard jets were smashed. What happened? A collision? Don't know what's causing. A collision? What with? Uh, Round. Have a ship lined up on the launching platform for immediate takeoff and alert one of the pilots. Yes, sir. Uh, call Captain Knight. Tell him we're going out to Orbiter One. I'll be travelling with him. Okay, sir. Hello, Orbiter One. Brad, are you still listening? Yes, but reception intermittent. All right. I won't worry you with any more questions now. I'm coming out to pick you up. Don't risk your neck. There may be a fault in all our ships. Something wrong with the compressors. Listen, Brad. I'm not leaving you alone out there. Don't worry. I'll keep a check on the compressors. Just hold on a little longer and I'll be with you. You understand? Yes, I understand. Brown, put a call through to the Minister of Astronautics in Canberra. Tell him I know perfectly well that all ships are officially grounded, but this is an emergency, and I'm taking a calculated risk. Got that? Yes, sir. Has Captain Knight been called? Yes, he's going straight down to the launching platform. I'll join him right away. I'll explain the position and see how he feels about it. As far as I'm concerned, Bradley is my personal responsibility. I sent him out, and it's up to me to get him back. <laughs> Unity control. Yes. Right. Very good. Dr. Kramer. Yes, Kelvin. The tracking office is, is feeding vision signals straight through to our central monitor. We should see Kent ship soon after he takes off from Woomera. Good. Stand by with the predictor to check his course and turn up the sound monitor. Right. You know, I must say, from the time we left Bradley aboard Orbiter 1, he has carried out his instructions admirably. His warning about the imaginary faults in the CSP ships was really quite convincing. It was essential that it should be. It ensures that the remainder of the Commonwealth fleet remains grounded. At the same time, it covers us if we should have to take the offensive against Kent. Calling Orbiter One. This is another signal. CSP Woomera calling Orbiter One. Orbiter One answering you, CSP. Hello, Brad. Colonel Kent and Captain Knight have taken off safely in a relief ship. Ah, good. They're on their way. You haven't long to wait now, old boy. They'll soon be with you. Thank you, CSP. Hope they make it. Standing by. Yes, Bradley's doing very well. Ah, look. There's Kent ship coming up on the screen now. Good. Check his predicted course. All right. Now, let me see. The trajectory is... Ah, wait, there's a complication. Look. Yes, instead of climbing straight up, he's conserving power. And if he follows his present course... Exactly. It will take him dangerously close to Orbiter X, and his attention will be concentrated on the component rockets. And if Britain makes a visual signal, it could hardly be missed. If we can't risk the meeting, what shall we do? I hate altering my plans. But unless Kent changes his course, he will have to be stopped. Check his range and line up the missile. Right. I shall allow Colonel Kent to within 300 miles of the space station. If he approaches closer than that, Gelbin, I shall order you to fire. <laughs> What's our altitude, Chris? Just coming up to 700 miles, Colonel Kent. Good. How are you feeling, sir? Oh, not so hot. Take off rather not to six. I suppose I'm getting a little old for this sort of thing. Don't mind that. We've got a job to do. I'll check the navigation. Yeah. Yes. If we stick to our present course, we'll be passing very close to the space station components. That's right. They'll be more or less in our path. 
In fact, you can just make them out on the radar screen now. We're converging with them pretty fast. No sign of Bradley's ship yet? No, not yet. Hmm. And the small blip we see on number three scanner must be Orbiter 2. Yes, I think it must be. I'll check that with CSP. Hello, is this special mission calling CSP? SM calling Commonwealth Space Project Boomerang. Hello, SM. CSP answering you. Control, there's an object bearing from us. QY7GS04. Can you identify, please? The range is approximately 3,000 miles. Right. Track is checking for you now, sir. Thank you. Our Colonel Ted, I've just been given a report here from the Minister of Astronautics in Canberra. He says everything's okay. And he wishes you good luck and a successful mission. And he's standing by for more information as it comes in. Good. Give him my compliments and... Tell him I'll keep in touch through you. Okay. I've got that answer to your query now, sir. That object you are asking about is Orbiter 2. Yes. We thought it must be. I'll give you the distance check. It is 2,800 miles away from you now. Thank you, CSP. That's all. Huh. Yes, I wonder. I know what you're thinking, sir. Oh, do you? Yes. If Jack Bradley has managed to hold out aboard Orbiter 1, isn't it just possible that Britain or some of his crew might still be alive in Orbiter 2? Exactly. But the last time we heard from Bob, he had oxygen for about an hour. Well, Brad's found a method of tapping the oxygen in the fuel tanks. The others could have done the same. If they have, why haven't they called us? We can only find the answer to that by changing course and boarding them. Yes. Well, that would mean opening the jets and using the compressors at top boost. Yes. Remember, Bradley warned us they might be faulty. And that's the very reason why we're holding to our present course in a steady rate of ascent. Yes, I know, but the compressors were all right on the takeoff and acceleration. We've got a perfect opportunity to go aboard Orbiter 2. And I don't think I'd ever have any peace of mind if we don't take it. Neither would I. We'll tell CSP we're going to change course. Good. Hello. SM calling CSP. Come in, please. Answering we are about to change course in order to converge with Orbiter 2. We shall then rendezvous with Orbiter 1 as arranged. There will be very little change in the time schedule at all. Thank you, SM. Message understood. Well, we're committed now, Chris. Start the compressors. Yes, sir. The instrument readings are all quite normal. Certainly nothing wrong there. Open the jet slowly. Better the place safe. Right. All jets firing. Seven tenths maximum. Good. Open them up and we'll change course. I'm sorry we won't be getting our close-up view of the Orbiter X space station. But that can wait. Here we go. now, chaps. If we've left anything behind in the workshops, it's too late to turn back. I think we've got everything we shall need, Bob. Uh, it's a pity we can't have a picture of ourselves right now. Three men in space suits, sitting on a sort of flying car chassis loaded with gear, <laughs> and a couple of tiddly little jets stuck on the back. Talk about the satellite brothers. That's just what we will be if these jets back up. No, they won't. In fact, we can cut them for a bit and give them a rest. We don't want to burn them out. How much further do you make it to Orbiter 2, Mac? I was just thinking we should be able to see her now. The trouble is this portable radar outfit is much use at this distance. Okay, I'll start sweeping. Concentrate on bearing 275 DL34. She's around there somewhere. Okay. According to my calculations, uh, she must be passing over the Canadian Northwest Territories. We should intercept over Hudson Bay, which you can see already. Yes. Yeah, I've got her. You have? Yes. What's this? Hey, look at the screen. There's another ship alongside her. What? It can't be true. Must be a double image. It isn't, you know. That's a ship, all right. The unitists must have decided to check up on the old orbiter. I must have. 
What shall we do, Bob? We must sheer off. Open the jets. I'm turning well away to starboard. Okay, that'll do. Cut. We'll keep our distance. I hope they don't spot us. Uh, they're not likely to, unless they're on the lookout. We're a pretty small target. Now, what beats me is, why should Crom and his mob suddenly choose this particular moment to make their check? I think the explanation is simple enough. They're probably on their way back to join us at the space station. This happens to be the time when the ship and the station orbits are closest to one another. They saw the ship very near to them. That was that. Yeah. I don't imagine they'll stay there long. I uh, hope not. We don't want to stay in our space suits long. Even when we do get aboard, we'll have to work in them until we've patched up the hull and made it airtight. Yes. As far as I remember, the fractures weren't too bad. The thing would be for you, Mac, to get straight on with that job. While Hickey and I start fitting the new jets. Good idea. And I can help you with the compressor. Yes, that's it. Uh, at least we can't call it heavy work. The compressor may weigh about half a ton on the ground, but up here I can push it around with my little finger. Make sure you're anchored to something solid. Otherwise, you'll be the part that's pushed. Yes, thank you very much, Bob. Yes, all right. Look at the screen. The unity ship's moving off. Yes, you're right, it is. Thank goodness for that. Shall we get back on course? No, hold on. Watch the screen. If Carmen and his friends are going straight to Orbiter X, they'll be coming in our direction. Yes, that's a fault. Uh, but they don't seem to be. No, they're going the other way. Yes. I wonder why. Well, maybe they've decided to have a look at Brad's ship while they're at it. Yes, maybe they have. The men seem yes, they haven't seen us. All right. We've got a lot of work to do. The sooner it's done, the sooner we'll be back with Colonel Kent and the boys again. You can open the jets now, Hickey. Give them all they've got. Okay. I just don't understand it, sir. They weren't the sort of chaps to step out into space and give up like that. Well, Orbiter 2 was empty. We saw that for ourselves. And the airlock hatches were both wide open. That's what makes it so extraordinary. They, they must have known what they were doing. We'll go into it later. Just concentrate on Orbiter 1, Chris. Yes. Range closing to 150. A burst or two on the retrojets and we'll be alongside. Good. I'll give Bradley a call. Hello? This is SM calling Orbiter 1. Brad, are you listening? Orbiter 1 answering you, SM. Yes, I'm standing by. Everything all right? Yes, Brad, but I didn't keep calling you in case we ran into trouble. We're about to start the retrojects, and we'll be alongside you right away. I can see a ship to the observation port now. We're on target, Chris. Good. Hello, SM. Colonel Kent, I'll play large and join you as soon as you give the word. Do you think you can make it by yourself? I can make it. Hold on, Brad. They're turning up. How's that, sir? There's about 20 yards between us. First class. You might call it beginner's luck. I didn't say anything, but for a split second on the run-in, I thought I was going to ram Orbiter 1. He's rammed already. You see the damage to his starboard jets? Yes, yes, I do. I'll have to come out here again and make a thorough examination. I won't keep Brad waiting around now. The most important thing is to get him back to Wolver as soon as possible. Yes, he must be in pretty poor shape. Do you think perhaps I should go over and help him across? I think you should. Uh, check your suit. Right. I'll let him know you're coming over. Hello, Brad. We're all clear for you. Chris Knight is coming out to give you a hand. I tell you I can manage. I'm on my way. No, hold it. Hello. Hello, are you there? Ah, oh, cut off. Can't say I blame him. If I'd been shut up in that thing for a few weeks, I don't think I'd wait. No, neither would I. He'll be going through his airlock now. What shall I do? Just watch and see how he gets on. You can always go out to him if he's in trouble. Of course. Oh, no, the outer hatch of Orbiter One is opening. 
Yes. And there's Bradley. Yes. He's stepping out. He seems to be moving all right. Bird, you can empty our airlock and make it ready for him. Right. Hello, SM. I'm speaking on helmet intercom. Can you hear me? Yes, Brad, we can hear you. And we can see you. You're doing fine. Yes. I'm okay. Steady with your jet pistol. You've got a slight grip to your left. That's better. Our airlock is ready for you to step into. Thanks. Almost there. Yes. I've made it. Good man. He's aboard. He's through the outer hatch. Well, that's the first part of our mission completed, Chris. Yes. Getting back to Woomera should be a piece of cake. No, well, there's nothing wrong with the compressors on this ship. No, I don't think it can be. Now, we're going to meet Jack Bradley at last. Funny, you know, I feel quite shaky. It's like meeting someone who's come back from... Well, I don't know. Open the inner hatch. Brad. Get his helmet off, quickly. Right. Oh, poor chap, he, he looks as if he's practically dead in his feet. Yes. I made it. Yes, you made it. You're safe now. Chris, turn on the small oxygen cylinder and hold the tube close to his mouth. Okay. Keep him steady while I see to the rest of his suit. I, I've got it. Oh, funny, it never occurred to me until now that when a man collapsed out here, he'd stay more or less upright. Now you know. I'm all right. Yes, well, I don't worry. But what happened to that leg of yours? I don't know. I can't remember. Give me a drink or something. Of course. I'll get a squeeze bottle for you. You'd better lie down now, Brad. I'll help you over to one of the contour seats. All right, all right. I can get there myself. Steady now. I'm all right, I tell you. I can take it. Oh, but you don't have to anymore. Try and relax. Here's your drink, Brad. What is it? Coffee. Okay. Oh, that's fine, thanks. It's good of you to come out for me. The radio packed up, you see. And after I repaired it... I kept trying to get through to you. And of course, we didn't hear anything until the interference lifted. you. Then we came straight out. You weren't the first one. You mean you saw Britain when he came after you? No, I never saw him. What? Was he out here? Yes. He never came back. Oh. I'm sorry. That's, that's bad. Brad, what did you mean when you said we weren't the first? I saw plenty of ships. Big. Beautiful ships. They'd come alongside and tempt me to go out to them. I tried it a couple of times, but whenever I opened the outer hatch, they just melted away. They were all in my imagination. And I remembered Wilson and I stayed in the cabin. I stayed with Carter until I couldn't stand his stupid, lifeless grin anymore, so... I put him out through the airlock. With his jet pistol fixed to him and working. And away he went. I see. Brad, are you quite sure that all those ships were in your imagination? Is there a chance they might have been real? Now listen, Colonel Kent. Who's round the bend? You or me? I've done a lot of flying. I know when I'm seeing things and when I'm not. Of course, of course. <laughs> they won't worry you with any more questions. We want to get you back to Woomera as soon as possible. Do you know what it means? Do you think you can stand up to the jet thrust, or shall we wait a bit? No, no, let's go. I want to feel the ground under my feet again. All right, fasten your straps. Chris, start the compressors, and we'll move out of orbit. Yes, sir. Perhaps open. Here we go.
Unity Earth Control, hello? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We can see that on the central monitor. Keep tracking. What is it, Kelvin? Oh, that tracking officer. What's his name? Uh, uh, Manelli. is drawing our attention to the fact that Kent's ship is now inside the atmosphere and breaking smoothly. Don't discourage our friend Manelli. A little more of his efficiency, and we should not have lost the main interference transmitter. Uh, turn up the sound monitor. Right. We should hear Warmer broadcasting the preliminary landing instructions. Range 1545. There they are. Hello, SM. Repeating. You are bearing 281 EV 74. Range 1545. Open your retrojet to 110 maximum. And CSC, 110 it is. Thank you. Colonel Kent and his pilot don't know how lucky they are, do they, Kramer? No, they don't. They were fortunate to keep clear of Orbiter X. Their sudden change of course towards Britain's ship came just in time. I hope their apparent success doesn't go to their heads, because if it does, they may start regular flights again. If they do that, it should give Bradley an opportunity to exercise his newly found talents. He might carry out a little sabotage on our behalf. Yes, so he might. But our task now is to restore interference transmissions quickly and get to work on the assembly of Orbiter X. And while Captain Britton and his team are waiting for us, they will have ample opportunity for reflection. After a few more days in zero gravity, they should be even more willing to cooperate. <laughs> Well, the old ship's beginning to look for herself now. Do you have any luck with the radio, Mac? No, Bob told me to lay off it. Did he? Yeah, well, it's pretty obvious that if we started transmitting, the signals would be intercepted by Kramer, and we'd be on the receiving end of the missile before you could say night. Yes, I know that, but we'll have to use the radio just before we land. Why? Well, ships don't just drop down into Woomera without getting ground clearance first. Uh, this one's going to Hey, you two. Stop napping and help me take over the new compressor, will you? Yeah, Bob. Coming. Now, look. We can't afford any mistakes. Once we start moving, we've got to keep going. Otherwise, the unitists will be on our tail. True, true. Nicky, you're supposed to be the expert. Have a look at these connections. Aye, aye, sir. Chief Petty Officer Hicks, follow it. Yeah, sometimes I wish I still was a chief. Uh, just think of all that flight engineer's pay that's pouring into that account of yours while you're out here. Oh, I don't know about that. I reckon my wife's drawing a widow's pension by now. <laughs> oh, well, let's have a look at the plummy. I've checked the jets outside, Bob. They seem to be fine. Yes, I went over them myself, too. It seems to me that the weakest part of the repair job is the hull. I don't know how those patches are going to stand the strain once we start diving through the atmosphere. Oh, I don't know either. Well, before we get going, we'll check our pressure suits and helmets. We'll need them if the hull starts opening up. You're yeah, right. What about the ship's temperature control? Do you think that's okay? As far as I can see, it is. If we start burning up when we hit the air, well, well you'll know it isn't. Oh, thanks for telling me. Now, this uh, compressor job looks fair enough, Bob. I'll open the valves and test the leaks. Right, Higgy. Go ahead. Yes, yeah. it sounds all right. Yes, the gauge is steady. There's only one more test we can carry out now, and that's to open the fuel taps and see how she goes. Right. Back to the control cabin, chaps. Let's see whether it was all worthwhile, eh? Shut the bulkheads, Mac. Right. Now, check your suits. Get into your seats. Uh, I hope we're going to start moving out of orbit. Mm, my suit's okay. Yes, and mine. Right. Well, this is our big moment. If the jets work, don't forget we've got to keep them going whatever happens. Any questions? Uh, no questions. Uh, we've asked all the questions, Bob. Let's see if we find the right answers. Okay. Open the taps. The taps are working. Arbiter 2's backing cells. Watch those engine indicators, Hickey. Right, Bob. And Mac, you know your job? Sure. The navigation's up to you. I know. And without any radio and half the instruments gone, the best of British luck.
This is Unity Earth Control calling tracking stations. Keep sweeping. That ship must be located quickly. Kelvin, what has happened? Oh, Dr. Klamer, it is unbelievable, but Orbiter 2 has disappeared. What? The tracking stations are sweeping for her now. There must be some mistake. No, I am afraid not. Hello? Yes? Right, put it through. The trackers have got her. The picture is coming up on number one monitor. Yes, there it is. Yes, that is Orbiter 2, under control with all jets working. Hmm, interesting. You take it very calmly. That ship was a derelict. Who has repaired it and who is on board? The answer is perfectly obvious. Not to me. There is no mystery. We have simply underestimated the ingenuity of our Commonwealth Space Project friends. You will remember that we saw Colonel Kent's ship stop alongside Orbiter 2. Yes. Now we know why he stopped. It was to put a repair squad on board. They would have taken all the necessary equipment with them, and this is the result. Yes, of course, you're right. Then what are your instructions? I see no reason for extreme measures. If the ship makes a safe landing, it can do no harm. But CSB will regard it as a great achievement. First, Colonel Kent arrives back safely at Woomera with Bradley. Then, if its salvage squad arrives, confidence will be restored and flying restrictions may be relaxed. Hmm. You may be right there, Gilvin. Then what do you suggest? Let me see. Our main interference transmitter is out of action, but we can still transmit an emergency service for a short time. Oh, yes. It's screened the return of Bradley to Orbiter 1. Exactly. We can use it again to jam the CSP tracking stations. Also, it will cut all communications between Orbiter 2 and Woomera. Of course. And without the help of electronics, the ship is hardly likely to make a successful landing. No. Even more important, perhaps, the people at Woomera will have little or no warning of its approach. They may even regard it as hostile and take the appropriate defensive action. The interference is building up again, Colonel Kent. Just take a look at those monitor screens. Yes. How's the level on the sound channels? All right, turn it on. It's a strange thing, you know. It's been absolutely clear since you picked up Kent, Captain Bradley. I wonder if this is going to mean more trouble. Yes, I wonder. Well, the interference is back, is it? Yes. Uh, come over here, will you, Captain Knight? I say, it's lucky this didn't clamp down before we got back. That's what I was thinking. It rather upsets my theories. Oh, well... Never mind. Uh, what's the latest on Bradley? Well, he seems to be comfortable, but there's something about him that almost puts my back up. Oh, I know I shouldn't say that after all he's been through, but I never expected him to be, well, like he is. I used to get on very well with him, but now he's, well, he's talking down to me. I know what you mean, but we must make allowances. Yes, the doctors say he stood up to his ordeal very well, and they're very pleased with him. You know his wife's flying out from England? Yes. She'll probably do more good than all the rest of us put together. Well, I hope she will. Has he been able to tell you exactly what happened to him out there, sir? Well, we're getting the story in bits and pieces, but uh, so far it doesn't help us very much. You know, I'm still convinced that our efforts are being sabotaged. But we'll see whether or not I'm right when we master the interference trouble. Sir, there's an image coming up in number one monitor. What's this? Oh, it's probably part of the interference pattern. Check with the tracking stations, Brown. All right. Look at the picture now, sir. It's, it's almost like a projectile on a ship. Yes, it could be. But we know it isn't one of ours. And today's bulletin from the UN Space Department doesn't mention any flights. Colonel, all the trackers are in a real panic. They say there is a solid object out there. It's well inside the atmosphere and it's heading towards us at a pretty fair rate. It is, isn't it? Right. I want the range and bearing worked out immediately. Sound the general alarm and alert the perimeter defenses. I don't know what's behind this, but if somebody's looking for trouble, they'll get it. Oh, sir, the image on the screen is pretty bad. The figures are coming through, okay? 
Mr. Here's the predictor information straight to them. Yes, Colonel. The UFO's bearing 209 EV27, range 951, altitude 75 miles. Still heading towards us. Order the missiles to line up. Right, right up now. Keep tracking, Brown. Yes, Colonel. You're quite sure the UN Space Department knows nothing about any flights? Absolutely sure. We've checked. All the same, we can't open fire until we know beyond all reasonable doubt that the object is a projectile aimed at Boomerang. Turn up the sound monitor. Right, sir. Yes, the interference is pretty bad, but I'll try making a call. I don't suppose you can get an answer, but you never know. Hello, this is CSP Woomera calling unidentified flying objects bearing 209EV27. Announce your identity, please. This is urgent. Nothing there. No, just must. Hold everything. The UFO seems to have leveled out. Yes, the altitude's going up. Up to 80, 80 miles plus. Look at that. It can't be a projectile at all. It must be piloted. It must be a ship. Sorry we had to overshoot our target and climb away from Woomera, chaps. Well, it was either that or we'd have burnt up, Bob. Yes. Blimey, it was like a furnace when we got down into the atmosphere. What's our position now, Mac? Well, uh, we're almost over the Gulf of Carpentaria. Altitude around 90 miles. So, the big question is, do we carry on and make a complete circuit around the Earth? Or do we turn and make another dive towards home sweet home? Well, if we make the full circuit, we should have bags of time to slow down to landing speed. But what about Kramer and the Unitists? Yeah, it could depend on why they'd start throwing things. And we'd be a nice, easy target for the blighters. Yes, that's the whole trouble, Hickey. And I reckon we ought to turn and dive. It's risky. If we start heating up again, we can always pull out. As long as we don't leave it too late. Yeah, it's the only way, Bob. All right. What's the cut temperature now? And it's fallen to 120 degrees. Perfect shades of Aden. I remember when I was there in the Navy, it was so blooming hot. You can tell us about that some other time, old lad. How's the cooling plant working? It's a bit dicey. We should have given it a thorough check when we carried out the general repairs, I suppose. Yeah, it can't be helped now. The thing is, are we all agreed that we have another bash for woman? Yeah. Yes, agreed. Right. Then open up the starboard jets at nine-tenths maximum. We'll start turning. Okay. Here we go. And the best of luck. That's fine. Open the port jets and balance off. Okay. Keep on bearing 312 EV19. Right. Accurate navigation strictly without radio. Let's just put us on course for HQ. Fair enough. We're going down fast now. You've said it. Look at the ceramic on the leading edges of the fins. Get into low red hot. And we won't start worrying until the hull begins to glow. Like it did on that last time. Yeah, but we were traveling a lot faster then. Well, that's true. You think the CSP tracking stations have picked us up yet? Not if Kramer's still got his interference transmitter working on low altitude coverage. They should certainly see us by the time we get down to the 60 or 70 mile mark. And they could have heard us if we'd stopped to get the radio working. Yeah, so could Kramer. Can't risk that. No, of course not. I hope they recognize us. Otherwise, we'll get a blooming hot reception. <laughs> like a little ray of sunshine, isn't it, Bob? Yeah. All the same, we want to give them a good chance to pick us up on the scanners. Better start breaking again. I'll open the auxiliary retro jets. Hold on. The temperature's creeping up to the danger level already. Can't be helped. No turning back now. We'll just keep going. Hope for the best. <laughs> UFO bearing 042, EV23. Altitude, 60 miles. It looks as if it's holding to its course this time, Sir Charles. Yes. What do you make of it? I wish I knew. The picture on the monitor is bound to clear as the thing gets closer. Yes. That is clearing now. Yes, the object's beginning to take shape. It's obviously diving out of the interference zone. How about another call on the RT? I'll try. 
Hello, TSP Womanor calling UFO. Are you receiving me? Come in, please. Uh, still no answer. Hey, look at the picture. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking. Surely that outline's familiar. It's exactly like one of our own ships. Yes, it is. I say, sir, the second station of Mount Isa has just come through to say that UFO looks like all of us through. But look at the screen now. I can't understand. Well, neither can I, but she's believing. Check and report all of the two approaching on bearing 042 EV18. That must be a mistake. I was aboard the ship myself less than a week ago. It was derelict, empty, orbiting 1,200 miles above the Earth. It needed major repair, which seems to have been carried out. But who by? Perhaps we shall know the answer to that question quite soon. According to the predictors, the ship ought to touch down 25 miles to the west of our landing zone. But it may change course on the final approach. If it doesn't, will you take me out to meet it in one of the jet helicopters, Kent? I will. Do you think it's wise for you to come, Sir Charles? Well, why shouldn't I? You don't imagine we're going to find a crew of Martians waiting for us, do you? Well, whoever they are, they can't be our chaps. Not unless they be helped by some outside agent. What do you mean by that? What I mean is, Britain, McClellan and Hicks left Orbiter 2. You know that because you went aboard. Yes. So if they return to the ship and brought it home, we shall have to treat them very carefully. You understand? Yes, I think I do. The ground's coming up fast. Too late to turn towards Woomera, Mac. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't bring you right in on time. Yeah, don't apologize. We're not far off. The ground's smooth enough for landing. Our only trouble now is cutting down speed. I'm going to start leveling out. The G-force will hit us pretty hard. Are you ready for it? Yep. All set, Bob. Right. Breaking up. What is it? The starboard fin is beginning to crack. The heat must have done it. Okay, we'll have to crash land. It won't be too bad. I'm going in on the approach run. Now, just remember, the moment we stop, we must get out quickly in case of fire. Yeah, I've opened the inner hatch, Bob. But all that's good. That fin will just hold together while I put the tail down. We'll be okay. Here we go. Right. Tail down. Well done, Bob. Uh, a nice bit of work, Bob. You both all right? Yes, all right. Uh, sure, sure. Hi, we go quickly, come on. After being in zero gravity, you... You feel you weigh about a ton when you stand up. We must move. Uh, you said it. Those fuel tanks might go up at any moment. Yeah, the hatch is jammed. I think it's shifting. Here, we'll give you a hand. Right. Let's show it to Max. Okay. Right. Uh, Eve. Hey, Tits, go on. Out we go. <laughs> go. Oh, look at that. The engine room's burning all right. Yes. Just got out in time. Come on, run for it. Fast as you can. You must find some cover. A dip in the ground will do. Anything to screen us from the blast when the tanks explode. That's a dip. Straight ahead. It goes down three or four feet. Just a jump. Into it quickly and lie flat. Okay. Come on, Higgy. Don't worry, I'm with you. You're a good man. How are we going to the dip? Uh. Head down! Well, old ship saw us home, chaps. Yes, she did her job and she went out in style. I suppose all we have to do now is to wait for the woman of voice to come out and pick us up. Yeah, yeah that's about it, Mac. <coughs> we shouldn't have any trouble finding it. You can bet your life they've tracked us down. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of smoke to go into me. <laughs> plenty of smoke. Oh, it's blowing this way, too. Come on, let's move. Might as well start getting used to normal gravity again. Even if this isn't the ideal place to practice it. Oh, look at it. Sun and sands. Miles of blooming desert. Oh, I reckon it's hotter here than it was inside the ship. Not that I'm complaining. I shouldn't think so, either. You'll be back in Portsmouth with your wife and kids in that time. Ah, Pompey, eh? <laughs> that sounds like heaven now. You think I'm likely to get leave, though, Bob? Yeah. Yes, I'm sure you'll get a short break anyway. Uh, what about you? Think you'll be getting back to those nice, cold Essex marshes of yours? Not until CSP decide what to do about the unities, eh, Mac? No. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not even thinking of home yet. 
Glasgow's still a long way off. Oh, away with you. You'll be staggering down Sucky Hall Street before you know where you are. I never <laughs> stagger, Hickey. Well, then you're giving a lifelike imitation of it now. You know, it's about time you had a little bit of naval discipline again. Come here. Yeah. No, thank you very much. No, I'm I'm it up, you two. Come on. This. I can hear engines. You're, you're right. Yes, they sound like our jet helicopters. Look, look, there they are. There's two of them. See them just through the smoke there. Yeah. One of them is flying ambulances. Yes, there's no mistaking the white. I wonder who's in the other one. Colonel Kent, I'll bet you. Yes. Give them a win. <laughs> Hello there. I right hear you, Hickey. Now look, they're surfing. Come on down for goodness sake. They probably can't believe their eyes. They must have recognized us by now. Yes, yes. they're waving back. Here they come. Are you all right, Max? There's a the colonel. Oh, look, he's got the child's play with him. Let's go and meet him. I'm halfway there. Colonel Kent. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. So it really is you. I will not go, Swift. I will. And it's good to see you. And you, Sir Charles. Hello, sir. Hello, Britain. It's very good to see you. Well, this is a moment we've been waiting for for a long time. Hey, I'll say it is. You're all all right, are you? Oh, yes. Pretty good, thanks, sir. I expect you've picked up the ship properly as soon as we got below the interference, sir. Yes, it was just as well for you that we did. I must say you were pretty quick off the mark with the rescue party, sir. Congratulations. Predictors gave us your approximate landing point, and we took off before you actually uh, landed. <laughs> uh, sorry we couldn't make a better job of it, but things got a bit sticky, as you can guess. We've got a quite a story to tell. You see, after we went out to find Brett... I live in Britain. We're, we're most interested to hear your story, but perhaps this is hardly the place for it. Uh, you'd better come aboard the machine, and we'll take you straight back to Woman. Yes, good idea. Yeah, let's get out of the sun. Yeah. Come on, Hickey. Up we go. Well, now, you obviously don't need the ambulance, so it can follow us back. Yes. All we need is a clean-up and a little bit of rest. You'll have to have a medical check. We'll take you to the camp hospital to begin with, and you can start sending us your story on the way. Yeah, right, sir. We all aboard? Yes. Right. And here we go. I don't like it. I don't think Kent and that old idiot of a minister believe a word we told them. Uh, did you see the colonel's face when you explained how we repaired Orbiter 2? And when you said we'd been on board the Orbiter X workshop rocket, well, he looked downright suspicious. Now, take it easy, boy. That's your trouble, Bob. Sometimes you're too easy. Just because this numbskull Kent, your senior officer, you say, yes, sir, no, sir. Mac, be quiet. No, I won't. Pretty thing is, as here, in this hospital room, is as good as locking us up. We're under arrest, that's what we are. Oh, they haven't told us yet, but don't worry, they will. When they've cooked up a case... That's enough, man. Don't you realize, while well, Colonel Blimpley's satellite minister of fumbling round in circles, ah. clamors getting down to business. Now, look. May I come in? Oh, yes. Colonel Kent, yes, of course. I... Of course you have the rumpus. Well, uh, perhaps it would be better to forget. No, you don't have to be diplomatic with us, sir. It's time we cleared the air, and it's time we started asking you a few questions. Now, Max, for heaven's sake. If I don't shake this place up, the unitists will. Now, listen. You can let off steam with me, but don't cry with the minister and don't underestimate him. We'll be back in a moment, and I thought I'd have a quiet word with you first. Okay. You must admit you told us a most astonishing story. There are bound to be more questions, and we may be in for one or two shocks. I am so will you, sir. If you don't believe what we tell you... I'm bound to say that's perfectly true, sir. There is a very serious danger, and you've got to accept it. Cool Max. down, both of you. You must be patient. And you in particular, Mac, a word of warning. Keep yourself in check and don't lose your temper. Ah, now, this will be the child. Now, remember what I said. Uh, come in. Ah, Sir Charles. Oh, well, gentlemen, it's nice to see you. I hope all of you are beginning to settle down. It's a little early to say yet, Sir Charles. Well, uh, I'm glad to see that you're in good shape medically. Yes. And mentally, I think. Uh, Oh, good, good. Well, now, uh, Colonel Kent and I have been having a serious talk about what you told us. And there are just one or two points in your story that I'd like to clear up, so uh, suppose you'll make yourself comfortable and try and relax. All right, we'll try, Sir Charles. Now, Britain, when you first arrived at this place you call Unity Headquarters, 
I gather that you expected to be faced with a, a program of indoctrination. Well, I should say there was no doubt about it. You seem very sure of it. Well, yes. It wasn't difficult to recognize the early stages of the brainwashing technique. Ah. You know, the build-up of tension, uncertainty, repetitive noises, bright lights, interrogation. We had all that from the moment we arrived. Uh, but uh, it made no impression on you. No. Why, we weren't there long enough. The given time, uh, do you think it might have had some effect? I honestly don't know. Presumably, Captain Bradley would. Bradley? Yes, I expect he would, poor chap. Well, he's been there long enough now. Probably had the full treatment. But where you... You say he had a broken leg. Uh, was it the left or the right leg? Do you remember? Uh, the right one, wasn't it, mate? Uh, yes, it was. Do you agree with that, Hicks? Oh, I can't say, because I never saw him, sir. Uh, Captain Britton told you, sir, Hicks wasn't with us when we found Bradley in the headquarters. Oh, yes, 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 it did have slipped my mind. I suppose you think we should have brought him out with us, sir? No, no, no. Your duty was to get back here with the information. That's exactly what Brad said. Yes, he said we'd never make it if we tried to bring him along with us. He did, did he? Yes, but we made a promise that we'd go back to him, And we mean to keep that promise. That won't be necessary, would it, Colonel Kent? No, hardly. But, well, what do you mean, sir? Bob, I've got a surprise for you. We haven't mentioned it before, but Jack Bradley is no longer at Unity Headquarters. What? He's right here inside the hospital. Right here? Oh, yeah, he can't be. I, I don't understand it. It's wonderful news. How on earth did he get back? He sent us a radio signal from Orbiter One. He did what? He signaled us from his ship. And I flew out with Captain Knight. Picked him up. And he was there? Yes. I also took the opportunity to look aboard Orbiter Two. And you were not there. Now you'll begin to see why we've been a little worried about your story. Ah, yes, but it all adds up, doesn't it? Yes, Bradley must have been put back on his ship by the Unitists. They intended he should be picked up. Yes, hold on, wait a minute. How did you hear his signal through the interference? It stopped. Well, that clinches it. Unity cut the interference to make jolly sure that you did hear him. This was their one way of getting him back to Woomera without arousing suspicion. Yes, but why should they want him back? Hasn't he told you all about them, sir? No, not a word. Do you realize what this means, Colonel Kent? Yes, sir. We're not quite numbskulls, you know. The minister and I have decided that Captain Bradley has been through the brainwashing treatment. And he's here as a Unity agent. Yes, I'm afraid that is now obvious. Yes, it looks like it. Jack Bradley, no, he, he wouldn't agree with the rest of those people. Believe me, if they know their job, which I'm sure they do, there probably isn't a man alive who could hold out against them. Yes, I suppose you're right, Sir Charles. How is Brad? Can we see him? Yes, yes, it's all been arranged. I, I've just spoken to the doctors and they agree it might be a good idea for him to meet you right away. I'll have him sent in. We're going to see him now. Quite. Are we are ready for Bradley. I take it he doesn't know we're here. No, indeed he doesn't. That's the whole point of the meeting. Shop tactics, eh? I don't like it. Neither do any of us. But we may help to trigger off the process of reconversion. It'll be interesting to see his reactions. Now, here he is. You wanted to see me, Mr. Tom? Hello, uh, Bradley. Right. McClellan, Hicks, I... No. No, it doesn't throw. You weren't expecting this, were you, Bradley? Throw. You weren't expecting this, were you, Bradley? Throw. You weren't. Palmer and all that he stands for. What are you talking about? You know quite well. Britain and McClellan spoke to you when you were inside the Unity headquarters. That's where you first met Kramer and a man called Gelvin. Do you remember? I've never heard of them. And there was a Doctor Rabel. These names mean nothing to me. But Brad, you do know these people. You were in their hands. We were with you. I don't remember. Then you'd better think hard. How are you supposed to get in touch with them? Get in touch with them? You're, you're, you're talking nonsense. What have they done to you? Come on, snap out of it, man. Tell me about the indoctrination. You're all wrong. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Then tell me where you think you've been for the past few weeks. I've been aboard Orbiter One. You know that. We know that's not true. You weren't there when Britain went aboard? It was Kramer who put you there. Kramer, wasn't it? I don't know who Kramer is. Where are his headquarters? They must have covered a large area. I tell you, I don't know. Well, which country are they in? The local government must know about them, and so must you. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. And as for you, Britain, Brad, you must help us. You wouldn't be the first to defect against unity. Dr. Ravel helped us, and she may have done, but I... She? The game's up, Bradley. We never mentioned that Dr. Ravel is a woman. You obviously know about her, just as you know about Kramer and the rest of them. 
Now start talking. All right. I did promise to help Unity. And I'm proud of it. During the past weeks, I've learned to see things more clearly. I see that democracy, communism, dictatorships are all leading to the same end. Destruction. The only hope for the future of the world is a unity world government. It's bound to happen. It's natural evolution. And whatever you do, you can't stop it. I hoped I'd be able to play a part in it, but now I realize that that's impossible. Yes, it is. Quite impossible. But you can't make me say anything that would injure the organization. You won't tell us where the headquarters are? Of course not. In any case, I don't know. But you mean they never told you? No. I realized they had to protect themselves in case something like this happened. That means you were to work through a contact. I've nothing to say. All right. We'll find out later. But uh, purely as a matter of interest, do you know why Dr. Kramer left uh, Britain, McClellan, and Hicks on his day? There must have been a sudden emergency because he left quite suddenly without any explanation. Yes, the interference translator caught fire at Unity Headquarters. So that was it. He was afraid his ship would be seen on the ground tracking screen. Aye, no wonder he pushed off and left us to it. Then he must have rebuilt the transmitter very quickly to cover your return to Orbiter 1, Bradley. No, he used a small emergency setup. Yes, of course. It, it will be obviously some time before Karma can put the main transmitter back into service and return to Orbiter X. Don't you believe it? Their people are efficient. The new transmitter's probably working already. I wonder. Uh, Colonel Kent, well, would you be good enough to ring through to Central Control and check on them? By all means. Central Control speaking. Oh, hello, Brown. Kent here. Yes, sir. Tell me, what is the interference like on the sound and vision monitors at the moment? Well, there isn't any, sir. Both channels are clear. I suppose they would be when we don't want to use them. Ah, uh, yes. Well, perhaps you've got something there. Right. That's all I wanted to know. Okay, sir. You heard that, Sir Charles? Uh, yes, thank you. It appears that Dr. Kramer is less efficient than you thought, Bradley. I'm not saying any more. You can do what you like. I don't worry. You may not realize it, Bradley, but you're a sick man. We'll see that you're properly cared for. Come along, Bradley. This way. Uh, the minister and I will be back in a moment, Bob. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, what do you know I know what I'd like to do to Kramer and his gang. Well, so do I. I think what they must have done to Bradley. He's a, he's a completely different man. Yes. Will he ever be himself again, Bob? Yes, but it may take some time. Pretty grim the way he caved in when he first saw us. He soon pulled himself together, didn't he? Yeah, and when he realized he'd given himself away, he came right out on Kramer's side. Oh, see what happens when his wife is missing. Yes, well, she may be able to help well, uh, gentlemen, I promised you some shocks. We've still another one in store for you, haven't we, Sir Charles? Yes, I'm afraid we have. I hope it's not a case of meeting another Bradley. I must say I feel a bit shaken after that. Oh, we all do. Yes, it was pretty frightening. I couldn't agree more. Now, listen, gentlemen. This unity organization's got to be broken up. But the important thing is that we don't want Kramer to know we're on his tail. Otherwise, he'll go into action. Am I right, Bob? Yes, quite right, sir. He's got stacks of ballistic missiles, and he won't hesitate to use them. He thought he was in danger. So at the moment, our best line of attack is through you. Well, yes, I suppose it is, but what can we do? It may be a job with a one-way ticket, so I shall quite understand if you decide not to take it on. The point is this. As far as Kramer knows, Bradley is still his agent... And you are still on our embryo space station, Orbiter X. Yes. Now, we don't want to upset that illusion, and there's no reason why we should. But as soon as the interference transmitter is working again, Crown will go back to the station. Exactly. And he must find things just as he left them. You mean you... you want us to go... Yes. Colonel Kent and I are asking you to return to the place you struggled so hard to get away from. In other words, what we are asking you to do is to go back to Orbiter X. Go oh, back there? We'd never make it. Karma would see us on his track. Yes, just a minute, boys. Sir Charles, I expect you've got the answers to this. I think we have. Uh, Kent, perhaps you'd explain. Yes, of course. Not long after you left, I decided that the interference which was plaguing us on sound and vision was being produced artificially. Our electronics department got working on the problem, and although they haven't been able to find the source of the interference... They've found some of the answers to it. And they've also produced some screening devices of their own. You mean deflectors? Yes. When you fit them to a ship, they seem to screen it just as effectively as the interference transmission. They've just been fitted to one of our ships, 
And that's the one which could take you back to the space station components. Well, I'm ready to give it a try. How about you, Mac? Uh, sure, I'll have a go. Yes, yeah, so will I. I'm sorry about this as far as you're concerned, Higgy. I hoped you might have a chance to see your family before you started flying again. Yes, I did too. <laughs> Still, can't be helped. Well, we're most grateful to you all. Yes, indeed. Now, Captain Knight will fly you out, put you aboard the Central Workshop's rocket, and then bring his ship back here to Umara. Yes, so when Kramer returns to Orbiter X, you'll find us waiting for him. And you'll have no idea we've been away. None at all, we hope. And you should be in a strong position because you'll be working to a fixed plan. You'll have one or two mechanical aids to help you. And while you're busy at your end, the rest of the fleet will be armed and fitted with the new deflectors. Obviously, the fitting out is going to take several weeks. So during that time, we thought we'd let the unitists go ahead and assemble the space station for us. <laughs> with our help, I presume. Yes. <laughs> That's quite an idea. And then you take it over when it's complete. Uh, naturally, but you, you don't have to worry about that side. Hmm. You mentioned some mechanical aids, sir. Yes, sir. Listen to the signals yourselves. Now turn it on. Mm hmm? Yes, well, it works. Yes. And there are two very important points about these uh, transmissions. First of all, they should be heard through the Unity Interference screen. And secondly, they can only be picked up on a special receiver. So the Unitists won't hear them. Oh, that's excellent. Now, if you can possibly manage it, we want you to plant this gadget inside Kramer's ship. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. If you succeed, it means that wherever the ship goes, it'll be tracked by our direction finders. Sooner or later, we should be able to trace it right back to Unity headquarters and pinpoint them on the map. Ah, it sounds wonderful. How long can the beacon go on working? Uh, the batteries are supposed to last for uh, up to three months. Fair enough. But um, what happens... After you've located the headquarters. Well, uh, that would be a matter of higher policy. Yes, you needn't worry about that. Your job is to plant the beacon and help the unitists to put the space station together. Yes. How will you know when it's complete? A crown will obviously screen it electronically. And he must have a method of screening it visually as well. Well, that doesn't worry us too much, because we shall rely on you to send us a signal when the job's finished. Yes. You see, the transmitter you'll use is exactly like the beacon... But the signal is different. Now, listen, here it is. Now, as soon as we hear this, we shall know that your mission has reached its final stage. That's when you'll make your getaway aboard one of the space station chariots. We'll give you a small deflector set, which will screen you from the unitists, and one of our ships will come out, pick you up, and bring you back here to Woomera. Uh, yes, but where will it pick us up? We'd better fix a rendezvous. Yeah, no, no. I will. Yeah, I know. Uh, how about Bradley's old ship, Orbiter One? Oh, that's an idea, Bob. Yes, it's still circling the Earth, so we could cross over to it just as we crossed over to our own ship. In the chariot. Well, that's excellent. That seems to be the answer. The rendezvous is Orbiter One. Well, that's the plan as it affects you, Bob. Are the main point's clear? Yes, I think so. First, we plant the beacon on Kramer's ship. Then, when the station's complete, we send you the signal and set out on the chariot for Orbiter One. That's right. And we take that signal as our cue to send off a ship to meet you. It's a tough assignment. Now you've heard all about it. Then if you want to change your mind and back out, this is the moment to say so. No, we'd like to go ahead, sir. Good. But as you realize, it's essential that you arrive on the Orbiter X workshop rocket before Kramer gets there. So you'll have to move fast. Yes, of course. Uh, Kent, uh, I understand you briefed Captain Knight for a test run with the deflectors. Uh, yes, they've been fitted to his ship, Orbiter 3. And the final adjustments are being made to them now. As soon as they're complete, I'll give him the word to take off. We'd very much like to see the test, sir. Yes, but there's no need for you to hang about. I think you all need the, all the rest you can get. Now, look, I'm going over to the control room, and I'll give you a call when the test flight begins. <laughs> Here we are, Bob. Come right in. Uh, come in, all of you. Thanks. Sir. Well, that's a familiar sound, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's the beacon transmitter. Uh, Captain Knight's got it aboard his ship. He took off a few minutes ago. Orbiter 3, bearing 209, EV 12, altitude 50 miles. Hello, fellas. Great to see you again. You give it to old uh, I didn't see anything on the monitors. No, we hope you won't. You mean they can't pick up over to three? No, they're trying, but they haven't managed it so far. Well, the deflectors really are working. Yes, as you see, the monitor screens are reassuringly blank. 
This signal we're hearing, is it actually coming from a similar transmitter to the one you showed us? It's the same one. Ah. And as we're not using the normal radio, in case uh, Crown is listening, it's our only link with Orbital 3. Yes, I'm getting my bearings from the direction finders which are locked onto it. The bearing now is 208 EV14, altitude 55 plus. Uh, so when we plant the beacon aboard Kramer's ship, you'll be able to trace him just like this. And we hope so. Uh, if Kramer only knew what he's in for. That's something you must never know. This gadget changes the whole situation. Isn't there any chance of it being picked up on a normal receiver, sir? None at all. Altitude is up to 70. 70 miles plus. And still nothing on the screens. No interference either, thank goodness. Oh, by the time Kramer gets his transmitter going again, we ought to be safely aboard Orbiter X. Hold on. There's something coming up on the central monitor, sir. Yes. You're right, Brown. The small disturbance plumb in the sensor. It's a 208 EV17. The same bearing I'm getting from DF for Orbiter 3. And so the deflectors are not quite perfect. Hello? Yeah. You've seen it too. You can? Good. I'll call him straight back to base. Thank you. That was the electronics department. They're monitoring over there and they spotted the fault. They think they can correct it with a small adjustment. Oh, I hope they can. I hope so too. Uh, we'll order Captain Knight back right away. Oh. Well, I've got some rather interesting news for you as soon as you can leave the control room. Well, you can cross over into my office right away. I've seen all I need on the first test run. Uh, Knight's altitude is down to, uh, uh, what is it, Brown? A 55 plus, sir. Everything seems okay. He's coming in smoothly on the predicted landing course, and the screens are clear. Right. Well, give me a call if you want me. I shall be next door. Okay, sir. Uh, will you come this way, Sir Charles? Yes, I will. Uh, and uh, Britton and his team might come along, too. I'm sure they'll be equally interested in what I've got to say. Thank you, sir. In you come, gentlemen. Uh, thanks, now then, I thought you should know that the psychiatrist's been having a long talk with Captain Bradley. He says there's no doubt the man has been well indoctrinated by the unitists. The poor chap's thoroughly rattled. And as a result, he's given away his method of contacting unity headquarters. He has? What is yes. it, sir? It's very simple. He makes an apparently harmless telephone call on the radio telephone link. It doesn't matter who he calls, because at certain times, which we now know... The link is being monitored. Uh -huh. So he may ring, say, a, a Mr. Smith who keeps a garage in Alice Springs. He makes an apparently harmless inquiry about cars, but he uses a word code. Oh, yes. The person being called is entirely innocent, of course, but somewhere along the line, a unity agent is taking everything down and sorting out the real message. See. See, it's going to be difficult to find the agent. Right, but we don't want to find him at the moment. We want to use him, and we can use him because we know the code. Ah, you mean you'll get Bradley to send phony messages back to Unity? Not Bradley, but the security people have got hold of a pilot named King, whose voice sounds almost exactly like Bradley's on the phone. King? Yes. Now that you mention it, their voices are alike. Well, we think it's essential that they should be, because the agent may have been sent a record of Bradley speaking. Mm, that's true. Anyway, gentlemen... At this precise moment, Captain King is speaking on the radio telephone to an innocent shopkeeper in Alice Springs. He's given his name as Bradley, and he's inquiring about some books. What is he really saying? When his words are decoded, the message that the agent will get is this. Thank you. Orbiter 2 crashed, no survivors, no more ships taking off in foreseeable future. Ah. Well, I think that should make Kramer feel reasonably secure. Yes. And at the same time, it'll satisfy him that Bradley's doing his job. Ah, it's wonderful, because then Kramer won't feel he's got to hustle things along. And this is just the start. As a unity agent working for us, Captain Bradley, alias King, should be very useful. Yes, I think he should. Oh, excuse me, Colonel. The interference has suddenly started again. What? Oh, that's done it. Right, well, we'll come through to the control room in a minute. Right, sir. Oh, and uh, Captain Knight, he's just coming in to land now. Good. Well, Kramer's obviously got his main interference transmitter working again. So he'll be on his way back to Orbiter X any time now, Britain. Yes, we've got to beat him to it, sir. You have. Uh, take the midget transmitter now, Bob. Here it is. Right. The portable deflectors of the chariot will be put aboard the ship. Well, it looks as though we'll have to skip those adjustments to the ship's deflectors. Oh, no, you won't. They'll be carried out during refueling. 
This could turn out to be a race between you and Kramer, but you're not going to throw away your chances of success before you start. Order three coming in on number one platform, sir. Right. You better get down there as quick as you can, Bob. We'll feed the details of your course straight into the ship's automatic pilot. We'll take off as soon as the ground staff give us the all clear. Very good, sir. Okay, you're safe, Mac. You, Hickey? Yeah. Yes, I'm ready, Bob. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Off you go, then. The best of good luck. Be in charge. Don't be silly. It's your ship, old boy. You're the boss. One minute to zero. Control calling Orbiter 3. Check your stabilizers. Well, they're okay. Gyro's turning at 2,000 revs. Good. Orbiter 3 answering your control. Stabilizers correct. Gyro spinning, 2,000 revs. Steady. Right, Orbiter 3. Take your fuel taps and stage one compression. All correct. Hello, control. Taps open. Four picks compression. Rising. Zero minus 30. Nine tenths pressure in the combustion chambers. Temperature twelve hundred. Good. Hello, control. Compression nine tenths maximum. All jets firing. Hello, over the slave. Stand by for normal takeoff. There'll be no deviation from predicted course. Good luck. Thanks. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. We're lifting. Six. Five. Four. Three. Well, Chris, let's hope the deflectors are doing their job. Well, if they're not, we won't get any warning until it's too late, so why worry? Yes, why indeed. What's our position now, sir? We're flying over central China. The altitude's 954. We should rendezvous with Orbiter X just after we've crossed the Arctic Circle. Ah, jolly good. You know, I've been thinking, when the whole fleet is fitted with these deflectors, it could go straight in and wipe up the Unity Headquarters. And the rest of the world wouldn't be any the wiser. Yes, of course. But it all depends on whether we can plant the beacon aboard Kramer's ship. If we don't succeed, we won't know where the headquarters are. You chaps have got quite a responsibility. <laughs> we don't want to slip up. Uh, what would happen if we did, Bob? Well, that's what you mean. <laughs> now, that's painfully obvious. Now, what would happen at Woomera? Well, they'd go ahead and get the fleet armed and screened anyway. Then, if they don't hear from us, they'll probably come out and tackle the Unity ships in space. And that would really make Kramer go into action. Yes. He'd probably launch his general attack on the world. But our people couldn't sit back and wait for him to strike first. No. As Chris says, we've got quite a responsibility. Watch your altitude, Gelbin. Hold it steady at 900 miles until we pick up the space station components on the scanner. Steady at 900, Kramer. That's Earth Headquarters calling. All right, I take it. EHQ to Unity Ship 5. Are you receiving me? Yes, Unity 5 answering you, EHQ. The new interference transmitter is working well. Screening correct. You are covered from normal tracking monitors. Good. Keep checking. We will. And we have just had an intelligence report from J.B. Australia. Yes? What is it? It reads as follows. Orbiter 2 crash. No survivors. No more ships taking off in foreseeable future. Message 10. Thank you, EHQ. Understood. Captain Bradley appears to have made a promising start. Right? Yes. But he should have told us who was in Orbiter 2. Obviously, it was the repair squad who were put aboard by Colonel Kent. Quite. But I like to have names. Never mind. The information is useful. I know you were worried uh, that the Wumra people might let the apparent success of Kent's flight go to their heads. 
There is no danger of that happening now. Nevertheless, I shall keep sweeping with the radar scanner. Of course. That is a standing order. Look, Karma. The orbiter X components are coming up on the screen. Yes. Range 2,500. Right. You can call EHQ and order our assembly crews to take off. Very well. Unity 5 calling EHQ. Are you listening? EHQ answering you. Unity 5. You should have six escort ships lined up on the launching platforms. Check. Correct. Ships are ready for takeoff. Go ahead with launching procedure. Repeat. Go ahead with launching procedure. Rendezvous is Orbiter X. Thank you, Unity 5. We are going ahead. We shall have 40 men, wasn't it, in the total assembly crew, Gilbin? That is so, Grammar. I shall divide them into teams. Yes, We must work out a program of operations. To begin with, Britain will give us the main outline of the assembly work. I see. One team will be drafted to each section of the space station, and as the sections are completed, they can be welded together under my personal supervision. You mean you are going to remain on the job until it is finished? Yes. I don't think it would be wise to leave Captain Britain in charge. If he is still there... We assume he has survived, but we cannot be sure. Oh, yes. He will be waiting for us with his team. You're very certain. Hello? There's a small mark on the scanner near the bottom of the screen. Do you see it, Kramer? Yes. It's moving towards the components. Now it's fading. Ah, it, it must be the interference breaking through on the vision channel. Yes, it seems to appear. I must check on the circuit. I do that when we arrive. In the meantime, keep watching... I don't anticipate any trouble, Gelbin, but you never know. Orbiter X should be in a bearing TK75QX4. Can you see any signs of it on the screen yet, Bob? Hold on, I'll turn around. Uh, let's have a look. Yes, there are some marks. You can just see them through the interference pad. Ah, oh, they're the components, all right, Bob. Whole cluster of them. What's the lid? 350. You better start breaking, Chris. Okay, I'll start the inverters. Hold on. Over we go. I'll level off when our tail's pointing towards the target. Right, level off. You can start the compressors. Right. We can use the jets as brakes now. You think a nine-tenth burst should do the trick, Bob? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And again. Now I can see the component rockets through the observation windows. Look, there they are. Yes. The predictor boys know how to put a ship on target. I'll just maneuver alongside the big rocket in the middle of the cluster. That is the central workshops, isn't it? Yes, that's the one. Lovely, Chris. You can leave it at that. But we're still about a hundred yards away from the thing. I can get you closer. Oh, don't worry. Now oh, we'll step out here. A little trip in our spacesuits will do us good. Certainly. We got all that stuff? Yeah, all checked and ready. Beacon, midget transmitter, deflector set, all correct. Okay. All right, thanks for the ride, Chris. Safe journey back to Woomera. Thanks. Good luck, all of you. I hate leaving you like this, but... Hey! Hey, look at the screen. What? what? But there's something there. Uh, you can just yeah. see it through the interference pad. You're right, Bob. It's something solid. I can't make out what it is. We're not waiting. Not waiting to find out. It could be Kramer. Well, I mean, let's get going. Into the airlock quickly. It's closing in. Look sharp, fellows. Open the jets and get away as soon as we're out, Chris. Okay, Bob. And the best of luck. Close comments and localize your intercom. Uh, okay. You think that thing on the screen was Kramer's ship? I don't know. It was too far off to be able to say. It could well have been. Asher Zero, open the outer hatch. Be careful as you use your jet pistols. We must keep clear of one another. Okay? Come on, let's get out. Here we go. Over the edge. There's no time to panic now. No time to feel sick either. Remember to keep your legs still. Watch your target. There's the workshop target. Straight ahead. Why doesn't Chris open his jets and get away? He's afraid of 
catching us with the blast. We must move. There he goes. The jets are firing. You can probably identify that thing on the screen by now. If it is a unity ship, this will really put the deflectors to the test. Yes. They are better than the unity version. The game's up. Chris will have been spotted. I've lost sight of him now. Watch your target, Mac. They're drifting to your left. Ah. That's better. Only another 50 yards to go now. Oh, armor can't turn up now. Not when we're so close. I don't think about it. Concentrate all your attention on the rocket. You can see the hatch. It's a point to aim at. Watch your speed. But watch it. If you overshoot, it'll take more time to get back. Uh, you're right. More haste, less speed. We're doing fine. One short burst should be enough now. Fire in your own time. So here's a hatch. Grab hold. Now oh, we've made it. Talk about crash landing. Yes. Hold on to the handrail while I open the hatch. Right. Into the airlock quickly. All okay? Yeah. Yes, I'm closing up. Pressure's rising. Thank goodness everything's working. I can't wait to get into the ship and see if... See if there's anything coming alongside. Yeah, it's just like waiting for the Dutch's verdict. Yes. A verdict on the efficiency of the CSB deflectors. Pressure normal. Right. Here we go. Open your helmets. Turn up your intercom receivers. We might pick up something. <clears throat> well, glad to see the workshop is just as we left it. At least nobody's been aboard here. No, I don't think they have. Now, you two look out to port, and I'll watch through the starboard windows. Uh huh. I'll clear this side, Bob. Right. Hickey, turn on the generator and start the air conditioner. All right, okay. We want things to look as normal as possible. Now, I say, come over here quickly. Fine. What is it? A Unity ship. Yes, she's closing right in. You can read the number on the bars. Yeah, I can see it. U-5, it's Kramer's ship. Yes, that's right. He's stopping alongside. No signs of his hatch opening. Uh, doesn't seem to be in any hurry to deliver the verdict, does it? No. Whatever it is, we can only wait and see. Hello, Captain Burton. I hope you are listening. Here it comes. Okay. I'll turn on my intercom transmitter. Leave the talking to me. Now, perhaps this is a case where attack is the best defense. Yeah, maybe it is, Bob. Hello, Dr. Kramer. Yes, I'm listening. So you've come back, have you? What's the idea of leaving us stranded out here? Where have you been? Come aboard my ship immediately and no tricks, do you understand? You're the expert in playing tricks. You haven't answered my questions. It is I who will ask the questions. You've had your instructions. Carry them out. I want you here at once because you have quite a lot of explaining to do. Right, Mac. Right, Higgy. Well, this looks like it. Yeah, we must have been spotted. Yes, but we've still got a job to do. And if we cross to his ship, Unity 5, we can at least carry out the first part of it. We can plant the beacon. Yes, and you know, I ought to be the one to do it. Because you two will have to do most of the talking. Yeah, he's got something there, Bob. Yes. yes. While you're trying to explain that we really haven't been away from here at all, and Kramer must have been seeing a mirage, I'll have chance to hide the beacon. Okay, Higgy, here it is. Slip it into your pocket. Thanks, Bob. And don't forget to switch it on when you plant it in Kramer's cabin. Try and hide it somewhere behind the paneling. Okay. Captain Britton, we are waiting for you. I ordered you to come over immediately. Why the delay? All right, chaps. I'm switching on my helmet transmitter. Hello, Dr. Kramer. After leaving us in zero gravity so long, you can hardly expect us to move quickly. We've checked our pressure suits... We're preparing to enter the airlock now. Then hurry up. All right, fellas. I've cut the transmitter again. We can talk freely. Grab your jet pistols and we'll cross over. Okay. Uh, one point, Bob. Yes? What shall we do with the portable deflectors? Oh, it's as safe here as anywhere. It looks like a standard toolbox. 
And the units aren't likely to start taking it to pieces? No, I, I suppose not. Right. Close helmets and turn on intercom. And remember, from now on, Kramer will be able to hear us. So be careful what you say. Okay. Now, let's go then. Take care, Bob. The ship is pretty close. So we probably won't need to use our jet pistols to get across. Hello, Captain Britton. Yes, Kramer. You will not require jet pistols. You will leave them behind in the airlock. Very well. You say, sir. Our pressure zero, Mac. Right. The hatch of our airlock is open and ready for you. So I see. Oh, look at the earth down there. The sun's just coming up over the coast of Africa. Never mind Africa, Hickey. Just concentrate on that open hatch. Are you ready? Yes, ready. Then, over we go. All aboard, Unity 5. Into the airlock. Close up. Remember the first time we went through this with Team Pop? Yes, I'll say I do. A lot's happened since then. Yes, it has. Pressure normal. Helmets off. Okay, Mac. Open the hatch. So, you are here at last. Yes, Palmer. And to begin with, I think you owe us an explanation. What was the idea of leaving us stranded for a week? And there was trouble with our interference transmitter. We had to get back to Earth headquarters quickly. Now, you could have told us, couldn't you? We didn't consider it necessary at the time, did we, Gelbin? No. We had more urgent matters to think about. I see. Well, what sort of explanation do you expect from me? Can't you guess? No. My dear Breton, you're not really stupid. You know perfectly well what we want to talk to you about. I haven't the least idea. Then why do you think we're here? Look at the vision screen. What do you see? The component rockets of Orbiter X. Well? Well? We want a description of their contents and the method of assembly. Oh. Assembly? <laughs> do you find that amusing, McClellan? Uh, no. Zero G's got me, don't mind. You had better control yourself. Go on, Gilbin. Now then, Britain. If you look at the tracking screen, you will see we are not alone. We are, in fact, being joined by six more Unity ships. Yes, 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 I see them. They are carrying the assembly crews who will work with you on the space station. At the moment, they are forming up alongside us. When they are in position, you will give us all a general idea of the assembly program. Yes, all right. Now, what we say will be broadcast on restricted transmission to our other ships. So I want you to be brief and to the point. Okay. Um, how many men are there on each assembly crew? Six or seven. And as far as possible, we shall keep them together in teams. Yes, we can do that, all right. But with all these ships of yours so close to the Earth, surely they're bound to be seen? I know about your electronic screens, but what about visual observation, Kramer? There is no cause for alarm, Captain Britton. You see, our deflectors serve a dual purpose. To a limited extent, they affect radar reflections, and we use them in conjunction with the interference transmissions. But they also deflect light waves. Ah, so that's it. Yes. The effect is not apparent at close quarters, but I assure you that our ships are quite invisible from the Earth. Here, wait a minute. What about the Orbital X components? When we start moving them around... Want the people down there see that something's going on? No. The components will be fitted with deflectors, and as they are moved, their present positions will be taken by substitutes made of thin metal foil. Ah, so even when the station's assembled, it won't be seen from the ground? No. Your ground forces will have no idea that it has been assembled. Hello, Unity 5. This is Escort Commander calling Unity 5. The formation is now in position. Thank you, Escort Commander. Stand by for instructions. Right. Captain Britton, you can start by giving us a general picture of Orbiter X 
as it will look when it's assembled. That's all right. Well, it will take the form of a wheel 200 feet across. Yes. The hub in the middle will be joined to the rim by two spokes. And the inside of the rim, which will be... Laboratories, workshops, living accommodation, and so on. The main entrance will be in the hub, of course. Yes, the crew will go in through an airlock in the hub, and lifts will then carry them along inside the spokes and through to the different departments in the rim. I take it there's some provision for artificial gravity? Well, the people who are actually inside the rim will have the full benefit of that, because the whole station will revolve steadily around the hub. Yes, and while we're on the subject of movement, Britain, as the station is set in a near-polar orbit, it will continue to circle the Earth in slightly less than two hours, correct? Yes, that's true. And because the Earth itself is spinning, every part of its surface will be visible from the station every day, yes? Yes, as a matter of fact, our main telescope will be able to pick out objects no more than a foot apart from one another. Which shows just how important the station will be as an observation platform. Its assembly is, in fact, a vital step towards establishing our unity world government. Now, Britain... A preliminary word about the assembly. Well, at the moment, we're more or less in the middle of the cluster of rockets which contain the station components. Mm -hmm. Our job is to open them up, fit them together into the complete unit. And uh, where do we start? Well, as you see, each rocket has a number on it. Hmm. Number one, which is alongside us, houses the central workshops. Yeah. We should actually start on numbers two and three, because they make up the central hub of the station. Right. Escort commander, do you understand... Our first two teams will work on the hub. We understand, sir. At the same time, the other teams can work on the next four rockets, which make up the spokes. Good. After the hub and the spokes have been assembled, our entire working force should then concentrate on the next, um, 20 rockets. Right. They're carrying the plastic self-seeding material, which has to be blown up to form the rim of the wheel. Mm -hmm. It's rather like the inner tube of a motor car tire. Yeah, and the tread on the tire is made from the rockets themselves. I form a bumper against meteorites. Mm, yes, that's right. And to complete the picture, the remaining rockets in the cluster are carrying the solar generators, scientific equipment, and most of the gear that's needed for the research center and the space terminal. Excellent. There's just one other point. Yes? The men will travel between the rockets on small transporters, which we call space chariots. I see. But they'll actually steer the components into position with their ordinary jet pistols. Yes, I think that's about all. Thank you. The assembly crews will now leave their ships and report to the central workshops for more detailed instructions. Are there any questions? No, sir. We shall report to workshops immediately. Ah, yes. And don't forget, bring your own oxygen. <laughs> Hello, Hickey. <laughs> you seem very pleased with yourself, Hicks, eh? Well, as an ex-petty officer, I'm uh, rather looking forward to getting down to work. You are, are you? Yes, on the assembly teams. Ah, they don't know they've been born yet. <laughs> They're going to work harder and faster than they've ever worked in their lives. That's if you'll give me a free hand with them. What do you say, Dr. Kramer? We seem to have overlooked one of our friend's outstanding qualities. Yes, Hicks. Within reason, you have a free hand. But remember, we shall be watching you. All right, all right. But if you float around too much, I'll have you on the job as well. That's enough. Get into the airlock, all of you, and go back to the workshops. We shall follow. All right, Jeffs. Into the lock. Have you done the job, Hickey? Yes, I've planted the beacon. Good, good man. That <laughs> was a piece of cake. I only hope they'll hear the signals at Woomera. Report from number one landing platform, Colonel Kent. Yes? Captain Knight's coming straight along to the control room. Well, wasn't this mission successful? Well, he told the platform officer he thinks it was. Well, doesn't he know? Apparently, he put Captain Britton and the others off close to Orbiter X, but he had to get away quickly. If anything's gone wrong, Sir Charles, I won't forgive myself for sending those fellows back. No. Petra should have followed a more orthodox line of her attack. But if we came out into the open, this man Kramer would certainly be driven to action. Yes, he'd start his campaign right away. What are the latest observatory reports on Orbiter X? Negative, sir. There's no signs of any intruders out there. And yet the interference transmissions are going on? Yes, yeah, they are. So these unity people are obviously screening some monkey business. Sir Charles, 
If Britain has put the beacon aboard Kramer's ship, and if we're able to track the signals back to the Earth and find the location of the Unity headquarters, what then? Well, the headquarters must be in somebody's country, so officially we should bring the matter to the attention of the United Nations. Ah, and again, Kramer would be in action. He'd be launching missiles on the world before the first debate even started. I rather imagine he would. So what's the answer? Uh, unofficially. We have missiles of our own, of course. Uh, that's what I was thinking. But a small mobile force of experienced troops could be dropped into the headquarters, and they might be more effective in destroying the unity organization. You see, they could probably find a list of the members. Members who are working in different parts of the world, perhaps. From Russia to America and, and the Commonwealth itself. That's true, yes. Carol Kent, the beacon signals are coming through. What? what? Yes. Listen. This is magnificent. Yes. Get the direction finders onto them right away. So Captain Britain's really pulled it off. Yes, and he hasn't wasted much time. According to DF, Colonel, the signals are coming from Orbiter X. But there's nothing to be seen out there. That means the Unity ships have got visual screen. Yes, and it explains why Captain might have come back fast. He could only just have got to the space station ahead of Karma. Well, it proves a most important point, Jack. Our deflectors really work. Yes, they do. If they weren't 100% effective, Karma would have spotted night ship and it wouldn't be back here now. We wouldn't be hearing these signals, oh, either. Right you are. So when our whole fleet is fitted out with them, we really shall be able to go into action. And for the first time, the element of surprise will be on our side. Worried. What's wrong? Uh, plenty. Is anybody else here in the workshop? No, just the three of us. Good. Gelbin has just told me that Kramer and his ship are going to stay put right here until Orbiter X is complete. Oh, no. So the beacon will go on using up its batteries and sending out DF signals that won't get our ground boys anywhere. Oh. By the time Kramer does fly back to his headquarters, batteries will be exhausted. Well, can't we think of some excuse for getting him to go back now? Yeah, there must be something we can do. Oh, yes, I think there is. We've got to get the beacon out of Unity 5 and transfer it to one of the other ships. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, you see, they seem to take it in turn to go back to their headquarters and collect supplies. Yeah, that's right. I'm almost certain Unity 7 is probably the next one to make the trip. And when it does, it's going to take the beacon with it. So I've got to get aboard Kramer's ship and pick it up, right? Yes. Uh, you know where you left it? Yes, yeah, Sure. I lodged it behind the panelling in one of the lockers. Good. Can you get it out fairly easily? I don't know. I'll try. Okay, now I'll tell you what we'll do. I want to move fast because Kramer's alone on the ship at the moment. I'll come over with you, Hickey. Uh, we can make the excuse that we want to give him a progress report on Orbiter X. Yeah. I'll give him some guff about the way the components are being moved around. And while I'm holding his attention, it's up to you to do your stuff. All right. I'll have a go. Good. But whatever you do, don't let him catch you out. If that happens, you'll cotton on to the whole plan. You might even launch an attack on Woomera. You understand? Yes, I say I do. Can I come with you, Bob? No, I think two of us is enough, Mac. If we all go, Kramer might be suspicious. We don't want to strain his confidence too far. As it is, Hickey and I might just about get away with it. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Captain Britain. But in future, you will make proper arrangements before boarding my ship. Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Carter. And come alone next time. Uh, yes. I only brought Hicks along because he's so much in contact with the assembly teams. Yes, that's right. I'm afraid they're getting a bit careless. Oh? What do you mean? Uh, well, the, the thing is, um, if the components are moved into position too fast, you can't always stop them at the right moment. It's the old business of inertia, you know. Go on. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, the, the truth is, you see, the, the men have been pushing the stuff around much too fast. And the central hub of the station has taken some very hefty knocks on the spokes before they were locked into position. Was there any damage? Uh, no, not a lot, but if this sort of thing goes on... All right, all right. I, I'll speak to the teams myself. Yeah, we would appreciate it. But if you could just uh, come over here and... Look at the central monitor now. You, you'll see two teams bringing a couple of sections of the rim together. You, you may see the sort of thing that happens. Yes, 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 quite. I understand. Of course, it's... 
But it's pretty uncomfortable working inside pressure suits, you know. I mean, for hours on end. So, so I, I can't altogether blame the men when they when they do misjudge their, their speed and distances. Mm. They are taking things steadily enough at the moment. Yes. Yeah, yes, I, I'm glad to see they are. We'll watch them here. What's happening? Uh, it's all right, don't worry. Hicks, what are you doing at that locker? Uh, the door was open, I just brushed against it. Come away! What have you got in your hands? Yeah, turn it up. Here, 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 what is it? Let me see. Pigeon, stand aside. Now, Hicks, show me what you've got there. What are you getting at, Cromer? Do you think I'm a thief? No, no, take it easy, Hickey. Get out of the way, Captain Britton. Hicks, I order you to let me see your hands. Now, look here, I don't like being accused. Do as I say. All right. There you are. I've got nothing. Hmm? I hope you're satisfied. I shall examine the locker. Oh, go ahead. If you think there's anything missing, you're wrong. Very well. Everything seems to be there. Of course it is. Now get out! Okay. And you, Britain, you can come back with your report. And come back alone. All right, I'll do that. I better get into the airlock, did you? Okay, Bob. Give it, give me half of that, chum. Did you get the thing? Yes, but the case sprang open. I had to let it go. It slipped behind the panelling. There isn't a hope of getting it now. No. Anyway, I'm afraid the beacon's probably busted. Forgive me bursting in on you like this, Sir Charles, but I've got some unpleasant news for you. Oh? Well, what is it, Kent? Well, I'm sorry to say the beacon transmissions have finally stopped. Oh. That's bad. I suppose the batteries have run out. Well, they shouldn't have yet. No, I... I think the gadget must have developed a fault. It could have been knocked. Uh, anything could have happened. You don't think Cromer may have discovered it, do you? No. We would almost certainly have been in serious trouble. Cromer's no fool. If he'd found the beacon, he would very quickly have put two and two together. He'd have realized that we were after him. I've no doubt at all he would have taken violent countermeasures right away. Yes, I'm sure he would. So we can assume that Bob Britton and his chaps are still safe. Yes, I think so. I hope you're right. And assuming you are, all we can do now is to wait until they send the signal that the space station is complete. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. You know, things have a habit of going wrong. Uh -huh. We... Hope that the beacon will give us the location of Unity Headquarters, but Kramer has obviously stayed with Orbiter X. Now, in the same way, there might be a hold-up in the next part of our plan. We might uh, never get the signal from Bob. So, you'd like to fly out to Orbiter X and see what's going on, is that it? <sighs> Why, uh, yes. Uh, how did you know? <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I do have ideas on my own occasionally, and this one had occurred to me. Well, what do you say? My ship will be perfectly screened by the deflectors, and I shall be able to see exactly what's going on up there. With a bit of luck, I might even manage to shadow one of the Unity ships back to its headquarters. It's a nice idea, Kent, but far too risky. You said yourself that things have a habit of going wrong. And if the Unity spotted you, we really would be in trouble. But, uh, no, we are not sending up any ships until the whole fleet has been fitted out. Not only with deflectors, but with armaments as well. How's the work going, by the way? Well, it should be finished within a week. There you are. After that, we can put a complete task force into space. It could go up, destroy any unity ships in its way, and take over the station. The trouble is, of course, a plan like this might be disastrous for Bob Britton and his team. Yes, it might well be. But I think we shall be hearing from them fairly soon. Although we can't see anything going on out there, I'm ready to take a bet that the station's almost complete. Well... There must be some very clever camouflage. Yes, and behind that camouflage, Orbiter X is growing. We must give our chaps time to let us know when it's finished, and time for them to get aboard their chariot and cross to Orbiter 1. Then we'll pick them up as arranged, and after that we can get busy on Mr. Kramer. But what if we don't get the signal from Britain? You know, there are times when you depress me, Kent. All right, we'll give him another week. If we haven't heard from him by then, I shall have to seek permission to launch the attack. Chaps, what do you think of our space station now? It's more or less complete. Oh, I can't say I feel very happy about it, Bob. Neither can I. It's 
Gives me a funny sort of feeling standing here quietly in the control room. Right inside the rim of Orbiter X. It's a bit lonely, isn't it? Yes, I know. This is going to be quite an occasion when the job was completed. Yes, quite a victory day celebration with worldwide radio and television hookups and ships coming and going with VIPs. Yeah, those are a good standard job. <laughs> That's true <laughs> enough. Now think of the headlines. The completion of Orbiter X. Man's first step to the stars. The Commonwealth Space Station opens its airlocks to the astronauts of the world. I don't think. Uh, still, I suppose we mustn't be depressed. Our boys aren't going to let the Unity people stay here. You can bet your life on that. Ah, uh, sure. Tell me, Bob, when are you going to switch on that pocket transmitter of yours and let the boys at home know that the station's all ready to be taken over? Well, all in good time, Mac. Hold on. Orbiter X Control, Britain speaking. Hello, Britain. This is Commander Gelvin. Yes, Gelvin. You'll be pleased to know that Dr. Kramer is interested in that little matter we discussed. We shall be moving very shortly. You know what to do? Yes, okay. Thank you. Well, what's that all about? Yes, what have you been talking to Gelvin about, Bob? Uh, don't worry. It simply means that the time has come for us to get out of here. You've got a chariot standing by outside the station airlock, haven't you? Yeah, and I've worked out the navigation. Orbiter One's course is converging with ours right now. If we can get away on the chariot quickly, the crossing shouldn't be too bad. Ah, oh, that's fine. And but watch this business you've got with Gelbin. I, I don't understand it. Ah, you will. Come on, let's step on the lift and make that daring little trip up the spoke to the central hub. Oh, come on. Ah, here we go, then. Uh, all aboard for the tunnel of love. <laughs> Hold on. Here. Yeah. I must say, this would be a riot at Blackpool. <laughs> you feel as if you're falling, don't you? Yeah, that's because the artificial gravity decreases as we move further away from the rim. When we arrive at the hub, we'll be weightless again. So, switch on your magnet. Okay. Right, chaps. Prepare to get into the airlock. Now, have you got everything you need? Uh, no, not quite, no. I hit the deflector set away with some stores here. Now, it must be somewhere around here. You got it? Ah, yes. Good. Now, you know what to do. You board the chariot and start collecting some of the debris left over from the assembly work. The unitists will think you're doing your normal job, but all the time you'll be moving further away. Then, when you think it's safe, you switch on the deflector and head out for Orbiter 1 as fast as you can. Yeah, but what about the signal getting back to Omaha? Ah, uh, don't you worry. I'll see to that, all right. But you're talking as if you weren't coming with us. Well, as a matter of fact, chaps, I'm not. What? Are you serious, Bob? Absolutely. You see, I've got... Listen. Crumb and are coming up in the other lift. I've got to talk fast. I must get my transmitter onto their ship. When I do, it'll act as another beacon. And Woomera should be able to locate Unity headquarters at last. And how the dickens are you going to get it aboard the ship? At any moment, Kramer and Kelvin might be leaving for their headquarters. They are. They're leaving right now. And believe it or not, Mac, they've agreed to take me with them. What? Okay, don't forget to take the deflector box with you. You'll need it to screen the chariot. Okay, Bob. What are McLaren and Hicks doing here, Britain? There is no question of them coming with us. No, of course not, Kramer. They've, they've got some work to do outside. Oh, and what precisely is this work, Hicks? <sighs> ah, well, there's a lot of stuff left over from the assembly job. You know, bits and pieces floating all over the place. We're just going to trot around with one of the chariots and pick them all up. Very well. And after that, we will report to Captain Holtz for further instructions. He will be in charge while we are away. And I may add, he will be keeping an eye on you. Ah, protection, eh? Yes, what about that, Kramer? I take it you're leaving some guard ships with Orbiter X? Yes. One ship will remain here on duty. The remainder will return with us to headquarters to collect cargo. What sort of cargo? Armaments and equipment for the station. And as Captain Britton knows its construction so well, I agree that he should help us with the selection of the gear. Now, open the airlock. In you go. If you men are going to the space chariots, you'd better come too. Okay. We're leaving now, are we, Gavin? Yes, Britain. We're crossing to our ship right away. Close your helmets and shut the inner hatch. Okay. Check helmet intercom, Gelvin. Right. All correct. Everything okay, fellas? Yeah. Okay, Bob. Now, open the air valve. 
Oh, I see you are taking a box with you, Hicks. What's inside it, may I ask? Sandwiches. What? Tools, of course. You never catch me riding a chariot without them. We must look into that. What's that? The chariots should be more reliable. Ah, yes. Yes, of course they should. Still, they were only meant for pottering around on. Quite. Treasures, Zero. Open the outer hatch, Britain. Right. How's the interference, Devil Brown? Just the sign, sir. And still nothing on the special sound channel? No, not a thing. Any news, anybody? Oh, you, Captain Nice. No, I'm afraid there's nothing to report. That ship of yours was just about to be taking root out there on the launching platform. Yes, it has been ready for takeoff for rather a long time. In fact, the, <laughs> the ground staff are talking about planting a few creepers around it. <laughs> if, uh, do you think we shall ever get the call-up signal from Bob, Colonel Kent? Well, I think so, but the minister seems to have given up hope. He's actually gone into Canberra to discuss a new plan of action. Well, something big, do you mean? Yes. You see, the whole fleet is now fitted out with arms and deflectors, and it will give a pretty good account of itself. I'll say it could. And with the new radio equipment, our transmitters can be heard over the interference without the units being any the wiser. So the element of surprise will be completely on our side. Colonel Kent, listen. There's something coming through on the special channel. Huh? By George, yes, at last. The signal we've been waiting for. Brown, make sure the direction finders get onto it right away. Okay, Colonel. Hello, VF. Check transmission on special channel, please. Urgent. So this is Bob's signal. Yes, and you know what it means. Orbiter X is complete and the boys are crossing over to Orbiter 1. Can I have permission to take off and pick them up, sir? In just a moment. We'll check the origin first. Direction finders say the transmission is definitely coming from Orbiter X, sir. Good. You can get down to the launching platform, Captain Knight. Thank you. I'm on my way. Hold it. One second, Chris. Why? What's wrong? The transmitter sending this signal is moving. Well, so is Orbiter X. Yes, but it's moving away from Orbiter X. What? The F are feeding a tracking chart through to it now, sir. Look, it's coming up on the central monitor. Yes, I see. What do you make of it, sir? Well, I think I know what's happened. Yes. Bob must have realized that the original beacon he put on the Kramer's ship had packed up. So he's replaced it with the pocket transmitter. Then we are actually watching the track of Kramer's ship right now. Yes. You mean we can follow it right down to his HQ and find exactly where the location is? Yes, the whole situation has suddenly turned in our favor. Brown, get a line to Canberra for me straight away. I must tell the minister about this before he goes into his conference. All right, sir. Captain Knight, you're in business after all. Go ahead and take off for Orbiter One. The sooner you bring those boys back here, the better. And don't forget to keep in constant radio touch on the special channel. I want to know exactly what's happening all the time. Well, we're clear of the space station, Hickey, old boy. If my navigation's right, we ought to pick up Orbiter 1 on bearing ZN-74 TK-5. Anyway, concentrate your radar sweep in that area. Okay, Mac, but the interference is all over the screen. We won't be able to see anything much until we're practically on top uh, of it. Can't be helped. We'll just keep to our course, hope for the best. <laughs> this reminds me of the time we used a chariot to get aboard Orbiter 2. <laughs> Bob was with us then. Yes, I remember. You said it was a pity we couldn't have a picture of ourselves. <laughs> Three little men in spacesuits and sitting on a sort of flying car chassis with a couple of tiddly little jets stuck on the back. And now there's only two little men. Ah, uh, well, we haven't finished with Kramer yet. We haven't started, you wait. If Bob's plan works and CSP finds Unity headquarters, my bet is Kramer's had it. Yes, and I reckon you're right. And if we can get back to Woman and tell Colonel Kent that there's only one guard ship on duty of on Orbiter X... The CSP fleet can come out and take it over without too much trouble. It should be a piece of cake. I don't think that Unity fellow, uh, what's his name, Captain Holtz, can be a very bright spark. Well, we gave him the slip, all right. And I suppose he didn't have a chance of tracking us when we turned on the deflector set. Uh, he's probably written us off as uh, lost in space. <laughs> I don't suppose he's going into mourning. Hey, I'll it. say, look, Mac, there's something on the screen. Look, oh, yeah. a couple of blips. 
You can just see them between the interference ripples. I uh, Moving uh, towards one another. Yes, uh, I see them. Uh, yep. Orbital one in the relief ship. It, they can't be anything else. Open the jets, Hickey. Right. Give them full boost. There's no speed limit here, my boy. Hello, CSP. This is Orbiter 3 calling CSP Woomera. Are you receiving me? Come in, please. CSP, answering you, Orbiter 3. Yes, we are receiving you. Your new transmitter is loud and clear. Good. Colonel Kent, I've reached the rendezvous and two men aboard a space chariot are coming alongside my airlock. Only two? Yes, I haven't been able to identify them yet. They've now entered the lock. We'll be through into the cabin in a moment. Stand by, please. Standing by. Keep your transmitter switched on. Right, sir, I will. Here they come. It's, it's Mac and, and Hickey. Welcome aboard, fellow. Chris, hello. Uh, uh, good to see you, sir. Oh, it's good to see you. Colonel Kent's listening on the radio. Hello, Mac. Hello, Hickey. Once again, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. I didn't expect to hear you. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. What's happened to Bob? He's aboard Kramer's ship. He's what? I say, it's quite safe to talk on the radio. I mean, can't the unit is here? No, 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 don't worry. We've got a new system of transmission. I don't understand the technical details, but it works on the same principle as the pocket transmitter that Bob's using. Ah, so you know all about that. Yes. You see, the, the DF boys at Woomera are getting his signal all right, but uh, we never guessed he was on the transmitting end himself. Why, why didn't he come with you? I'm afraid it wasn't possible. He knew the ship would get underway as soon as he went aboard. Uh, Colonel Kent, I want you to know that Bob knew what the consequences might be for himself. But that didn't stop him going ahead. Just what I would have expected of him, Mac. A very fine action. It looks like succeeding. Our direction finders are following the ship down into the atmosphere now. It made one complete circuit of the Earth... And if it follows its present course, it will land uh, somewhere in South America. South America? I'll be wondering if the headquarters might be there after we took off in Kramer's moonship. We hope to be able to pinpoint the HQ quite soon. That's marvelous. Matt, we take it that Orbiter X is completely assembled. Is that right? Yes, I should have told you. There's only one guard ship with it, sir. And if you can send up a task force quickly... This is the time to take it over. Thank you. That is most important information. Is there anything else you have to report immediately? Well, I've an idea that would involve Captain Knight. I, I don't know how you feel about this, Chris. What is it, Mac? Well, although we don't know where the Unity headquarters are just yet, Hickey and I have been there, and we know the layout pretty well. Yes, we do, and I think I know what you're going to say, Mac. One CSP tell us the exact location. I was wondering if Chris would land us somewhere in the area. Yes, that's it. The country is mountainous. We could probably touch down within ten miles of the HQ without being spotted. Exactly. And you and I could then make our way to the headquarters and get in through the back door. Do you remember how Kramer brought us out through those tunnels? Yes, of course. We're going by the same route. And with a bit of luck, we'd find Bob and bring him back to the ship. What do you say, Chris? Well, I'm for it, but there is one point. After we land, I'll come to the headquarters with you. Colonel Kent, did you hear all that? Yes. And I may say that our conversation is being placed through the Canberra, where a special committee is also listening. I am consulting the minister now. Oh, I'd have put on my telephone voice if I'd known. Oh, I hope I haven't mucked up our chances. No, no, it's a great idea, Mac. And after we've landed, we can use the rotorcycles. Motorcycles? No, you clot. Rotorcycle. Oh, yes, yes. You know, the one-man helicopter. Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple on board. They're part of the new issue to all ships now in case of emergency landings in out-of-the-way places. Well, there you are. That's just the job. Hello, Orbiter 3. Max, your suggestion has been accepted. Thank you, sir. Good old. But you will check with me before landing. And Captain Knight must remain with the ship. Is that clear? As you say, sir. Very well. Our direction finders indicate that Kramer's ship is now preparing to land. I will give you its position and the course you must follow. 
stand by. You seem very interested in our destination, Captain Britton. Well, obviously. I guess that your headquarters might be in South America, but I, I still can't see exactly where you're heading. We are heading towards the small republic of Kazala. Kazala? Oh, so that's it. Yes. When I founded the Unity Organization, I realized that I should have to establish my headquarters in a small country whose government would be prepared to cooperate with me. I approached the president of Kazala and explained the position. Weren't you taking rather a chance? No. I knew my man, and I knew he valued his life. Also, he was interested in the fact that power no longer depends on the size of a country's population. With the help of science, a small country can lead the whole world. Check your safety straps. I am about to open the retro jets for the touchdown. Good. We are over Kazala now, Britain. As you see, it's almost entirely mountains and jungle. Yes. Perfect camouflage for the Unity Headquarters. The headquarters are immediately below us. You can see the landing zone. THQ calling Unity 5. You are now on the approach speed. We are taking over your controls for landing. Thank you, THQ. Over to you. A landing routine is now carried out entirely from the ground. I can't see much down there. No. The headquarters are mostly below ground. Only a few buildings are visible from the air. They're well camouflaged. We have no wish to draw attention to ourselves. What about the local population? There were a few Indians there, but they have been moved away. Prepare for touchdown! We'll go into the information room. Ah, Dr. Kramer, Commander Gerfin. I am glad to see you back at last. In you go, Britain. And you have Captain Britain with you. Yes. Through here I see Dr. Ravel. Of course. As you know, Britain has been of some help to us. He may join the organization, subject to test, of course. Oh, I see. Have you been in touch with Moonbase? Yes, all is well. But all is not well at the headquarters of the Commonwealth Space Project. What's happened? It looks as if Captain Bradley has defected. What? The contact warned us about him in the last signal from Australia. He said that he would call back with more information, but we've heard nothing. I've had a monitoring service working for the past 24 hours, but there's still no word. I'm afraid the contact may have been picked up by the Australian security people. Here, what do you mean by... Bradley defecting. Where is he? Don't ask too many questions, Britain. It might be unwise at this stage. Hello? Information room? This is the senior maintenance officer. Is uh, Dr. Kramer there? Yes, I am. I am speaking from your ship on the landing platform, sir. We have this moment discovered an unusual piece of electronic equipment inside a locker in the control cabin. Well, what is it? Difficult to say until we have examined it in detail. It seems to be some sort of radio set, but we cannot measure any transmissions from it. Perhaps, sir, you could tell me what this thing is. Hmm, this seems extraordinary, Gilbin. Did we have any experimental gear on board? No, nothing like that. There must be some mistake. Nevertheless, we must check. Hello, maintenance? Yes, sir. We will come over and check this equipment right away. Come along, Gilbin. And you, Britain... You will stay right here until we return. CFP, Boomer calling Orbiter 3. Orbiter 3 answering you, CSP. Listen carefully. Our direction finders have now tracked the beacon transmission to Earth. Kramer's ship has landed in the small South American Republic of Kazala. The bearings of his HQ from your position are QJ54TX9. Repeat, please. 
UJ54TX9. Mark that on the chart, Mac. Okay. You will see from the chart that the location is well concealed by the natural contours of the country. Yes, it is too. Yes, there seem to be mountain ranges all around it. I suggest that you land in the region of Mount Cassis. Will you check that, please? Mount Cassis. Uh, yes, I've got it. About 18 miles southeast of Unity Headquarters. Can you make a landing on the flat ground to the north, Chris? Hmm, I should think so. According to the chart, sir, it looks pretty deserted. Good. Now, listen. When you reach the headquarters, your first consideration will be for Captain Britain. Next, you will obtain such information as you can about the Unity organization. If possible, get a list of members. Finally, you will carry out sabotage to the best of your ability. Understood, sir. Right. Go in and land. Good luck, Officer 3. <laughs> Bob, tell me, have you any idea what it is they have discovered on a ship? Yes. Yes, I know only too well. Well, what do you mean? What is it? Greta, I'm afraid I'm in trouble. You helped me the last time I was here with Mac and Hickey. I shouldn't have done it, but I couldn't help remembering our student days. <laughs> you never noticed me very much, but I never forgot you, Bob. And I'm not going to forget you. That's why I'll tell you about this thing they found on the ship. It's a radio transmitter. What? Yes, I used it as a radio beacon. My people at CSP will have been listening for it, and they'll have tracked it right here. But the interference... It makes no difference. The transmissions bypass it. Unity's finished, Greta. You must get away before it's too late. You don't know what you're saying. Yes, I, I know very well what I'm saying. There's a good possibility that these headquarters will be blown sky high. You must go while you can. You really are serious, aren't you? Yes, I am. And what does I tell Kramer what you just told me? <laughs> It doesn't matter. As soon as he sees the transmitter, he won't need to be told what's happened. He'll know. And do you know the penalty you'll pay for this? I've got a pretty good idea. You're very calm about it. Well, there's not much I can do. I can't get away. Oh, you stupid idiot. You've no excuse for this. No, none at all. Oh, then why did you... Just... There he is, the treacherous dog! What have you got to say for yourself, Britain? What about? You know perfectly well. Who gave you the transmitter? I have nothing to say. Leave him to me, Karma. I know how to deal with traitors. Traitors? I've never become a member of your foul organization. That's enough. One moment, Gelbin. Captain Britain, you have tried to play a double game. But as far as you are concerned, it is all over. I fully realize that. I, I thought you might. So I want you to know the full measure of your achievement as it affects your friends in the Commonwealth Space Project. You see... You have not only tricked us, but them as well, because you have brought about their total annihilation. What the blazes do you mean? You know quite well that all my plans are aimed at a unity world government. Nothing can stand in my way. Gelvin, go ahead and mobilize the attack. Right, Kramer. Hello, defense section. This is Deputy Leader Gelvin. I have orders for immediate mobilization of ballistic missiles. Prepare for launchings. Call up atomic detonators. See that the warheads are fitted with all speed. Your first target will be Woomera. And Gelbin, the battery must be firing within 15 minutes. It will be. I hope you're satisfied, Britain. You can't do this. You must countermand those orders. He is right, Dr. Kramer. Ramel, I advise you to be careful what you say. Dr. Kramer, I have just been handed a signal which might give Captain Britain some cause for reflection with regard to his own immediate future. Yes? It actually comes from our commander on Orbiter X. Here it is. McClelland and Hicks lost in space, presumed dead. Well, well. Presumably they were involved in your treachery, Britain. This is their just reward. Now it's for us to see that you receive equal justice. Gilbin, have him taken away. Uh, that's 
getting too dark to see very much now, Mac. Now, that's the headquarters, all right. Like an enormous stadium cut into the mountains. Yeah, and there seems to be something going on way over on the far side. There's a whole gang of people working under those lights, but I don't know what they're up to. Uh, whatever it is, it leaves the coast clear for us. We'd better dump the motorcycles here. Uh, Hide them between the rocks. All right, okay, mate. Oh, that's it. Now, if we skirt round the foot of the cliffs, we ought to come to that small entrance. The one Kramer brought us out of when we went on the moon trip. Yes, that's right. Now, let's get going. Before we do, I'll just put through a radio call to Chris Knight. Uh, do you think it's safe to use the intercom, Mac? Yeah, he told us it's a new type that can be picked up on the unity receivers. Well, the poor chap sitting and waiting for us in the ship, about 20 miles away from all the fun, at least we can do is to keep him in the picture. Yeah, uh, this is your idea of fun, is it? Why did I leave the Navy? Okay, go on, have a word with him. I'll mm-hmm. keep lookout. Right, here we go. Hello, this is McClellan calling Orbiter 3. Chris, are you listening? Hello, Mac. Yes, I'll say I'm listening. Is everything okay? Yes, we've reached Unity Headquarters. We're outside at the moment. The problem is to get into the admin and control department. We could take a chance and go through the hangar. It's a big cave about twice the size of St. Paul's. But we're going to look for a little side entrance we used before. That would be safer. I hope you find it all right. Now listen, I've just had a call from Colonel Kent in Moomera. He says the DF signals from Bob's transmitter have stopped. Stopped? Yes. He thinks the transmitter may have been found. Bob will be in trouble if it has. Exactly. There's one other thing the colonel told me. No? The big job is due to start in about ten minutes. Okay. I understand. Thanks, Chris. Be seeing you. Uh, you know what he means by the big job, he did. Yes, the attack on Orbiter X, I suppose. I only hope our boys can take over in one piece. Uh-huh. Anyway, our big job is to find Bob. We'll start moving along the cliff. That entrance can't be far away. I have an idea it's pretty close. We'd better be careful when we get round that next bend. Yeah, go steady. Hey, Mac, I believe those people over by the lights are working on some sort of launching ramp. I think you're right. And listen, there's a door opening. Yeah, and it's the one we're looking for. Ah, somebody's coming. Couple of guards, eh? Yeah, come on. We're in luck. Through the door quickly. And with a bit more luck, we'll give Mr. Karma the surprise of his life. In we go. <laughs> Tunnels are a bit of a maze. But uh, isn't that the old glass house department right ahead? Yeah, and if Bob has come unstuck, this is where we might find him. If he's not here, we'll make our way up to Kramer's office. Look out! Who's that at the end of the corridor? It's Greater Ravel. She's looking into the cells. Ah, uh, so that's her. Uh... Yeah, she helped Bob and me out the last time we were here. He might help us again. Yes, that's an idea. Gonna take a chance, Hickey. Uh, oh, here she comes. Hello, Dr. Rebecca. <gasps> Do you remember me? Oh, Captain McClellan. I can't believe it. And and this man with you? Flight engineer Hicks. But Kramer had a message from Orbiter X. They said you were lost. Yeah, that's what we meant them to think. But we're here, all right. How, how did you get here? I'll tell you about that later. Who were you... Looking for Greta? I, uh, I was looking for Bob. Oh, he is down here, is he? Yes, but I don't know which Matt, time. Matt, Matt, found him. What? Over here. I look through the peephole in this door. There he is. There's something wrong. Here yeah, is hurt. Quickly open up. Uh, it's locked. All right, I have a pass key. Give it to me. In you go. Bob, wake up. Uh, it, it's Mac. What? Uh, who is that? It's Mac. Mac? Yeah, uh, is here too. Uh, what happened to you? I, I, I had a bit of a tussle with the guards, but uh, how did you get here? We got away from Orbiter X just as we planned. Chris Knight picked us up, 
And your transmitter told us where you were. Oh, so it worked. Yeah, yeah. Chris flew us to within 20 miles of HQ, yeah? and we finished the journey by rotor cycle. Oh. He's waiting for us to take you back to the ship now. If Kram knew this, he'd go mad. Yeah, I'm sure he would. What are you doing here? My head's, my head's clearing. Here's what I remember. Kram is, Kram is going to start his attack. What? He, he's preparing to launch missiles against Wuma. Uh, that's only to be the first target. He must be stopped. Greta, do you know about this? Yes. Then why didn't you tell us before? Because there's nothing you can do. We'll see about that. We must go up to the control room. Kramer and Galvin are sure to be there. Kramer is. But Galvin is out on the launching platform. Now, listen to me. I've got all this worked out. You see, Kramer was always determined that if ever he was forced to leave this place, it would never fall into anybody else's hands. Go on. So he built demolition charges into the walls of the hangar and the generating hall. Uh, what? If they can be set off by a master switch, and I know where it is. You do? This is the answer. By cutting the power, I can make the machinery on the launching platform useless. And there need be no loss of life because the alarm bells will ring a minute before the charges explode. Oh, that's all right, but surely when the staff hear the alarm... That they'll know what's happening and turn off the switch. No, apart from myself, only Kramer and Galbin know where to find it. And Galbin could never reach it in time from the platform. What about Kramer? Yeah. Couldn't he get to it from the control room? Yeah, I think he could. Okay, then we'll see that he doesn't. Now, where is this master switch, Gertrude? Out in the hangar. I'd like you to go with her, Mac. I'll take Hickey with me. All right. Where shall we meet after the balloon goes up? Uh, what about the entrance we came in by just now? Yeah, yeah. Do you know the small entrance in the cliff, Grater? Yes, I know it. Will it still be there after the explosion? Yes. Right then, that's our meeting point. I don't know how long we've got before the unity attack starts, but we'd better get going. Okay. All right, let's start. I've just remembered, Bob. Colonel Kent asked if we could get a list of the members of unity if it was humanly possible. Well, what about that, Grater? Can you help? Yes, you You'll find a list in Kramer's office next to the control room. Ah, oh, that's fine. We might just manage to get hold of it before the alarm goes. Is it all clear in the corridor, Hickey? Just a sec. It's all clear. Good. Off we go. You turn to the right, Bob. Captain McClellan, and I go to the left. Okay. We'll see you both later. Good luck. And thank you, Greta. Good luck, Bob. Come along, Mac, this way. Quick. You're really doing this for Bob, aren't you, Greta? I suppose I am in a way, but during the past months I've learned a great deal about unity that I didn't know before. It beats me how you ever fell for it in the first place. No, you wouldn't understand. You grew up in a very different world from mine. To me, unity seemed to be the answer to everything. Now I've discovered the truth. Well, what are you going to do with yourself when you get away from here? Oh, I haven't thought about it. Perhaps I won't get away. Ah, uh, you will. We'll see to it. Now, quietly. Here's the safety door of the hangar. You better keep back when I open it, in case we run into somebody on the other side. Okay. All clear. You can come through. Uh, that door ought to keep back the blast of the explosion. Oh, I say. It looks as if the whole unity fleet is in here. Yes, except for one ship on duty at Orbiter X. And one outside on the launching platform. Yeah, it was getting dark when we came in. I, I didn't see it. Oh, it's of no importance. It's Kramer's ship, U-5. And it was going to be rearmed with some new weapons when the trouble started. So when this lot goes up, Kramer's as good as finished. Yes, I certainly hope so. Now for the switch. Where is it? Behind this panel. There. You see? Yes, I see. Uh -huh. uh, this is where you can leave the rest to me. I'm not going to turn this switch until I see you safely out through the main entrance. But why? There's no immediate danger. We'll have a whole minute to get away. You'll never know. Don't argue now. Off you go. Run for it. Control calling launching platform. Hello, Gelvin. I'm checking the projected course on the computer. Is the first missile lined up? Yes, Carver. We are about to fit the detonator. Good. As soon as you can spare them in, I want all ships prepared for takeoff. It's the alarm. What's happened? 
It must be a fault in the wiring. But you should go to the hangar and check the emergency switch right away. You don't have to give me instructions. Here we are, Crabber. I give the instructions now. Prison. Hicks. It's not true. Ah, it's true enough. Let me get out of here. It's a matter of life and death. I told you to stay where you are. But this alarm means... We know what it means. The better part of your headquarters is going up in smoke any moment now. Kramer, you must get out. Do you hear me? We've been betrayed. Yes, and I know who's behind it. I shall be on the U-5 launching platform if you can get there. Rip, Kelvin, let me get past. Oh, no, you don't get past. Kelvin, there's no hope. We are destroyed. Yes, it's nearly over for both of you. You hear that, Kelvin? Unity's finished. The alarm stopped. have gone. I thought the whole roof was coming in. <coughs> Turn on your torch. <coughs> okay. Quickly. Come on. <coughs> they won't work. Bang it. Oh, it's better now. <coughs> we lost Kramer. <coughs> Look, at the door must have been blown open. He, he mustn't go away. <coughs> Just go after him. Right. <coughs> You've got that list of names from Kramer's office, haven't you? Yeah, sure. Well, at least has something... <coughs> Keep going. I can't see through the smoke. Uh, follow the wall. Uh, we'll, we'll never find him in this fog. No. But the best we can hope for is get out before we're choked. <laughs> we must move faster. Come on. <laughs> Hello, Orbiter 3. Chris, can you hear me? This is Mac. Yes, I can hear you, Mac. Tell me, for Pete's sake, what's going on? I can see a blaze in the sky and there was a noise like thunder. That was the hangar going up. The fuel tanks are burning now. Most of the Unity fleet is finished. There's only one ship left on a platform a few hundred yards from where I'm standing. But the smoke's blinding. I can't see very far. Have you found Bob? Yes, he's with Hickey. I'm waiting for them to join me outside the entrance I've told you about before. Just get on to Woomera and tell them the news. You can tell them that unit is finished. I'll call you back. 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 there. Oh, Bob. Well, this wonderful. Yes, this way. Uh, There you are, Mac. Thank goodness for that. Oh, am I glad to see you. Are you all right? Yeah. How are you two? Yeah, we're okay. Yeah, a bit smoke dried, that's all. You and your lady partner certainly started something. Where is she, Mac? I don't know. I sent her out of the hangar before I set off the charges. Haven't seen her since. Now, what about Kramer? We lost him, too. Gelbin spoke to him on the intercom and said he'd see him on the U-5 launching platform. Uh, that's where the ship is. Do you know the direction? Well, I've only a rough idea. Oh, never mind. They're obviously planning a getaway. We've got to stop them if we can. There they are. Oh, that's it. It's great time. Yes, it is. Come on. I reckon we'll be too late to help her, Bob. Yeah, I afraid so. She had an idea she wouldn't get away. She told me. Uh, look, I, I believe I can see her. Look, among those rocks. Yes, you're right. Come on. Right. Looks as if she's had it, Bob. Yes. Greta. What happened? Bob. I I thought they tried to get to the ship. I waited here. Then I saw them. Gelvin and Kramer? Yes. Gelvin was too quick for me. He oh, he had the gun. They'd be aboard by now. But they can't do any more harm. I'll go after them. Stay where you are, Hickey. Can't see a thing through the smoke. And they are aboard. Oh, they're aboard, all right. They're taking off. Look, you can see the jets. Your ship's lifting. Ah, oh, sir. I've made it. Yes, we're too late. Do you think we can get Greta back to our to sleep, Bob? We don't have to. Oh, you mean she's... Yes. Oh. Right she is. She was a strange woman. She justified herself in the end. A lot of people would be very grateful to her if they knew. Well, we are. I'll say we are. Yes, we are quite a lot. 
Oh, come on. Show me where those motorcycles are. We'd better join Chris Knight. Oh, I promised I'd call him back. Okay, but make it brief. All right. Hello, Arbiter Fee. Hello. Are you there, Chris? Mac, I was looking at my monitor, and I'm sure I saw a ship taking... Yes, you did, Chris. It was Crammer and Delvin. So they've got away. Yes, we're coming back to you now. Bob and Hickey are here. Hello, Chris. Bob! It's wonderful to hear you again. Congratulations on a terrific job. You're congratulating the wrong one, old boy. But thanks all the same. Now listen, all of you. I've just had some good news from Colonel Kent. He's waiting to give you a big welcome. Everything at his end worked out perfectly. And he's looking forward to seeing you all aboard Orbiter X. He's there. That's great. Okay, Chris. You can tell him we're on our way. This is Orbiter X control room calling CSP Woomera. CSP answering you, Orbiter X. Brown, will you tell the minister that Captain Britton and his team are coming aboard the station now? Judging by their radio reports, the unity organization is as good as finished. But Kramer may still try to pull one out of the bag. So keep checking. Right, sir. Hello, my Kent. dear fellows. Oh, good right. to see you, Bob, Mac, Richard, <laughs> come <laughs> right in. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, good home, sweet home, eh? Welcome <laughs> to the control room of Orbiter X. Thank uh-huh. you, sir. <laughs> well, Hickey, first of all, you'd better give uh, Colonel Kent that list of Unity members. Ah, oh, yes, yes, of course, sir. Oh, here it is, sir. Excellent, excellent. This uh, should make interesting reading, especially for the minister. Uh, how is Sir Charles? Oh, like a dog with two tails. All the Commonwealth Prime Ministers have been sending in messages of congratulation, and many of the heads of other governments, too. Oh, God. The space station has given our prestige a tremendous boost already. Oh, that's marvelous. CSP Warburg calling Orbiter X. CSP to Orbiter X. Come in, please. Well, if it isn't old Brownie. <laughs> Hello, CSP. Orbiter X answering you. Just a check call, Colonel. There have been no fresh sightings. Thank you. Fresh sightings? He was referring to Kramer's ship, U-5. I didn't worry you about it earlier, but we've seen it. You have, eh? Yes, it passed pretty close to us, and we thought it was going to attack, but nothing happened, and it pulled clear. Oh, I should have thought they'd have headed straight for their moon base. No, they must realize that that wouldn't be safe. We could wipe it out with screen missiles any time we like. Exactly. I'm quite sure that Kramer made a serious effort to destroy this space station. That's why I ordered Orbiter 3 to remain alongside as a guard ship. I've also got 12 others out on orbit patrol. You can see them on the monitors now. And isn't it marvelous to be free from the old interference? <laughs> yes, I'll say it is. Are they the ships that took over the station, sir? Yes, with their deflectors working, they were alongside before the Unitists knew they were here. They disposed of the Unity guard ship, and the people on the station gave in like that. <laughs> they would. CSP Wobber to Orbiter X. Urgent! Come in, CSP. The ground tracking stations have picked up U-5. It's traveling fast at an altitude of 1,000 miles. It's in your orbit, but it's moving in the opposite direction. What? It's heading straight towards you, sir. What's he doing? Range 950 miles. What's Kramer's game? Do you think he's going to ram us? It could be. Look, his ship's coming up on our central monitor now. Orbiter X calling CSP patrols. Are you receiving U-5 reports from Umara? All receiving, sir. Good. I'll leave our transmission key down so you can also hear us in station control. Captain Knight? Yes, sir. You may find yourself in action very soon. Check your armaments. I have, sir. Everything's in order. I'm watching my monitor screen. Good. Stand by. CSP to Orbiter U-5 is holding its course. Bearing ZN-54YK-5. Range 600 knots. Closing. Right, CSP. Orbiter 3 to Orbiter X. I now have U-5 in vision. I am ready to launch defensive missiles. Stand by for instructions. U-5 calling U-5. What the? Turn up the auxiliary sound monitor quickly. This is U-5 calling Orbiter X. Are you receiving me? It's Kramer's voice. May I answer him, Colonel Kent? Yes, go ahead. Hello, Kramer. What are you playing at? You must change course. So, Captain Britton, I'm delighted you're there. You're just what I hoped you might be. 
exactly in my path. Clark, he's going to ram. He's mad. Kramer, if you're hoping to smash into us, I can tell you you'll never make it. We have missiles already lined up on you. It makes no difference. You may destroy us and our ship, but parts of the wreckage will continue along our present line of flight. They will reach you and tear your precious space station to pieces. How do you go, Kaiser? Hello, Kramer. This is Colonel Kent. Ah, Colonel Kent. I'm sorry we have left it so late for our first meeting. Listen to me. Change your course and come alongside. Your position is hopeless. I shall keep to my course, Colonel Kent. The range is now 300 miles. We're almost with you. There's only one way to deal with this situation. Christmas launched missiles with proximity fuses. Yeah, that's the answer. If they explode close to the stern of U-5, they should turn the whole ship away from our orbit. Yeah, yeah. Colonel Kent, it happened to Hickey and me when we were trying to get back to the Earth in the moon probe. Yeah, that's right. It was Kramer himself who launched the missiles then. It exploded close to our jets and we turned about 45 degrees off course. Very well. Captain Knight, you heard that, did you? Yes, sir. I'm ready to fire. Range 200. Closing fast now. You may open fire in your own time. Right, sir. I'm launching the first missile... No. There it goes. Hello, Karma. We have launched our first missile. It was one last chance to shear away. No, Colonel Kent. We may be unarmed, but we can still strike back. Unity will live on. One day we will... Yes. Well done. Well, thank you very much, sir. Oh, yes, your thank best you missile did the trick. It exploded right alongside Kramer's starboard jets. Yes, when I saw it turned him off course, I didn't worry about a second launching. The <laughs> CFP woman to orbit her X. U-5 now bearing dead-end for OTX-5. Looks like it's heading for the wide-open space. Thank you, CFP. A flight to infinity, eh? Well, that looks like the end of Kramer and Gelbin. Rather grim justice, eh, Mac? Yeah, Bob, it is. Well, I think we could all do with a small restorative, gentlemen. Uh, uh, that's a splendid yeah, idea, yeah, sir. Yeah, good. It's a marvelous sir. idea, sir. Yeah. Not too small. Bob? Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Mac? Thank you, sir. Hey, Keith? Oh, thank you, sir. And, uh, uh, right. You, Chris? Oh, thank you, sir. Well, uh, boys, I'm not going to make a speech. Yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> but I do want to thank you for all that you've done. Without you, the situation would have been pretty grim for the whole world. And uh, well, now I feel a toast is called for, and I think you'll agree with me, the man to propose it is Bob Britton. Yes, yes, yes. Come, Come on, Bob. Bob. Come on, Bob. Well, thank you, Colonel Kent. You asked for a toast. Well, what shall it be? We now have the space station. And from here, we shall be sending ships first to the moon. Which is old ground for you. We know all about that. <laughs> I'll say we do. And then ships will go out to Mars and Venus. Well, who knows where. This is our starting point, and so let's drink to it. Gentlemen, the toast is Orbiter X. Orbiter, Orbiter X. X. That was the final episode of Orbiter X, an adventure in the conquest of space by B.D. Chapman. The serial was produced for the BBC by Charles Maxwell. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. 
Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.